Chapter 1 The Grey-Cloaked Stranger Night lay on the long swelling waves of the Chesapeake Bay, no wind, no star, a murky darkness. The spars of an unlighted ship loomed through the fog and sank into fog again. Stealthily, from the bulky gloom of the deck, a dory slid on oiled ropes to the somber waters. Two seamen followed. Then, down the ropes came an object which seemed to be a man with a bundle, wrapped in a long gray cloak. The dory pulled off and was swallowed by the fog. For an hour the ship swung at anchor, still no light, aloft or low, and no sound save the dull lapping of the waves. Then from the stern a bell began to toll. One slow, booming tone rolled off, and died away before the next followed. As if drawn out of the fog by the bell's deep calling, the dory came gliding back again. Two seamen were at the oars. The anchor sobbed up from the sea's grip. The tide was offshore, and the ship floated out with the current, unlighted, silent, back into the white smother from which it had come. Keen and marrow searching, the morning wind rose along the shores of Maryland. Dense fog became a fine, drizzling rain, turning to sleet. Breasting it along lonely ways among the sand dunes, hurried a lean, bent man, carrying a bundle under his cloak, a long, muddy, threadbare garment as gray as rain-soaked ashes. The bundle was hard to manage. It seemed to move of its own accord. Once in a while a sound came out of it, a wailing cry, Donkey Tee-wee, take Doherty out! Shh! The man would whisper. His tone was a stern command, but his eyes glowed with great love. The bundle would sniffle a moment or two, then grow quiet. After hours of tramping, the man found a nook where the forest met the last sand dunes. Here, crouched between a low bank and a tree, with his own body shielding the bundle from the sleet, the man opened his cloak and loosened the sailcloth and the plaid shawl within. A fat fist slipped out of the opening, then a tousle of brown curls, a gurgling laugh, and a piping voice. Do it, donkey tee-wee! Take it all off! Hush! came the man's low command, in a tone that would have been menacing, except that it was so deeply kind. Drink. He drew a flask from his cloak. The child drank, but all the while he stared over the bottle's rim at the man, a wise, wide baby stare. His eyes were blue and deep as the sea, with a flash in their depths that in the turning of an instant might be fun or fury. Just now the eyes shone with a puzzled and half-angry trust. Even in this short time, the little fist which guided the flask was growing blue, though it gripped with deft strength, a swordsman's right hand still in the making. The stranger hastened to enclose the baby in his warm coverings. He wound the cloak about himself and his bundle, left the shelter, and hurried on through the stinging sleet. By mid-afternoon they had reached the top of a rough knob. Here the man seemed to be expecting someone. Placing himself in the spot well screened by the underbrush, he kept a constant eye on a little path which wound around the base of the hill. It was almost sundown before the expected one arrived, a gentle old man on a steady-going bay horse. His round, low-crowned hat, sober clothing, and great saddlebags gave him the appearance of a missionary passing from one mass station to another. If the man of the gray cloak was expecting the meeting, this other person evidently was not. Yet the stranger studied the missionary's face with a look of recognition and relief. Then, turning sharply, he slipped off in an opposite direction across the hill and down the other side until he reached the path at a point where the horseman must soon pass. Here the stranger took his queer bundle from beneath his cloak and propped it up against a stump. He loosened the wrappings from the baby's face and pressed upon the little brow one long, long kiss. The child awoke and cried out to him. The gray cloaked figure whirled and darted up the hill into a thicket. Perhaps he feared the horseman would come before time. Perhaps he could not trust himself further, lest he fail to carry out his plan. The child, left suddenly alone, cried out at first, as if it were some game. Then, cross from weariness, he screamed and struggled with his coverings. At last, 
as if too weary to battle longer. His voice dropped to a convulsed sobbing. Donkey! Donkey Tee-wee! Far up the slope, the stranger knelt between a ledge and a twisted mass of brush and vine. His clenched hands were outstretched on the rock, gripped upon each other till the fingernails bit into the lean flesh. His hollow, weather-furred face was set by the clenched will behind it. But his eyes were wet with an agony of love and longing. Brown Head Goes Fishing Two boys trotted along an old Maryland path. The brown-headed one carried poles and bait. The red-headed one held an old flintlock gun. Joel, grumbled the brown head, look at this bait. Not a blessed thing but cabbage worms. We won't get a fish till the owl knows when. What's biting on you, George? That's the best kind. A fish can have white worms any time he wants to nose along the bank. But he doesn't get green ones every day. Anyhow, I had to clean the cabbage pit this morning. Yeah, I thought you had a lazy man's reason. "'Tisn't either lazy man's reason. "'Redhead temper's red. "'Better run or he'll kill me dead,' "'mocked George, leaping over a log "'and racing downhill. "'You'll take that back,' "'panted Joel, scrambling after him "'with the old gun bouncing up and down on his shoulder. "'Like to see you make me.' "'But George's foot caught in a vine, "'and down he went. "'Joel sprang astride his back "'and began bouncing up and down, singing, "'Take it back!' No, I won't. Take it back. I, I, wo won't. You've got to. I'll bounce till you do. Ouch. Oh, my foot. Joel caught his big toe in both hands. With a wiggle, George was free. Have to take it back, do I? He sprang over a log, then paused, for Joel was still hugging his toe. What's up? Got a splinter in my toe. Crying for a splinter. Baby. You'd cry if you had it. Let's see. That's a bee stinger. Sure it hurts. Here, I'll pull it out for you. Ouch. Mud'll take the sting out. Here's some. Was it a honeybee or just an old bumble? Honeybee. See him under the violet? Maybe Daddy will hunt for the bee tree Sunday. Look, I must have stepped right on him. His wing is broken and a couple of legs. I don't wonder you stung me back, old buzzer. Say, we'd better be going or we'll get what Patty gave the drum. You know Mother said she didn't send us to go gallivanting in the woods. She sent us to fish. Then away they went, jumping over logs, dodging under bushes, setting all the blossoming sprays of Maytime dancing in their wake. They paused, out of breath, on the bank of the stream, and dropped down on the moss to watch the fish slipping from stone to stone in the pool below. "'Look at that oriole,' whispered George. "'He is making a twin for himself in the water.' "'The pool is a good-looking glass to make doubles in,' agreed Joel. "'Wee, but your face is dirty.' "'So is yours.' "'Nothing else is the same, though. We are the least alike for a pair of twins.' "'Our eyes are the same color.' Now, look again. Our eyes are blue, but yours are almost black, and mine are like skim milk. Your nose is long and there is a hump in it. Mine turns up at the end. Your jaws are as square as old Dick's bulldogs. Mine... Quack, quack, says the crazy duck. I'll pitch you in the creek for calling me a bulldog. George sat up sharply, turned, and began digging for bait. The subject seemed to irritate him. Yet, Brownhead, hunting by a rotted stump for worms, could not have remembered the baby Brownhead propped against the same stump by the gray-cloaked stranger some eight years before. I'm glad we're not as much alike as Witch and Tother are. I found Witch out behind the woodpile crying this morning. Tother stole the cream to feed his cat. Along came Mother and spanked Witch for it. If we were alike, I might get a switch in every time you need it. Where'd you get a lick of miss? But Joel suddenly had a greater interest. His eyes were on his wooden bob. Under it went. He jerked the line, then drew in. Quack yourself, old know-it-all. Cabbage worms won't catch fish. Look at this one, will you? Half as long as my arm. Hist! What's over there in those bushes? Where? 
the big ones on the other side of those cattails. Watch him wiggle. I bet it's that old fox. Daddy said to keep an eye out for him. George reached for the gun. You won't steal any more of our chickens, old boy. Ready? Joel was picking up a stone. I'll bring him out for you. Let it fly. The stone hit the bushes squarely. There was a snarl. The branches parted, and out sprang not a fox, but a large brown bear. She looked up at them, growled, and put one foot in the water. The boys waited for no more, but dashed up the bank. Joel gave a sharp cry. George turned. What's the matter with you? Quick, she's swimming. I stepped on my fish hook. Pull it out, she's coming. Can't, it's all the way in. Here, let me get hold of it. Oh, don't. You got to stand it. She's halfway over. There, it's out. Come on now. Oh, I can't step. Oh. You've turned your ankle. Lean on me. Hop. She's almost here. Hop. I'll help you. Go on, George. Save yourself. Do you think I'd leave you? Here, try to climb this tree. Too little. She can climb. Go on. You can run. Go on, George. Quick. Quit crying. Climb. I'll boost you. At last, Joel was astride a crotch in the tree. George looked at his white face, jerked off both their belts, buckled them together, slipped one end of the strap around Joel's waist, twisted the rest around the limb a couple of times, and fastened it securely. You won't fall now. Take the gun. You reload it. Fox shot won't kill bears. Put in all we've got. The gun was a muzzle loader. One could put in as much powder and shot as needed. The bear hasn't come up the bank yet, whispered Joel. Maybe she'll go downstream. No such luck. I've made a mess of it. There's a cub out on that limb. We oui, she'll come all right. George cut a branch, lopped off the twigs, and tied his knife to it. Then, reaching out, he poked at the cub's feet. The woolly baby whined, snarled, and backed farther out on the branch. His mommy hears him. Wow, she's mad, warned Joel. Get him down quick. George gave a swift jab. The cub sprang back, and down he went, squalling as he fell from bough to bough and shaking the branches wildly. George plunged forward, lost his balance, caught himself again, and climbed into the main fork of the tree. She's climbed the bank, whispered Joel. Do you want the gun? No, wait till she's nearer. I might miss. Here she comes. The old bear came lumbering toward the tree. Her cub began to crawl to meet her, but whimpered and sat down on its woolly haunches. Mother Bruin hurried forward and licked its bruises. Maybe she'll go off now. No, she won't. Hang on tight. Here she comes. The bear charged the tree with all her force, retreated, and lunged again. George clung desperately. Joel's wrenched ankle banged back and forth against the trunk until he moaned with pain, but he held the gun tightly and kept the muzzle pointed away from his brother. Three times the old bear charged the tree. Then she began to climb. Quick, Joel, the gun! Good, I've got it. Shoot quick! Look how high she is! Might miss! Shoot, will you? She's almost up to you. Might miss. She'll get your foot. Shoot. George was very still. He was looking straight into that great red mouth. He thrust the muzzle against the shining teeth and fired. There was a roar, a snapping and recoil of branches, and a great thud at the base of the tree. Clutching the swaying branches, Joel twisted in his strap to see down through the leaves. George! Oh, George! No sound came from below. Are you hurt? Then Joel saw the bleeding pile at the foot of the tree. The bear was on top of George. Both were still. George, wiggle your foot if you hear me. The bear foot lay still. He's dead, sobbed Joel in helpless misery. The rebound of the tree had left him almost suspended by the straps, and the strain on his waist was making him faint. He struggled back into the crotch again and began searching for the buckles, but they were out of his reach and behind the limb. George, 
he pleaded. Wiggle your foot, even your toes, just a little bit. No movement below. The silence of the forest closed in upon him, that silence which the noises of the wood folk make, only the more intense. A capper calling his mate, a woodpecker tapping somewhere across the creek. Joel struggled with the strap, trying to break it, but the rawhide was too tough. Helplessness began to numb him. Would help? Could help ever come? The folks at home would not think of searching till after supper, and by then— Oh, George, wiggle, kick, do anything. I can't stand this. You're dead and I'm a dying. I know I am. Things are so black and swimmy, and I'm so queer inside. There is no one to help us. No one can even hear us. But God, God can hear us. I forgot. Then he prayed as he had never dreamed of praying. There's a strange, sweet sense of one unseen, but very near. The numbing loneliness was gone. That woodpecker keeps tapping all the time. It's such a queer one, too. It goes click-a-clack. Maybe it's a cricket. No. A frog? They don't go like that, either. It sounds like chopping. Can it be Daddy out in the new clearing? Joel made a horn of his hands and called, Dad! Oh, Daddy! His voice was pitiful and weak. The sound of the chopping went on steadily. He can't hear me. The boy drew a long breath. Oh, Dad! The chopping ceased for a moment, then went on. Dad! Oh, Dad! Clear above the voices of the woodland came an answering hello. There was silence a while, then a call somewhat nearer. Another call, and then a giant, red-bearded horseman came in sight on the bank beyond the creek. Who's there? What's wrong? A bear! It's killed George! There was a splashing in the creek bottom, a rattle of stones on the bank, and John Abel came crashing through the alders. He sprang from the saddle, threw the body of the bear backward, and passed his hand over the boy's body. Heart's still beating. Thank God. No bones broken. Just stunned, I think. Small thanks to you, Joel. Why didn't you pull the bear off? He is nearly smothered. I couldn't, Daddy, came Joel's voice weakly. I couldn't reach the buckles. John Abel looked up and saw the small and blood-stained foot and the white face. Well, son, are you hurt too? Did the bear bite you? No, Daddy, I hurt my foot. Well, you'll have to be a man and stand it a while longer. George needs me more. There was nothing in his tone to show which boy was his son. Abel lifted Brownhead in his powerful arms and carried him to the pole. As he plunged him into the water, the lad gasped and opened his eyes. Oh, Dad, he cried as he caught sight of the red-bearded face. The bear! She'll get Joel! He can't run! That bear won't hurt anybody now. Is she dead? Did I hit her? Hit her? You about blew the gizzard out of her. You don't need to fill a gun chock full, even to kill a bear. You blew the gun up, boy. Oh, did I break it? And they cost so much. Never mind the cost this time, son. It's the boy I'm thinking about. Twas by the mercy of the Lord you didn't blow your own head off. But there's only a small powder burn. We'll say a rosary this night in Thanksgiving. Abel laid the boy on the moss. I'm going back to get Joel now, he said. The wounded foot and wrenched ankle were soon bathed and bound. What is your old daddy going to do? laughed Abel. One dead bear, one live cub, one wounded hunter, and one dead one. They must go home right now. There is only one horse. We'll put the bear across the saddle. Joe can ride behind. Maybe the cub will follow. I'll carry George. Oh, no, daddy, I can walk announced the dead hunter, suddenly sitting up. I'm not hurt. I just feel shaky inside. All the same, I'm going to carry you for a piece. Sure, you think you're as big as a man since you killed a bear all by yourself. I'll carry you with small trouble. But next time you go hunting, I'll send to the fort for the army surgeon and the hospital corps to care for the dead and the wounded. 
Uncle Roger. There is Mother at the edge of the clearing, called Joel from his perch on the horse's back. I wonder what brought her away out here. Well, if the little twins have let their mother bring in the cows, they'll hear from me right now, said John Abel sternly. I don't think she's after the cows. It looks to me as if she's crying. Crying? Are you sure of it? Something is wrong, then. Slip down, George. You'll have to walk now. And John Abel hurried through the woods. Mary, he called, as soon as they were within speaking distance. What has gone wrong? Whatever it is, don't cry that way. We'll get through somehow, for sure, and God's good. They've come for George, she sobbed. Don't be taking that to heart now. It's one thing to come for him and another to get him. I've had that boy too long to give him up at a minute's notice. They will prove their right before they take him, and we won't cross that bridge until we come to it. What do they say? It's proof enough they have, and more's the pity. The minute I saw the gentleman, I knew he must be kin to George. He is like enough to the boy to be his father, but he is only an uncle. There are letters, too. One from his excellently Cecil Calvert, and one with the king's own hand and seal. They be great folk, John, and no mistake. The squire, too, is with them. They took Jim and Johnny till we deliver the boy. Oh, there's no way at all. We'll have to give George up. Calvert and the king and the squire, too, said Abel slowly. We've come to the bridge after all. I have no right to keep another man's son. No man would have the right to keep mine. But it's hard, bitter hard. I love the boy. Mother, broke in George, they can't take us away from you. You won't let them take us, will you, Daddy? Mary Abel drew the boy into her arms. You tell him, John, she sobbed. I can't do it. Well, there is nothing else to do but say out straight and blunt a thing I never meant that you should know. George, you are not one of the Abels. You are not Joel's twin. You are not my son. Though God knows there is not one of my own that I love more than I love you, child. Father Cornwall found you sitting by the roadside and brought you to us. I set you on Mary's knee beside Joel, and so far as love and care go, you have been ours ever since. It is a bitter thing to me to give you up. Still, I have no right to keep you from your people. Oh, you were so sweet that night, sobbed the woman. I asked you your name. You put one arm around wee Joel, and up you looked with your big blue eyes for all the world like a robin. Me's Doherty, says you. Me want donkey tea we, me do. We thought by that your name was George. But the gentleman called you Gordon. For many a day you cried for Dunky Tiwi. But, John, Mrs. Abel turned towards her husband. There is worse than the taking of him. I don't like the looks of that uncle. Oh, how he did curse when he saw the image of Our Lady on the mantle. Perhaps he will lead our lad astray. As for leading our lad astray, said Abel, putting one great hairy hand on the boy's shoulder, no man can lead you into sin if you don't follow him. You will have to stand on your own two feet and be a man. Remember one thing. There is nothing worth buying, not fast horses, nor fine houses, nor even a place in the king's court, if the price you pay for it is the fire of hell forevermore. There was a clatter of hoofs on the bridge in the hollow. Here they come now. Goodbye, lad. We'll say the beads every day till we know that you are safe. Abel's deep voice trembled. Goodbye, boy, and God bless you. The one on the gray horse is his uncle, said Mary, pointing one roughened, toil-worn hand. You can see the likeness yourself, John. The boy's face is brown, and his jaw is more square, said Abel, though they are indeed alike. But God grant the boy's face may never be like the man's. It is bitter hard to trust our boy to such a keeper. Bitter hard. The horseman galloped toward them, straight across the sprouting corn. The gentleman sprang from his horse and drew the gauntlet from his right hand. 
The fingers were long and white. There was a ring, one only, but the jewel in it might have shone in the king's crown. He took the brown hand of the boy in his and looked at the face closely. It is the Gordon, he said, but whence comes all these bruises? There is a burn. Turning sharply toward Abel, you will explain this. The lad loaded the gun too heavily. It was old and blew up with him, sir. Thanks to the mercy of God, he wasn't hurt badly. God's mercy, what of your own carelessness, allowing a mere babe to load a gun? Sir, here in Maryland we don't call boys of ten babies. If you think him too young to handle a gun, look at the bear on my horse yonder. That's his hunting bag for this afternoon. There was just a touch of honest pride in John Abel's voice. Gordon killed yonder great beast, cried the nobleman. Ah, well, no wonder. He is the scion of the house of Ravenhurst. The earls were famous huntsmen, all of them. Edwin, remain and bring the skin. It will look well below fire the bray's antlers. Eh, uh, Godfrey? Give the fellow the reward. It is a fat purse, and will repay you for your trouble, my man. John Abel straightened his shoulders. Keep the money, your lordship, he said bluntly. The boy is yours. I have no right to keep him, but I'm not selling him to you. Ah, if a man has a cabin in this new land, he fancies himself already a gentleman, sneered Sir Roger Gordon. Martin, give the peasant his brats. Walter, bring Lord Gordon his horse. The twins struggled down from the soldier's saddle and ran to their mother. But as Walter came forward with the horse, George drew his hand from his uncle's grasp. I want to say good-bye, please, he said. Walter, give the young gentleman your hand to mount. We've wasted too much time as it is. I'm going to stay till I say good-bye, flashed the boy, and I won't go before. Do as you are bid, George. It was Mary's quiet voice. Yes, mother, and the boy mounted. The horseman trotted back across the field and down the road, but the boy's face was turned toward the wood. The little group among the trees dropped out of sight. The cabin came and went. As the last bit of smoke was hidden by the trees, the brave lips began to tremble, and the tears came, burning hot and choking. Sir Roger gave a signal. The troop swung forward, leaving him and his nephew alone. Is this the gratitude you show to the uncle who has come overseas in search of you? I wanted to say good-bye. You wouldn't let me even kiss mother or tell Joel. Kiss? Such dirty. They are not dirty. Only from hard work since sun-up. They are my folk. Joel, he's my twin. I mean, I always thought he was. Your folk cried the gentleman with a laugh. But you do not know, as yet, who or what you are. You are Charles Gordon, Lord Rock Raven, the son of James Gordon, Lord of Rock Raven, third Earl of Ravenhurst. Your mother is Lady Margaret of Douglas, daughter of Sir Wilfred Douglas, of the line of old Sir Archibald Bell the Cat. There are few in Scotland that can boast such blood as yours. And you are weeping for your folk, the folk of the heir of Ravenhurst. He laughed again. John Abel, lord of a log cabin and a pigsty, and size an ox, and brain a pipkin. His most noble dame, with a face as wrinkled and brown as the apple, she baked last Candlemas. A dozen, nay, was it fourteen, red-headed brats, and these are the folk of the scion of Ravenhurst. A light leaped far down in those deep blue Douglas eyes a flame that burned up boyish tears to leave a white-hot anger which Roger both knew and feared. Gordon answered, Sir, poor or not, the Abels are my folk. End of chapter 3 When Men Play Marbles The good ship Anne of Glasgow sped, all sails drawing aloft and allow. The wind whistled jig tunes in the cordage and set the tackle blocks clapping in mimic applause. This was a good sound to the ears of Brownhead, for it sang to him of the Maryland woods. 
He stood by the stern rail, looking back at the ripples of the wake into the zigzag world of wave tips, and on to the west where the gray disk of the ocean met the grim vault of the sky. He felt dumbly conscious of his own exceeding smallness in the world of waters, and decidedly smaller in the strange coming world of men, of which Sir Roger preached endlessly. During such sermons the boy listened as little as possible, and, the moment they were over, set himself to forget. Yet one thing was bitterly clear. Brownhead was no longer George of the gay Maryland woods, but my lord of Gordon. He built a silken knee against the rail and growled. Ho! Oh, your lordship, the face you wear is hold storm enough to sink the Anne of Glasgow. Gordon turned, half pleased at the interruption, for he knew the voice. It was the man whom Sir Roger called Godfrey. Brownhead almost liked him. At least he was a pleasant fellow with whom to waste an hour. What has raised the present glum wind? Godfrey ran on. Sir Roger, fumed Gordon, I'd rather swallow bear's grease than hear him. He's had me in the cabin talking high and mighty, making me walk on my toes like a top silly girl to husking bee, ordering me every once in half a crack to flop my head on my shins, and getting as mad as a slap wasp if I fall sprawling instead of making a court bow correctly. But your lordship is learning with astonishing rapidity to act like a jack a dandy for the pleasure of an uncle who does so dearly love me. Bah! Gordon thrust his hand into his belt wallet and drew out his only treasures, four agate pebbles, roughly rounded by many hammerings, a pioneer boy's marbles. Squatting on the deck, he placed three and began to shoot at them with a fourth. Loves me, he growled. So do wood ticks. Wants me for something. Crooked. Mean like. Gordon shot a marble with a vicious snap. So, whistled Godfrey, fixing his keen eyes on the boy's face. For a ten-year lad, you are rather more than something shrewd, my young Laird o Gordon. You don't like being the marble when Sir Roger is the shooter and it's his game. The lad gathered his marbles with the sweep of his hands and jumped to his feet. Why should I? he demanded. Godfrey chuckled. Listen, today you are the heir, the marble. Tomorrow you are the earl, and Sir Roger is the marble. Wait for your turn. It was the boy's turn to whistle. Godfrey looked out over the sea a moment, then spoke again. Your lordship, you have not yet awakened to the fact that you are Earl of Ravenhurst, though as yet a trifle too young to take charge of affairs, an Earl, a little king in your own domain. But let me show you a picture of what it means to be chief at Old Rock Raven. Now, there was Fire the Braze. He is not the first chief of your house, but the first to write his name in history. There has been a chieftain stronghold on Rock Raven since... Oh, since first God made the Scot, and the devil set Scots a-fighting. A bit to the south of Benender Mountain, a headland of black and jagged rock, is thrust a good ten bowshots into the frith. The sea beats itself to a fury roaring about its wreck-strewn base. This rock, from its shape, or from the ill-omened birds which nested there, or because of the fierce marauders who made of it a stronghold, has been called since the beginning Rock Raven. Now, Fire the Braze was a bold and bloody man. He carried a long two-handed claymore, the like of which no other man ever bore. From his wild and lonely tower on Rock Raven, he sallied out for daring raids, driving home cattle, plundering, burning villages, and harvest fields. It was for this he was dubbed Fire the Braze, a name of terror from the isles to the English border. An out-and-out villain and robber, cried the boy. Softly, softly, teased Godfrey. If any knight had named Fire the Braze a common robber, swords had not slept in scabbards. The chief was but a bold blade in the rough game of war. Boys throw down marbles and play grabs. Men play grabs also. But your lordship has a keen sense of honor. Fire the Braze lived centuries ago, when even kings were crude. In fact, your house rose from a petty chieftain's stronghold to a knight's castle by a rough jest. 
Those fire of the braves once sprang out from the bracken, and single-handed fought with a mighty antler buck, and slew him with his claymore, under the very eyes of the king who'd sworn to hang him. But, instead, being pleased by the wild highlander's jest, the king made fire of the braves his friend, an armored knight, and warden to keep other men in order. Yet, if your lordship wishes to hear about a knight of honor, as unsullied as the heaven-born snow, let me tell you of Langsword. He was your great-great-grandfather, the man who raised Dravenhurst to an earldom. It was in that old time, began Godfrey, when monarchs crimsoned their own swords and bore the scars of their own battle wounds. James Stuart, king of Scotland, stood on a jutting rock above the frith. The sea is no respecter of persons. The veering wind that whipped the surf sent its mist to sting the royal face. But a storm of another nature thundered in the voice of James, as he eyed a seaman groveling at his feet. Is this the dog that refused to obey our order? Sire, wailed the wretch, I cannot put my boat across the frith. The storm's rack's coming fast. The sail is torn. The hull's a leak. And your coward heart would sink a galley. My lord of Erin, run a spear through this scoundrel who calls himself a Scottish seaman. Force a jackal against the wall, and you will fight a lion. Go to by despair, the man retorted. If ye get the best o' an enemy, what matters it that starving wife and child weep o'er a dead father? Indignation seized the surrounding knights. A hundred swords were drawn, but James V was a man of moods as changeable as the sea. Instead of added wrath, pity pierced the fury of his eyes. So, he said, and it is love of wife and child that makes a coward of a man? He paused, and grief softened that lean, strong, passion steward face. The royal home was yet in mourning for two bonny princes, sons long hoped, long waited for, that died as fast as wee lips learned to list their father's name. It was the man in James, and not the king, that spoke. And have you then a son? Ay, sire. Hope was born of the kind note in the monarch's voice. Three sons, and one runs halfway doing the hill to meet me as I come bearing my nets at night, and one clings to the skirts of my good wife, and one is wee bit yet and sleeps upon her breast. King James turned short about and looked over the sea. A moment so he stood, and then he said, Go to your home, good man. Tell them their mute cry has saved you from a coward's grave, and— The royal voice sank low. Bid the wee ones pray that God may send the king a son. Again the face of James grew stern. He gazed across the waters to the shore beyond. The frith was narrow at this point, for, from the opposite shore, the crags and cliffs of Benender thrust themselves a good mile into the sea. Narrow the strait might be, but calm it seldom was. The wind puffed sharply, veering from north to east, and the scudding cloud rack covered half the sky. On the shore across the frith, a group of men waved torches. It was Argyle signaling for orders, and there was none that dared to put the leaking boat across the strait. A clank of armor broke the suspense, and a young knight dropped on his knees before the king. "'May it please you, sire,' said a noble at the king's right hand. "'Sir Malcolm Gordon craves audience. The youth is of the blood of old Gordon fire the braes, as brave as he and as gallantly desirous of serving your majesty. He is dubbed Langsword, and is the laird of yon little tower that perches there across the way, like a raven upon a rock. Sire, the face of Langsword glowed with loyalty and daring. The word, I cannot, is not said in the house of Gordon. Let the honor of bearing the message be mine. I shall swim the frith, my liege. Swim, cried the king, doubting his ears. Swim, where boat does not dare. Sire, I did it a year ago for pure sport, but not in the face of a coming storm. Nor did I swim then beneath the king's eye. But hark, noble Gordon, even now the surf booms along the rocks of Benender. Sire, I know where the sandy shallows lie, and at worst I can die but once for you, my liege. No kings ever played dice with the hearts and brains and souls of men, as did the Stuart line, and now James smiled. 
Well was his pride pleased by this youth's devotion, almost adoration, and, when he spoke, scarcely could praise have been couched more cunningly. My lord of Gordon, your loyalty deserves our confidence. You shall know what message it is that you bear and why. The king paused, and those who stood about his majesty stepped off perhaps a dozen paces. Russell has proved himself a thrice-compounded villain and traitor. His castle is a very nest for the hatching of border plots, raids, and burnings. Bid Argyle march on Russell. Raise your own clan and assist. Success attend your valor, noble Gordon. If you win the day, we pledge that you shall be belted earl. Langsword kissed the royal hand and strove swiftly down to the beach. Unbuckling his heavy armor, he cast it on the sand. Then, ready for the plunge, he stepped out on a rock, paused, and dropped on his knee. And with him knelt those beside the waves, and James of Scotland with his lords on the cliff. The Langsword's prayer was brief. St. Mary, grant me long wind and strong blood. If I set foot on yonder shore, I vow a silver shrine to deck thy chapel in the wood. King James answered, Amen. Then Langsword stood, hands pointed for the dive, watching for the outgoing of a wave. The tallest knight in the highlands, lean with knotty muscles which rose and fell like those that move under a tiger's hide. A seagull flew across the face of the racing rack and screamed the wild defiance of the storm. Godspeed, called the voices from the shore. St. Mary for King James, the Langsword cried and plunged into the sea. Like a shaft of white light, the body cleft air and water and was gone. A wave came trembling in, growling, shaking a fleecy mane. The head of the swimmer rose, a crest reared above him, broke, crashed over him, carried him back a spear's length. He sank. Those on the cliff and those on the shore leaned, gasping. He rose. The long white line of foam was between the swimmer and the shore. Ho, Scott, well swum, called James. By Mary's virgin soul, I swear to deck that shrine with blood-red rubies. Thunder muttered along Ben Ender. Flashes of lightning played on the cloud like lancers, tilting before a battle. The swimmer had gained three bowshots space against the sea. His head was a dodging speck, and the king dared not rest his eyes lest he lose sight of it. The storm broke, rain swirling to the mad onslaught of the wind. The frith rose and sank in white, roaring heights and bellowing caverns. The lightning shot its jagged bolts from sky to ocean, and the swimmer, the tempest had swallowed him. James Stewart stirred the cliff. Sometimes he prayed aloud, and sometimes cursed himself, or any that dared venture within earshot of the royal wrath. An hour passed. The storm drew back among the hills, ravaged, glutted, exhausted, muttering. This day was lost the noblest night that ever risked life for Scottish king. So said James Stuart, his face gloomy as the solemn frith below. But Aaron, peering through the mist, gave a sudden pluck at the royal sleeve, Ho, oh, my liege, a light on Ben Ender. The Argyle signals. Two to right, three to left. They have the message. Holy God, Langsword has crossed the frith. Godfrey paused, for Gordon stood with his right hand clenched as if it held a sword. He drew his breath through parted lips, and his eyes were like a war eagle's. Ay, cried Godfrey, your young lordship is a fine keen splinter of old Langsword steel. But the boy was not pleased with the compliment, or with anything that delayed the tale, for he broke in. And Langsword raised the clan, joined Argyle, and then? Like a good knight and true, he set out after Russell, chased him well up into the morasses beyond Ben Ender. The lowlander fled north towards the Laird of the Isles. Langsword harried the Russell lands and followed. With Argyle he crept upon Russell in the wilds beyond Straithbogey and caught him in an act of treason. He was pledging to lure King James to his castle and let the Islemen capture the royal person. All this Bluff Howe of England was paying for. As your lordship knows, English kings have ever tried to put Scotland in their hunting bag. Russell was hanged, drawn, and quartered as a traitor should be, and Langsor was given all Russell's forfeited lands, 
made an earl, and became a trusted counsellor of good King James. In truth, the plunge of Langsword into the frith was a leap into the high sea of royal favour. Good! cried Gordon. End of chapter 4 Castle Ravenhurst It was harvest time before the long journey on sea and land ended. They changed horses at the last inn, and the carriage rattled merrily along the highland road. The tired boy had watched the haymakers, field after field, until he had fallen asleep. Sir Roger sat scowling, tapping his boot with his scabbard. Godfrey, who seemed to be something more than a servant, sat watching him. Three long years of labor, and the end of failure, growled the nobleman. Failure? Is it a lord of the house of Gordon who cries failure when the first knock comes? We have the heir, and old Ravenhurst will yet be the greatest earldom in Scotland. The heir, we have him indeed, but what an heir! We would do better without him. Bred on the farm, he has the manners of a clown. Still, he is learning. At least he can bow without falling down. Time and training will remedy his lack of culture. It is the Catholic faith in him which ruins all. The faith of a ten-year-old boy ruins all. Oh, Sir Roger, is this the spirit of the noble house of Gordon? You see for yourself his stubbornness. Stubbornness, that is the best point in the lad. Do you think a weakling could ever win back the lands of Ravenhurst? Our work is to turn his strong will from his faith to what we wish. Very easily said, my good Godfrey, but it cannot be done. What else have I striven to do since the day I found him? Right at this moment, that red-bearded Abel has more influence with him than I. Sir Roger, it is a hard matter to skin a deer with the handle of a knife. The blade does such work much better. What do you mean by that? I mean what I have said from the first. Don't try to drive the boy. Lead him. Lead him. A ship's cable would not draw that boy one step. My lord, I said lead. I did not say draw. No more of your riddles, my good Godfrey. Speak plainly. Sir Roger, fire and sword could not turn that boy from his faith now, while he loves it. But let him alone, and he will forget both Abel and his teaching. Tell him of fire the braze and lang sword, till he longs to be as great an earl as they, nay, even the greatest of them all. Then, in later years, when it is a choice between lands, castle, and the king's favor, or the Catholic faith and poverty... There may be a struggle, but the faith will go to the wall. Perhaps, and perhaps he will die for leading some fool's chase of a rebellion. That has happened before. True, but he is only a child. A child's faith dies easily if it is not nourished. The one I fear is his mother. If you will follow my advice, he will never see her, never even knows that she lives. I need the mother's evidence that he is the heir. Lady Margaret will not dare to cross my will. She knows the penalty. Sir Roger's face grew very ugly. The Lady Margaret will not dare. Remember, that frail and gentle woman is a Douglas. Who has ever yet bent the will of a Douglas? Let her once speak to him. Let her but once tell him of the old Earl, or of that foal, Gordon's father. Oh, have a care. It will be an easy task to lead the boy. But the boy with his mother at his back, ay, that's another tale. She will have more influence with him than a dozen Abel's. Douglas or no, my lady will fare ill if she crosses wills with me. There is such a thing as the will of a Gordon, as well as that of a Douglas. I am no weakling to bend to a woman. Let her once dare open her lips. Let her once dare. I will execute the law to the fullest extent. The sleeping boy stirred. Sir Roger's voice grew suddenly pleasant. "'Ah, little nephew, you are sleeping at a strange time. We shall see the castle in a few moments.' "'Yonder is the spot where Gordon Fire the Braves killed the great deer.' Godfrey pointed to a glen leading into the heart of the mountain. "'Did you not tell me that the antlers are still in the castle?' The boy was wide awake now. "'There, in the old Earl's room above the fireplace. You may see them to-night, if you wish.' Old Fire the Braves was a great man in his day. Sir Roger looked at the eagle light in the boy's eyes and smiled at Godfrey. 
Do you see that point of rocks jutting out from Ben Ender into the Frith? In the lee of that is the spot where Gordon of the Langsword landed when he swam the Frith from shore to shore and carried the message for the king. The Gordon leaned forward eagerly. Was there ever a greater earl than the Gordon of the Langsword? Godfrey has told me so many wonderful deeds that he did. Indeed, he was the proudest of them all. The earldom reached its greatest extent in his days. But he died at Solway Moss, fighting for King James. The days have been evil for the house of Gordon since then. Sir Roger paused a moment to look at Godfrey, for the boy's face was all aglow. Land after land was taken from us, till, when I became regent, we had little more than the bare rock on which the castle stands. I have gained a good portion for you, and you must do the rest. I will do all that can be done until you are a man, but you must be the earl who raises Ravenhurst even higher than she was before she fell. I will try, my lord. The Gordon spoke very slowly. His square little jaw grew a little sharper. His eyes shone with a wild Douglas fire. Godfrey looked at Sir Roger and smiled. The road made a short turn round the cliff. In the depths below, the water foamed among the rocks. Far off down the frith, five great gray towers stood out in the sunset. The slant rays sifting down among them touched here and there a battlement with gold and deep in the purple shadows. From the seaward tower came a puff of white smoke and then a roar. Sir Roger rose in the carriage, lifting his plumed hat. Over the water the sound of a great bell rolled. The rocks caught the echo, and many an elfin note made answer from crag and cliff and forest, far up even to the summit of old Ben Ender. "'What is all this noise about?' whispered the lad. "'Tell me, Godfrey, or I shall make a blunder.' "'Will you never learn that you are the scion of the House of Gordon? "'The cannon and the bells of old Ravenhurst are welcoming you, my lord.' "'The road turned in among the hills again. "'The castle was out of sight. "'Lillanders have taken our land and made my people slaves. "'You told me so long ago.' "'The Gordon spoke very slowly. "'But an earl as great as Langsword could win it all back again. "'You must be that earl.' "'I will do my best, uncle.' There is just one thing standing in the way. Godfrey shook his head and frowned sharply. His lips said, Not now, not yet. But they made no sound. Sir Roger continued in spite of the warning. He was as certain of victory now as he had been of failure. One thing stands in the way. This one thing will rule in all if you have not the sense to give it up. You cannot be a Catholic and win back to Ravenhurst her rightful place in Scotland. The king is for the new faith, and will put down with fire and sword any noble who stands for the old. My lord, said the boy, looking straight into his uncle's eyes, the earldom costs too much. There is nothing worth the buying if the price be the fire of hell forevermore. Daddy Abel said so. A chorus of shouts drowned Sir Roger's answer. The Gordon, the Gordon, hail to the young chief. Ay, Sir James' son, and no mistake. It was a group of herdsmen watching from a cliff. Another turn among the crags, and he could see the road winding up to the castle and the crowds of peasants throng after throng along the wayside. The Gordon, the Gordon, ay, in very truth the Earl's own son, God's blessing on his young head, the Gordon, the Gordon. Right and left the lad threw civil bobbies out among them as he passed on a long way up to the castle. The great grey drawbridge came clanging down across the moat. A double file of soldiers marched out, cheering as only soldiers can. The Gordon, the Gordon, welcome to the chief. They crossed their blades, and the lad walked on beneath the shining arch of steel. Straight across the courtyard, between the files, stepped the sturdy little figure. The castle doors swung open. Long lines of servants in the great hall bowed and cheered as he passed along the polished floor. The massive, carven doors of the drawing-room slid back noiselessly. Someone in green and gold called, Sir Charles Gordon, Lord Rock Raven, Sir Roger of Gordon. The boy looked about him in wide-eyed wonder. Never had he dreamed of such a place. Candles, it seemed to the boy they were a thousand, made the room as light as day. Pictures, great ones from floor to ceiling, statues, massive furniture and rich tapestry, ladies in crimson and ladies in gold, 
ladies in purple and ladies in blue, gentlemen dressed like peacocks with gold lace and jeweled shoe buckles, here a plaided chief, and there an English noble. From a hundred throats burst the old, old cheer that had greeted the earls of Ravenhurst these hundreds of years. The Gordon, the Gordon, welcome, my lord, thrice welcome. Among them all the puzzled lads saw one kind face. It was a little woman with snow-white hair, a face worn and thin as if from much suffering, two dark blue eyes that looked straight into his own. He turned to her as to a friend. "'Aren't you somebody that belongs to me?' he whispered. The woman took his face in her frail hands. She looked at him long and lovingly. "'I am your mother, Gordon, and you are welcome home.' "'Ah, Lady Margaret, you must not keep his young lordship all for yourself. "'Let us kiss him, too,' cried gay voices. "'Sir Roger frowned. "'He had always feared that the boy would show his farm rearing by his clumsiness, "'and now, at this all-important first appearance, "'there he stood, timid, stammering, clinging to his mother's hands. "'Not one of those graceful bows, not one of those neatly turned speeches.' Oh, how carefully he had trained him just what to do and say. The red flush brought out the tan and freckles and made him look so common. Sir Roger remarked nervously, His lordship is browned by the voyage. Since when has a weathered face been a disgrace at Ravenhurst? queried Lady Margaret gently. In truth, there never was a carpet knight among the lairds, from old Gordon Fire the Braes to your most noble brother. The lad saw that his mother's words had angered his uncle. He put one arm about her, as if to guard her, and looked straight at them all. The bashfulness was gone, and there was in the boy's figure a certain dignity. "'How much he resembles his father,' said one. "'Ay, too much like the earl, I fear. God grant him a better end.' "'But then,' remarked a noble, who seemed of some importance, at least in his own eyes, but then he has you, Sir Roger. You will do your duty. We need have no fear of the mother's proving unwise, while the uncle is at hand. I will indeed do my duty, my lord, both by the heir and by Ravenhurst, Sir Roger answered somewhat stiffly. Lady Gordon will wisely remember that there are laws concerning the imparting of knowledge on certain dangerous subjects to youth of our land. The dark eyes of Lady Margaret looked straight into Sir Roger's. I thank your lordship for your kindness. I am well aware of the laws of which you speak, and know how to conform myself to them. Her voice was sweet and low, but there was a ringing firmness in her tone, a light in the depths of her eyes. She seemed to be a mother eagle guarding her young. End of chapter 5 By the Old Fireplace this is the old earl's room. It will be yours now, said Nurse Benson, swinging open a great carved door. May you have a good night's rest, my lord. The aged servant bowed and closed the door, leaving Gordon alone in a large room. Now, this makes two people here that I like. There's my mother, and there's Benson. Nurse says she cared for my father when he was a wee bit barney. That's why she gave me pigeon pie. He always wanted pigeon pie. Oh, what a beautiful fireplace. Indeed, it was a fine piece of Flemish carving. Two yeomen standing on the hearth held the mantle on their spears. The shelf was bare, covered only with white linen. At the end of it, two knights stood crossing swords above a picture. Above it hung a great pair of antlers. Those deer horns must be old fire the braes. Uncle said they were in here. I wonder, is that his picture, too? The boy held up the candle to examine it. The painting represented an old warrior, white-haired but large and strong of limb, a kind face that smiled at one, and the jaw squared to ugliness. It cannot be Fire the Braze. He lived so long ago. Perhaps it is the Gordon of the Lang Sword. But where in the world did they get that picture of me? Four lads stood by the warrior's knee, who smiled from the canvas with a face Gordon had seen too often in the fishing pole not to recognize. Then other memories came. He saw another fireplace, not so beautiful as this, but wide and low and very comfortable. 
Mary Abel at one end of the hearth, spinning with swift, sure fingers. Daddy at the other end, his pipe in the corner of his mouth. The zip zip zir of his wet scent on the axe. Joel and the twins rolling over one another on the cabin floor. The boy leaned against the fireplace and cried for the first time since he had seen the last bit of smoke from the Abel cabin slipping behind the trees. There was a gentle touch on his arm. We never place anything on this mantle, my son. And a white hand raised the candlestick. Are you lonesome in this grand old house? I was thinking of Joel and the folks at home. I couldn't even say goodbye. Lady Margaret sat down in a wide armchair and drew the boy down beside her. Who is this Joel, my son? Joel, he's my twin. I mean, we always thought we were twins. I didn't bid him goodbye. Then, with a little wonder in his voice, But you are not angry. Uncle Roger was angry at me because I cried for my folks. He thinks being poor is a disgrace. Gordon, said his mother earnestly, I should indeed be grieved if you had no love in your heart for that woman who, in spite of her poverty, took a homeless babe to her heart and was so true a mother that you never dreamed you were not her son. Some day, if God gives you your rights, you must do great things for them. But all that we can do now is to write and let them know your safe arrival. Oh, that would please them. Daddy couldn't read it, but they'll wait till Father Cornwall comes. Father Cornwall. Lady Margaret's face lost all its gentleness. Her eyes were as stern as the old Douglas Steele. Oh, why did everyone hate the faith he had been taught to love? His hand gripped the arm of the chair till the knuckles stood out hard and white. Yet he looked straight into those stern eyes and answered, The Abels are Catholic, and I am a Catholic too. His mother was not looking at him now. Her eyes were fixed on the old fireplace with a look of deepest joy. Holy Mother of God, she was saying, I thank thee that thou hast kept thy trust. Mother, if you are a Catholic, what made you look at me like that? I wish to learn of what metal you are formed, my son. There is one weakling in the house of Gordon. Had you shown a spirit like Sir Roger's, had your will bent because you feared me, I would have disowned you, my son, though it broke my heart. The Earl of Ravenhurst must always stand for God and our Blessed Lady, let the cost be what it may. A gleam came into Lady Margaret's eyes. Now, most noble Sir Paul Pry, now will the Countess of Ravenhurst conform herself to those laws of Scotland. I fit herself most snugly into this first opportunity. The good uncle is very busy talking about himself and all he has done, or maybe not done, in the colonies. The cunning Godfrey also is busy. He must needs open the chest and show the wampum, the tomahawks, and even a bear skin, though I doubt somewhat the truth of Sir Roger's tale of his great bravery in killing the monster. Killing the bear? He is not claiming my pelt, is he? He didn't have a thing to do with it. I killed that bear myself. You killed that beast? Did you more than help some hunter just a little? The old bear had us treed. She rammed her snout right up on the gun. I couldn't have missed her if I had tried. My son, I came here tonight to speak of things more important than a bear's pelt. There was that in her voice which made the boy look up with swift constraint of every muscle. Lady Margaret smiled, for she saw the war spirit that pulsed in his frame, and she knew him to be worthy of her confidence, though but a boy in hand and heart and brain. I have much to tell you this night, my son, she said, and her deep eyes seemed to read his soul. Things of import, matters that could not be trusted to a coward. It was for this reason that I tried your metal boy, and your mother's heart was glad to hear it ring back true, Gordon Steele. Of the things I tell you this night, speak nothing. You are yet a boy and do not know friend from foe. Whatever be your need, Put no trust in Godfrey Birchinson. The lad's brow drew up in a puzzle. I thought you were going to say not to trust Uncle Roger, he blurted. 
Lady Margaret laughed. Why should I warn where there is no danger? You have already taken the measure of Sir Roger. But I warn you, trust nothing to Godfrey Bertrandson. Then suddenly, after a pause, like an arrow shot from under a shield, the mother sent a question. What do you know about your father? The boy frowned a moment, as if searching his memory. Not much, mother. I guess his name is all they told me. She seemed relieved. So you shall learn of him from me, and that is well, she said. There was in her eyes a look deep, unfathomable, as if a mingling of joy and pain. I was an orphan in this house, she continued, a child of Douglas blood, but penniless. James was Earl of Ravenhurst, not as it is today, but as it was in the time of which you will learn, a bleak winter time of poverty and pain. Yet there are gifts that gold and fame can never buy, for God alone has the giving of them. God gave to James and me a love that was blessed before his throne in heaven. Here, standing before this fireplace, we were married. You smile, my son. Some day you will know that this great room in the seaward tower is the room of memories to all of Gordon blood, and this fireplace is a sacred thing to all who know its history. James and I had waited long for our wedding day, because no priest had come this way in many years. He was no longer young, nor was I, but we would have gone single to our graves rather than be wedded by any other than a priest of God's holy church. God sent his minister to us, and the castle rang with mirth and song. Never was there a gayer wedding, nor was there one laugh less light, because both bridal pair and merry-making clan had nothing but oat cake and ale to feast upon. Three years God gave joy to James and me, and then he sent the cross, my son. For it was ten years ago on this very night that the king's dragoons came for your father. James was standing by my side as I lay on the couch yonder. He thought me to be dying. We could hear the heavy boots of the soldiers champing in the hall below. Courage, little comrade at arms, he whispered. The battle lowers. The bugle of Christ calls forward. Shall we falter in the charge? We follow a leader crucified. Then came the clanking of their armor as they climbed the stairs. James took you from my arms, wee bit of a newborn babe that you were, and carried you over to the fireplace. A little image of Our Lady used to stand there. He laid you down before it and prayed. Holy Mother of God, Margaret is dying. I am going, God knows where. See, there is no one to guard the faith of our child. Holy Mother, we leave him in your care. James brought you back to me. Fear nothing, Margaret, he whispered. The Blessed Mother never yet has failed those who trust in her. Then he kissed us both and went out, and the dragoons took him. But, my son... I would that you should know the joy in my heart this night, when I see how faithfully Our Lady has kept her trust. O oh, son, we shall cling to each other and trust the sweet mother of God. Where is my father now? asked the boy, his bright eyes wide with wondering love. God alone knows, she answered. I never learned what befell him. So many years have passed that I hope he is dead. Hope that he is dead? Yes, Gordon, I hope that my brave and noble James is dead. For if he is dead, he is with other martyred Gordons who stand before the great white throne. But if he is living, he is in some foul dungeon, suffering hunger, thirst, the rack. I know not what. Margaret was not weeping. She had borne her pain too long for that. But the lad knew now why his mother's hair was white, and in his childish way he strove to comfort her. Mother, the boy ventured, perhaps, you see, Father Cornwall was so wise. I guess all priests must be. The next time we go to Mass, the priest could help us find out about Father. Lady Margaret smiled. He was so eager to comfort her, so powerless. My son, you have forgotten that we do not live in Mary's land beyond the sea. I have been present at Holy Mass five times in my life. Even should the holy sacrifice be offered near us, there would be small chance of our being there. 
Sir Roger watches like a hawk. I shall tell you what I do. When on a Sunday I am longing to live in lands where mass bells ring, I come in here and kneel before the old fireplace. This is the sacred relic of the house of Gordon. Many times in bygone years the priest of God made of this mantle an altar. Many times within these walls the angels cover their faces with their wings, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. Once did wicked men spill here the blood of God. That silver spot upon the hearth marks the place where the drops of precious blood fell years and years ago. Therefore, to this holy room I come, and kneel by the fireplace, and pray a while, and kiss that little silver spot, and beg the good Lord Christ to come to me in spirit, since I cannot receive him in the holy sacrament. You can do this, too, but we must not come together, and we must not stay more than two or three minutes. If Sir Roger were to learn of it, even this small comfort would be denied us. Uncle Roger is mean to you, cried the boy with sudden anger. But now that I am here, if he dares say a thing to you, I'll... You will keep your temper and say nothing. That is what you will do when things go wrong. If you fly into a passion, you will do great harm and no good. Keep this little thought to be your comfort at such times. Nothing Roger says can wound. Only those we love can cause us grief. Let me see you growing up day by day, such a son as the child of such a father should be. Then your mother will be a happy woman, come what may. Gordon felt the strength of her will across his own, and the love in his heart for her deepened into reverence. They were silent for a time, and when his mother spoke again, it was of other things. You have not yet told me of those kind folks who gave you shelter in your childhood, she said. How was it that they found you? There was something in her tone that made him wonder at her question. I don't know much about it, he answered, and again he noted a look of relief in the depths of her eyes. Daddy said that Father Cornwall found me and brought me to them. They named me George because I called myself Doherty. Did you say anything else? Only to ask for Dunky Tiwi. Do they tell Roger that? Lady Margaret's voice was swift and sharp. No, cried Gordon, startled at her tone. Thank God, she said, and smiled at his troubled face. It was for your Uncle Stephen that you called. Well, indeed, would Roger know the meaning of your wail for Dunky Tiwi, and one more nail will be driven into my poor brother's coffin. The puzzled boy stared at her. You were lost a long time from Uncle Roger, but you were not lost at all from your mother, my son. After the dragoons took your father, I was ill for many months. A year later they again thought me to be dying. Even faithful Benson thought my last hour had come, and she sent a messenger from my brother. Your Uncle Stephen is one of our brave hunted priests that neither prison nor the fear of death can drive from Scotland. He came at the risk of his life to give me the last rites of Holy Church, and took you with him, promising to find a home for you where your faith would be guarded. He passed out with you, hidden under his long gray cloak. A trusty clansman rode him to a seagoing frigate. I had supposed that my brother meant to take you to France, and place you with our kinsman, Cardinal Beaton. But Stephen is a saint, and saints do not reason as worldly people do. He considered your soul alone, and placed you where he thought that pearl most safe. I was not pleased with his choice, but he said, Where was the only son of the king of kings placed, in a castle or a cot? I said no more, for Stephen is a saint. Why didn't Uncle tell Daddy Abel, instead of just setting me down by the roadside? That was a queer thing to do. Rather, it was a wise thing to do. Had this kind farmer known whose child he took into his house, Sir Roger would have put him in prison for helping to kidnap you. Neither did Stephen go to a strange land and set you down by a roadside and leave you to the hand of chance. He knew well the wisdom and charity of the good priest to whom he entrusted you, and he remained in hiding a few weeks till he learned what manner of man was the John Abel in whose care you were. Then, my son, 
when Stephen and our trusty clansmen thought the time was right for your return, we paid a seaman to give Sir Roger a clue that he might search for you and bring you back to us. But it is also queer, mother. Now there is this picture of me you have over the fireplace. How did you get it? Lady Margaret laughed. This is not your portrait. It is your father's. Now do you know why it takes but a glance to let any clansman know whose son you are? And the old warrior? Is he Gordon of the Langsword? Oh, no, that is your great-grandfather, Angus Gordon, commonly called the Old Earl. The boy was a bit disappointed. I never heard of an Angus Gordon. I thought he looked brave enough to be Langsword. Godfrey said he was the greatest Earl of them all. No doubt Godfrey thinks so, but I shall tell you of both these heroes, and you shall say which was the braver knight. It is not titles, lands, and gold that make a man great. You shall learn who are the great men of your house, and who have done heroes' deeds, and why this old fireplace is sacred to all of Gordon blood. Lady Margaret smiled, and there was triumph in her glance. Then her look grew suddenly grave. My son, I shall tell you many tales in time. Yet, lest unknown need should catch you unprepared, I must give you one more word of warning. If you have need of help in any hour of trouble, call on Benson. Failing her, old Edwin, the gate warden, is true. But be watchful. Sometimes walls have ears, and do not speak unless your need is very great. Trust no one else. Should you be forced even to fly from the castle, you have loyal clansmen living in the fastnesses of Benender's glens. Their chief, and the best of them all, is Muckle John of the Cluth. A secret passage opens from this old fireplace, the same way by which you fled when Friar Stephen carried you in his arms. It is not known to Sir Roger. There is a spring in the hand of the wooden soldier on the right side of the mantle. Turn the sword twice to the right and press down. A panel on the left of the fireplace will slide back into the wall. This is the beginning of the passage. The end is in the woodland near Ben Ender. When once in the open, make your way to the frith and follow the shore to the glen. But mother, interrupted the boy, a look of apprehension darkening his eyes, if we had to go away, you would be with me, and you would know where the paths are. Lady Margaret did not answer. The white fingers clenched on the arm of the chair, but only for a moment. It is not wise to face trouble till it comes, she said with strange quietness. Be brave and silent, my son. We shall trust to God and Our Lady, hoping that all may go well. She had given these instructions in a tense, clear, exceedingly low tone, her lips scarcely moving. But with the last word, her voice rose to a merry note and she began to sing a sweet old ballad about a Douglas lost in battle for the love of the heart of the Bruce. Something in her eye told the boy to ask no question. Half instinctively, Gordon realized that there had been a sound in the outer hall a moment or so before, and he heard it again, a faint creaking, as if a weight were against the door. My friend Godfrey. There was a ray of light teasing Gordon's eyes. He turned sleepily toward the wall. How did he happen to be in bed? Who put him there? He could not remember undressing at all. Was it his mother? She had been talking to him about his father. What? Oh, yes, he was in prison somewhere, or perhaps dead. She had been telling him things about a hero greater than Langsword, about a sacred stone in a fireplace. No, she did not tell him, only started to do that, and then broke off suddenly as things will stop in a dream. Gordon opened his eyes. My, how late, he thought with a start. It's broad daylight. Gordon turned the coverlet back, rolled over, stared a moment, began to rub his eyes. I am not in the same room. Yes, I am. He puzzled. The bed is the same, the windows and the pictures, but the fireplace. That is not the fireplace I saw last night. It can't be the same room. Yes, it is. There is the chair where we sat. 
There are the antlers belonging to Fire the Braves. Last night they were right up there on top, but not on top of that fireplace. I am all turned round. He sat still upon the edge of the bed. There was indeed a great carved mantle, a beautiful work of old-style art. There were four pillars, two above and two below the mantle. But the two which rested on the hearth were not yeomen of the guard, and the two above were not knights, but oaken trunks round which a grapevine twined. Here and there clusters peeped temptingly from among the carved leaves. A beautiful work of brush and chisel, but not the fireplace beside which he had been seated while his mother spoke of long ago. There was a painting above the mantel, just beneath an arch of vines, but not the one he had seen last night, beneath the cross swords. The same place, the same size and shape, but not the same picture. It was not an aged warrior and a lad, but a kilted chieftain of long, long ago, standing with one foot upon a fallen deer. Below, the gilded title shone in the sunlight. Sir David Gordon, Lord Rock Raven, first Laird of Ravenhurst, commonly called Old Fire the Braves. Lady Margaret had said the mantle was held sacred, but many odd trifles lay upon it, French knick-knacks and shells from beyond the sea. The blackened hearthstone showed no trace of that silver spot. Nothing seemed the same. The door opened, framing Godfrey's smiling face. Well, my lord, are you awake at last? If you had slept a little longer, you might have slept the clock around once more. Very late, isn't it? But Gordon's mind was elsewhere. No, my lord, it is still quite early. Two o'clock by the sundial, sir. Two in the afternoon? Two by the dial, my lord. Why didn't Benson call me? Benson? Pray, who is Benson? Don't you know Benson? She's the kind old woman who gave you my supper. Oh, you mean Betsy. No, I mean Benson. Your lordship might call her Ben's daughter, though, if my memory play me no trick, her father's name was Tam. I think she would not take kindly to the name of Ben's son. But call her what you may. Don't say she is a good old soul. Betsy is a blooming lass, turned sixteen last Candlemas. She is old, and her name is Benson. I know, because she gave you my supper. Have your own will, my lord, but I would not take your word, nor even your oath, for anything which happened last night. Aye, but you were one right royal sleepy-head. The guests were scarcely seated, when down went your head on your mother's silken knee, and there was no waking our young lord at all, though the great folks from miles round had come to see you. So Betsy was called, and she led you away. My sakes, Master Godfrey, she said to me later, I brought him a fine pigeon pie, but down goes his head on the table, and off to sleep again. Poor tired lamb. I led him to this room just now. Will you run upstairs and put him to bed? So up I came. Here you were, standing with your head against the fireplace, sound asleep on your own two feet, and asleep you've been ever since. The puzzled boy rubbed his eyes again, and his mind struggled to clear itself. He did have his head against the mantle, but not that mantle. It was his mother, not Godfrey, who found him, and they sat a long time in that great leather chair by the fireplace, but not that fireplace. He would ask his mother about it some time when they would be alone. It wouldn't do to ask Godfrey. Then he spoke aloud. What did my mother say when I was not there for breakfast? Oh, she had no time to trouble herself about so small a matter. All the great folk rode over to Lindsay Hall quite early. The young Lord of Bethune is to be married this day fortnight, and the gentle Lady Anne of Lindsay is to be his bride. Why does she go so soon? The wedding is not to be for two weeks. My mother will not be away all that time, will she? What would she be doing? Doing? What would any lady be doing? Dancing and riding out with the hunt, to be sure, having a gay and merry fortnight. I cannot see why an old lady like my mother would want to dance so much, and she won't come back at all till after the wedding. Perhaps not then. You must have a bee in your bonnet for calling people old. It is well for you that Lady Margaret did not hear you say she is one who is no longer young. Well, she is old, Gordon cried almost angrily. Her hair is snow white. Snow white. The Countess of Ravenhurst is so old that she is snow white. That would be a joke for her rivals. 
What a sleepy-eyed child you were last night. Your sweet mother's fair, very fair, my lord. As to her age, what sort of gray head have you that your mother needs to be aged? Godfrey laughed merrily. My lord, t'was just eleven years last Christmas that the old bell rang out her welcome to Ravenhurst. Many a fine ballad was written and sung in honor of the gallant young Gordon and his bride, the white rose of Douglas. Here you are trying to tell me she is old. Ay, even white-haired. Come, come, there are many who say the Countess of Ravenhurst is the most beautiful woman in Scotland. Her age, would you know it, is six and twenty, but none would guess it. You have never spoken of my father before, cried the lad. It hurt him to hear Godfrey speak so lightly of his mother. They could not be the same, that frail, sorrow-worn mother of last night, and this gay lady of the world. But had his mother ever spoken to him? Godfrey had found him asleep with his head against this fireplace, not that other one. Could all the long, strange talk of last night be but a dream? You never spoke of my father before, he repeated. Please tell me of him. Where is he? You never asked before. I do not like to speak of sad things. He is dead, my lord. The old castle rang with hunt and song for two short years, and then Lady Margaret was a widow. Your father died quite suddenly. A bit of a cold caught while hunting was all it seemed at first. But he was gone in a fortnight. The boy sat looking up at the fireplace with a troubled countenance. Was the brave father of last night only a dream? But it would not be wise to ask questions. He was sure of that. Come, come, let us talk of more pleasant things, my lord. Now, if you wish Lady Margaret to be pleased with you when she returns, see how much you can learn in a fortnight. How the lad did study. But then, what else was there to do? He had no playmates of his own rank. Others were too far beneath his dignity as heir of all Ravenhurst. How he longed for the old free days when he had no dignity. So he put his whole heart into his studies, and every scrap of work he did was saved to show his mother. That little mother he had known but a few hours, yet he loved her more than Daddy Abel, yes, more than Mammy, too. His heart filled up when thinking of them, yet he knew he loved her more. She is really and truly my own mother, that must be why. When she comes home, she will straighten out all the puzzles about the first night. So he thought as he stored away those treasures, sheet after sheet. Gordon had been hard at work for three weeks. There was pride in his eye as he placed his last page upon the others. Godfrey smiled. Well, my lord, that pile in the drawer must be thick now. What are you planning to do with them? Build a monument, or use them for the breastworks of a fort? Oh, you are laughing at me, Godfrey. You see, Mother will come home in a day or two, and I want to show them to her. Show her the last two or three, then. She would hold up her dainty hands in horror if she should see your first attempts. Uncle Roger would laugh at them, but she will not. She will know I did my best. Anyway, the last are better. You used to say, How much paper between those blots? And now it's, How many blots on that paper? There is only one blot on this, just the place where that H got its hump on the wrong side, and I tried to turn it over. It looks as if you turned the inkhorn over and a spider took a stroll across the page. But never mind, you will be a scribe some fine day. Oh, Godfrey, see where the road turns the point of the cliff? It's the carriage. Oh, Godfrey, it's the carriage. There goes the big bell. And the boy was gone, racing down halls, sliding down banisters, banging doors. He arrived in three short minutes at the castle gate. Then he waited, and then he thought. He had been good, that is, he had been quiet for three long weeks. Now, just when it was almost over, he had been a wild man of the forest once more. Sir Roger would hear, oh well, he was used to his uncle's sarcasm. But his mother? Would she be angry? The soldier just beside him, there was a twinkle under those bushy eyebrows. Was he laughing? He had saluted most gravely, but if he were laughing, then the heir of all Ravenhurst had disgraced himself before the soldiery. You see, the lad gasped, you see, my mother is coming. You see, I forgot my dignity. 
Please, I could not help forgetting about it. I want her so. The twinkle had grown till the grim old mouth was smiling also. Lady Margaret had come in, be she? No wonder ye swooped down on the wing. As you flew abandoned o'er the head, John, I could but just make my old eyes tell me twas the young laird himself, and know the gay laird Jamie o' the long ago. Jamie? You mean my father? Wasn't he always quiet? Did he ever forget his dignity? There was a chuckle low and rumbling in the grizzled soldier's throat. I do not mind the day when there Jamie had a dignity to forget. If I was not hauling him doon from a battlement edge, I would be a fish in him Udo the moat. Twas his young worship, Laird Roger, that had had the dignity to be found for the Orkneys to land's in. But Laird Jamie, my ain bonny Jamie, he was ever bold and free as the winds of an ender. Your father was a straight dawn, upstanding Scot, as were all o' the Gordon chiefs before him, and there will be na body who can ever turn ye into a prancing prig. You'll be as the earls who are no more, for ye are a true splinter, Father old Gordon Steele. But I ran in the halls, and I slid down the ban. Worry no more, none but the servants saw ye, nor lad nor lass o' them would tad on ye for a bag of bobbies. But shh, Godfrey be coming, and he may howl to Sir Roger that you broke all the plumes of your dignity if he find ye talking with a common soldier. Yet one word more, my lairdy, if ever ye had need, Old Edwin's at your service. A thought flashed through Gordon's mind, keen and clear as the call of the curlew, an echo from that first night. Old Edwin, the gate warden, is true. When the tutor came sedately down the great stone steps, he beheld the heir of old Ravenhurst standing on the velvet sward gathering rosebuds. The old soldier, never a stone in the ancient gateway, was more rigid than he. The chains rattled and groaned as the drawbridge came creaking down across the moat. There was a hollow sound of horses' hoofs, and the carriage rolled in. Sir Roger stepped out, alone. My mother? The boy's voice had a choking sound. My mother? Is she ill? Oh, no, Gordon. There was no need for her to leave the merry-making. Matters of state brought me, but she may as well remain till the end. When will she come, uncle? In a week or so, perhaps. Have you studied well? The days slipped away one by one. It was fully six weeks since Sir Roger's return. Still the pile in the drawer grew. Gordon was placing his last task upon the others. Godfrey laid aside the grammar. Well, my lord, how soon will you need a new drawer for that collection? Mother will come in a day or two, surely. The drawer will not overflow before then. She will be so disappointed if she cannot see them all. Are you sure of it? I fear it is you who will be disappointed for your pains. When you carry that cartload to her, she will say, Run along, child, and do not trouble me with that rubbish. The maid must arrange my headdress. Don't, Godfrey, don't. My mother is not such a woman. I would hate her if she were like Sir Roger. Your mother is a most excellent lady, but have a little common sense. Do not trouble her with trifles. You have one great fault, my lord. You are a dreamer. You have built an angel in your mind and named her mother. Then, forsooth, if the real lady fail to have golden wings, you will hate her. Have a care. Your dreams may cause the loss of your head one fine day. You worship a dream church, even as you worship that dream mother. No, Godfrey, it is you who are the dreamer. I think my mother is a true mother, just as Mommy Abel was but I know that the church is true. My little lord, do you see the oaks over on Ben Ender? Last spring their leaves were tender green. They grew more beautiful with lengthening summer days. Now the glory of autumn is all but faded. A few more northern winters, and the oaks will be bare and ugly. They are a picture of your dream church. Fresh and fair in her beginning, but days of strength, days of glory came and went, and now she is all but dead. Oh, no, Godfrey, are the oaks dead because the leaves have fallen? Neither is the church of God dead. Now, bravo, there is eloquence as well as wit in that. Your brain will be as keen in argument as was laying sword steel in battle. Let your training be what it should, and, mark my words, the day will come when the house of lords 
Ay, even the king himself will hang breathless upon your words. Oh, it is not that I know how to argue, but you have the wrong side, Godfrey. The side that is not true always has a hole in it. Well, is this a lesson or a tale in which you are so interested? Sir Roger was standing beside them, a letter in his hand. Pardon the interruption, but Lady Margaret has sent good news. It will be of great benefit to you in time. Oh, is she coming home tomorrow? What is it? Coming home? Oh, no. I doubt that you will see her again before you reach manhood. She has been chosen maid of honor by the Queen, and must go to London at once. Sir Roger withdrew. He seemed in fine spirits. Gordon walked over to the window and stood there kicking his foot against the wainscoting, whistling, anything to conquer the tears. Then he walked slowly to the drawer, took out that treasured pile, and threw it on the coals. He leaned against the mantel and watched them burn. No, he muttered. No, she was only a... The Ruin in the Wood March came. The lad stood by his window, watching the sunrise. Oh, how warm! It is really spring at last. I am going for a ride before breakfast. He ran out into the hall. Godfrey was there. Good news, my lord. Sir Roger decided last night that he would send you to Glasgow to prepare for the university. You will go in the fall. Oh, Godfrey, are you going too? And there will be all those football games. Football, is it? You must do more than play football. You must become a learned man, so that you can bring your earldom to its proper place. Oh, I know. I mean to study, but I have not played with a boy for almost a year. Yes, yes, I understand. I know how you feel. Quite natural for a lad. But here comes your uncle. Well, my little Gordon, Sir Roger was smiling. A messenger brought this letter a few minutes ago. It is as much for you as for me. The lad took the note, a dainty bit of parchment with an odor of roses about it. His mother was now in great favor with the queen. She had made a conquest and was soon to marry the earl of something or other. He could not make out the name nor the long title. There was not a word about himself, not so much as my love to the boy. She had forgotten him. The bitter spot which had been burning all winter was almost past bearing. He did not ask if she were coming home. He wished never to see her again. Why should he? She had no love for him. Gordon, says Sir Roger, as he took the note from the boy's hand, I am much pleased with your progress in study. You have a brain and use it. Now I am going to give you the best education to be obtained in Scotland. Oh, thank you, uncle. When am I going? The lad was thinking of football. I do want to go so much, and I'll study. Oh, I will study, uncle. Godfrey will take you to Glasgow next fall. But remember, you do not stir one step till I have your word that there will be no Catholic nonsense while you are gone. Gordon did not answer with the indignant no that had always come before. His heart was full of bitter, stinging anger. He was longing for boyish games, as only a lonely boy can long. He turned on his heel and walked down the hall toward the stables with a quick, short step. Sir Roger would have followed, but Godfrey touched his arm. Let well enough alone, my lord. Let that dose sink in. The horse had been in the stable for days. He would not stand still even while Gordon mounted. They were under the old arch in a flash and onto the drawbridge before it was fully down. The steed gave a little snort and tossed his mane. Away he flew toward the wood. Gordon leaned forward. Away, away through the clear sunshine, over the hedges, over the ditches with a catch in his breath, dodging under branches, just bursting into leaf. Oh, what a glorious ride! The horse stopped, panting at the edge of the wood. God's sweet sunshine had put a better spirit into the boy. Good ride, old fellow, good ride, he cried, slapping the horse's shoulder. Take it easier if you want to. You're getting hot. A bird in the great larch above him set up a bit of spring tune, and Gordon whistled in answer. His hand was deep in his pocket, as boys' hands are sure to be. 
Something hard touched his fingers. He drew it out. Only a brown rosary. Gordon held it up and looked at the simple thing, wondering how it came to be in his pocket. He had forgotten all about the rosary he meant to say every day for the folks back home in Maryland. They had promised to say one for him. Would they have forgotten? No, not Daddy Abel. When he said he would do something, he did it. Gordon slipped the beads through his fingers. They brought memories. The old cabin, mother kneeling by the cradle, rocking it with her foot, father leading the prayers, and all the little Abels answering, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. He saw Daddy reaching one hairy hand to give little witch a cuff for tickling toddler's feet, but never pausing in the prayer. Then he remembered the old log church, Father Cornwall's solemn voice, but still the same sweet prayer that the angel said, Hail Mary, full of grace. And the great day, it was only a year ago, when they made their first communion, he and Joel. He thought of the joy of that moment when, kneeling at the altar rail, he saw the priest raise the host above the chalice, and the long-awaited moment had come. He thought of the promises, boyish promises, earnest, loving, whispered to the Lord Jesus. He remembered with a start that he had given no answer to Uncle Roger in the hall. Daddy Abel seemed to be standing at the edge of the woodland and saying, No man can lead you into sin if you don't follow him. Stand on your own two feet and be a man. Suddenly the horse stood still. There was a wall of trees in the way. They were so close to each other that none had a chance to grow. Some seemed dying, others were dead. The row stretched out to right and left as far as he could see. It looks like a hedge that has not been cut since the owl knows when, he thought as he turned to the right and rode along. He found an opening farther down and looked through. On the other side was a field with a strange row of trees running around it. Looks as if it used to be an oat field, Gordon mused, with all those bunches of old straw among the weeds. But that must have been long, long ago. Look at all those young trees growing in the field. A bush moved, and a deer sprang from behind it, head raised, ears alert, and foot uplifted. A frightened sniff, a scamper of hoofs. It was gone. The horse, a hunter bred, dashed to the opening between the trees. Gordon, quickly dropping his head against the beast's neck, barely escaped the fate of Absalom. They bounded away across the field, over the bushes and under the trees. Then the deer swerved suddenly and sprang through an opening in the dense hedge. "'I am not going through that place, old fellow,' cried the lad, tugging at the reins. "'Maybe you can get through there, but I want my head for a day or two more.' Gordon had a good wrist for his age, but the horse had a good neck for his age. The animal was full-grown, the boy was not. "'Can't stop him,' he gasped. "'His jump off or be raked off.' Loosening his feet in the stirrups, he dropped the reins and jumped. Gordon struck, rolled over a few times, and lay still until the dizziness from the fall had passed. Then he sat up, rubbed himself, and took stock of his injuries. Kind of shaken up inside. Headache, some. Knee stings. Nothing but a bruise in a skinned place. Guess I'm all right. Jumping up, he ran to the opening and slipped through. The horse was gone. So was the deer. Gordon was standing at the edge of an old flower garden. The weedy bed beneath his feet had once been a star of roses, over which a crested boar's head grinned from its place on the great sundial. A cross of Malta lay beyond with a marble fountain at the center. But the rose bushes were choked with dead thistles, the gravel was covered with moss, and the frog in the broken fountain croaked to the lizard that sprawled on the sundial. The building had once been majestic, but fire and time had made it a vast ruin. The cloister lay in blackened heaps, half covered with moss and vines. Here and there an arch yet stood, held more by the ivy than by its own strength. The gothic windows of the minster were broken and blackened, but the morning sun glinting through them sent long prisons of light across the weed-grown lawn. The lad crawled over a broken window sill. From the jagged pane above him smiled Our Lady, Queen of Heaven. My mother, Gordon whispered, my mother. She is like Sir Roger, but you loved your son. 
If I have you, I have a mother still, and I all but turned against the faith this morning. Gordon dropped down into the ruined minster. The carved stalls were about him. Many had fallen, and some were half buried beneath parts of the roof, which had come down years before. There were heaps of dead leaves on the moldering beams, plants growing upon them, and many vines. A sapling oak leaned over the altar, slender, graceful. Beneath it, the tabernacle door hung open on one hinge. A robin, perched there, looked at the boy with frightened eyes. Her nest was in the holy place. Gordon paused on the altar step, and the bird flew to the tree. He put out his hand to take the nest, but stopped. I wonder what is worse, to leave the nest there or to put my hand into the tabernacle. Let the poor bird in peace, Gordon, came a low, powerful voice. The boy turned with a startled cry. Halfway down among the ruined pews stood a tall figure in a long gray cloak. His face seemed but a yellow skin stretched across the skull, but the deep blue eyes were full of life. They were kind eyes, and Gordon lost his fear as he looked into them. See, you have frightened the little bird. She is doing no harm where she is. That place has not been God's altar for eighty years and more. How is your mother? My mother! All the anger of the morning burned in the lad's voice. He spoke out wildly, spoke as he had never done before, even with Godfrey, told it all all that had been burning in his heart these long, bitter months. And you believed this? All this? Believed it? Isn't it true? Not one word of it. Where is my mother, then? A great hope was springing up in his heart. Perhaps he had not been dreaming. Perhaps his real mother had sat with him beside the fireplace on that first night. I do not know where she may be. Then how can you say the story is not true? Why do I know this wild tale is untrue? Gordon, I know Margaret of Douglas. Poor Margaret, how much she has suffered. And you, boy, how could you believe such things of your own mother? But Godfrey said so. Uncle Roger must have lied to him. Godfrey is your friend, the best friend you have, is he not? He has always been kind to me. Oh, yes, very kind. He tells you what a bright boy you are, and that you will be the greatest lord old Ravenhurst ever had. How did you know that? The boy flushed painfully. Godfrey is Bertrand's son. Do you know who Bertrand was? Not yet. In time you shall. A devil with the oil of flattery upon his lips is a double devil, boy. The stranger paused as if in thought. So Margaret has been gone for seven months. Did she speak to you about your faith or your father before she disappeared? Gordon was troubled. Had his mother really spoken to him on that first night? If that gentle, sorrow-worn mother were not a dream, she had forbidden him to mention the subject of which they had talked. You need not fear to tell me, said the stranger, seeming to read the lad's thoughts. You know to whom you are speaking, do you not? No, sir. Who are you that knows so much about my mother and me? Stephen Douglas. Uncle Stephen? Donkey Tiwi? You have changed much since you used to call me by that name. Did your mother speak of Sir James or of your religion? Yes, Uncle Stephen. That is, I don't know if she did or if I dreamed she did. I think she talked to me a long time on the night I came from Maryland. Maybe she didn't, but I think she told me about my father, and was going to tell me more, but she stopped strangely all of a sudden. Do you know what penalty she was to pay for such talk? No, uncle. Sir Roger told her that if she ever dared to speak to you of Sir James or of your faith, he would execute the law to the fullest extent. Do you know what that means? No, uncle. If a widowed mother persists in teaching the ancient faith to her children, any relative of the new faith may take her children from her. Roger said that if she went against his will, she would never see your face again. If she had told me... 
Margaret would not have told you her own danger. No doubt, Godfrey had an ear at the door. Your mother knew the risk and took it. Fearing you might get into trouble by some foolish attempt to rescue her, she did not tell you of Sir Roger's threat. That would be Margaret's way. God grant the traitor had enough mercy to put her in a cell above ground. Where do you think she is? Some place in the old castle, in or under the north tower. The dungeons are there. Gordon scraped his heel back and forth among the dry leaves. She has been suffering all winter long, and instead of helping her, I have been thinking mean things. Let it be a lesson to you. Never allow anyone to come between you and your mother, or between you and your God. Those two friends are true. Gordon stood with eyes of dumb agony. The gray cloak friar waited, watching. He knew the metal of that boy, and let the pain give the caustic cure, burning out whatever might of dross could be within that strong young soul. At last Gordon drew a long breath as if shouldering a load. He looked up at his uncle. On his boyish face was the light of awakening manhood, a deep strength scarcely expected there. But because it was impossible for him to open his full heart as yet, when he did speak it, it was a mere commonplace which he asked. Uncle, what does my mother look like? Is she a little, white-haired, fair old lady? Godfrey said I had been dreaming. He said my mother is young and very beautiful. Your mother is not old in years. She seems old because she has suffered so much since that night when the dragoons came for your father. Sir James let me make his castle my headquarters. You know I am an outlaw, child. To give me food or shelter is a crime punishable by death. I fear your father gave his life for mine. Could you but remember that night, which followed the arrest of your father, you would know if your mother loved you or not. Toward morning her heart was so faint that Benson whispered to the other watcher, Begin the beads again, Jeanie, her soul is passing. But Margaret's eyes opened wide. Pray, she gasped, pray that I may live. I cannot die. God helping me, I will not die. I must live for my son's sake. And you, boy, you would let that smooth-tongued Godfrey make you hate her. No, no, those words were too sharp. Forgive me, child. You are only a lad. How could you know the depths of your mother's love? But Gordon suddenly spoke out the thought that had been on his lips a moment before, when he could not control himself to speak it. Uncle Stephen, mother said you are a priest. Well, I am, child. Then couldn't I, couldn't I, go to confession to you here? And I am fasting. Perhaps, that is, is there any way for me to receive Holy Communion? Maybe then I, I wouldn't be so. Friar Stephen took the tear-stained face in his hands. I have frightened you over much, my son. You have been sorely tempted, but I do not think that you have sinned grievously. If Sir Roger were to hear that you had received the sacraments, he would be very angry. He often gets angry. I shall not mind that. This will be a very different sort of anger. He is cruel, as all cowards are. There will be no one who will dare to defend you. Stephen spoke slowly, as if weighing his words, yet he knew what the answer would be. My father suffered, and mother is suffering now. There was joy in the soul of Stephen Douglas. Many were the prayers he had said, many the penances offered that this day might come. So you are ready, Gordon, ready to take your first step on the path of those who suffer for God. Then, taking a kerchief from his cloak pocket, the friar began to bind it over the boy's eyes. Why are you covering my eyes? cried the startled lad. It is not wise for you to know where the good Lord is hiding. Do you think I would tell? cried Gordon, cut to the heart. No, no, child, you would not tell. I did not mean that. But Godfrey will ask sharp questions, and judge by your face when he finds the truth. Bertrand's son is cunning, but he cannot learn from you what you do not know. 
so you will go with the bandages over your eyes. There is a long walk before you. Say your prayers as you go. A long walk it was indeed, with many turns and twists. At last Friar Stephen spoke. Be careful now, we are to go down steps. Down, down, down they went, and then on again. It was damp and cold. Gordon knew it was a cellar, but never thought the prudent friar had led him about in the wood, only to take him into the same ruin from which he had brought him. At last Stephen turned a key in a lock, opened a door, and removed the bandages. They were in a place so dark that Gordon could scarcely see. No little trembling light burned red through the darkness. The enemies were too many. Only the holy stillness spoke of the divine guest, and Gordon knelt to a door. The Mercy of a Coward Sir Roger and Godfrey were in high spirits now that the air was won, almost. They chatted a good half hour at laying new plans. Sir Roger remarked, Gordon should be coming back from his Skylark ride, or he'll be late for breakfast. Turning toward the old Earl's room, he added eagerly, No doubt I can see him from this window. Like a spurred colt, Godfrey sprang alert, yet his voice was but mildly persuasive, as he suggested. The view from the hall window is far better, my lord. But the Earl's is nearer, laughed Sir Roger, as he strolled to the door. Godfrey whirled ran noiselessly to the stairs, down and out of sight. Humming a snatch from an ancient ballad, Sir Roger swung open the door of that room of memories to all of Gordon blood, that room which the weakling of the house of Gordon usually avoided. One glance and the smile died. With a hiss of fury he turned on Betsy and roared, How comes this? The fireplace remains above fire on the sacred stone. Carvings, painting, who dared? Please, my lord, the young gentleman just rose. I had no time to clean. I'll have... Clean it? You know very well. Every servant knows well that there must never be a fire on this hearth. Please, my lord, we thought you had changed your mind, my lord. Your orders, my lord. My orders? Who said it was my orders? Master Godfrey, my lord. Big Godfrey come at once. Yes, my lord, and Bessie hurried away. Sir Roger walked up and down with a stiff and snapping stride. It is not that I have any Romanism in me, he argued, as if addressing someone in the back of his own mind. I am not a Roman Catholic. I was never one, at least not since my reason has been that of a man, a brilliant and thoroughly educated man. But it was my mother's request, her deathbed request that nothing should harm the sacred stone. Sacred? No, no, not sacred. A little wine fell on it years and years ago. Only a little wine. A man must respect his mother's last request, her deathbed wish. Every gentleman does that. Yet, if someone, if Godfrey had seen my anger, he would have said, but he did not see me. Good. Please, my lord, Godfrey cannot be found, my lord, came Betsy's quivering voice from the doorway. But Ben's with me to help. We'll fix everything just as it used to be. The tree trunks were only slipped over the soldiers. The stone you wish kept so clean? It has not been harmed, my lord. We placed another one on top of it. Less talk, girl. Set to work. As to the tree trunks, they are mere casings made in the day of Sir Angus to disguise the fireplace when, um... When state papers concerning Mary Queen of Scots were hidden there, but take them off. They're clumsy, unsightly, and disfigure the apartment. As to the stone, it must always be kept clean because, um, because the fireplace is an heirloom, valued only as such, but not to be marred by common use. Sir Roger stalked out of the room of memories, still battling with his own mind to convince that someone in the back of it Cleverly turned, yes, rather, let Betsy repeat my words. Who would say there was anything, um, unusual? Seated in the library, Sir Roger read for five minutes, sent for the butler, and fumed at him, called for his horse, and raged at the groom, because he saw a tangle in the mane, 
went down to breakfast that had been awaiting his pleasure almost two hours, sniffed at everything set before him, nibbled a bit of this, took a taste of that, and bolted a goblet of strong red wine as he shot one last word to silence that adversary within him. Wine, nothing but wine, a few drops of blood-red wine fell on the old hearthstone years and years ago. Suddenly there was a noise in the hall as of a heated argument. Sir Roger jumped from the table and ran out, slamming the door. The voices died to whispers. Riding all alone in the forest without a groom. Scarce more than a barony. There comes Sir Roger. You tell him. It's your fault. And be clapped in the tower? Not I. Old Edwin broke through the group of cringing servants and said to Sir Roger quietly, My laird, we had all fear that harm had befallen the Gordon. His steed had trailed in with empty saddle. Godfrey be waiting by the gate with your steed, my laird. Sir Roger hurried away. A few moments later the horsemen clattered out through the great gate. The dogs picked up the scent and started toward the woods. Halfway across the meadows, Godfrey pointed to a tree near the edge of the forest and shouted, There he is! Gordon is not limping. No, my lord, but I don't like his step. Why, nothing seems wrong with him. He is not injured, but... But what? Look at him, my lord, head up, chest out, tramping along. He has his mind made up, that's certain. What do you make of it? Good. Gordon has decided to go our way. Let's hope so, but I doubt it. Look at the jaw of him, all the will of the house of Gordon up in bristling for a fight. Fight? But why? That's exactly what I wish I knew, my lord. Perhaps Gordon was not thrown. If he got off his horse to talk to someone, Bullock could have broken away. It would mean foul luck for us if Uncle John saw the boy ride to the woods alone and contrived. But this is a fair day. Uncle John should be far out at sea before sunrise, a-fishing. Stephen Douglas? Is it near enough to Easter for him to be skulking around the old ruin? May the fiends defend us from him. That cutthroat of a priest has spoiled more plans of mine than any other man living. If Gordon has been with him, there will be no doing anything with that boy for a year. Hold. No, my lord, no. Godfrey cried out, for Sir Roger's horse was plunging ahead under spur. Wait. Go slowly. We must find out first. Find out? Exactly what I shall do. Not be able to do anything with Gordon for a year, eh? If that brat has been with Stephen Douglas, he'll learn before he's an hour older with whom he is dealing. Roger's sallow face grew still more ugly. Oh, have a care, my lord, have a care, Godfrey pleaded as their horses thundered toward the woods. Don't try force, it's the worst. Don't try force, don't try force, that's always your tune. Much good and smooth ways. You saw this morning the effect of my smooth ways. Think, if the boy has been with Stephen Douglas, he may be heart and soul set to be a martyr of the Gordon line. I'll see that priest on the scaffold yet. But don't try force on the boy now. You only rouse all this stubbornness in him. Then, too, if he has been with the priest, he may have received the sacraments, and... You believe in sacrament magic? sneered Roger. No, but sacraments have a strong effect on those who have as strong a faith in them as Gordon has. Go gently with the lad until we have the facts. Get him up to the castle quietly. Then call out every man you can trust to beat the woods for Douglas. I'll put the bloodhounds on that outlaw. Trust me for that. But go gently with the boy. If he has received the sacraments, I'll teach him the magic of pain. I'll... Oh, have a care, my lord. Remember your brother James. Remember the will of the house of Gordon. Neither you nor any other man can break his will. Oh, think, sir. Have a care. And of what house do I come? Am I not a scion of the house of Gordon? Can you break my will? Weakling of the house of Gordon, snarled Godfrey. But his voice was lost in the thud of hooves. The little Earl of Gordon had seen the racing horsemen, and he was coming straight toward them, a slim, boyish figure in the shadow of those ancient trees. 
His square jaw was set, the iron jaw of fire the braves and lang sword, the firm jaw of the old earl and Sir James, the jaw which for centuries had marked the chiefs of Clan Gordon. But his eyes were Lady Margaret's, deep blue, almost black, with the Douglas fire burning in the depths of them. Bell the cat would have been proud of this boy had he seen him. But, to the lad, it was Daddy Abel's face that rose in his mind, and in his heart he spoke as if to the frontiersman. Uncle is coming, blazing mad. Maybe I must fight it out with him now. Sir Roger drew up his horse with a jerk that turned the foam red from the points of the bit. Explain your conduct, he roared. Conduct? sparred Gordon wearily. What were you doing that your horse should come in with an empty saddle? Oh, is that it? I'm sorry if I caused trouble, sir. Bolo took after a deer. I couldn't hold him. I had to jump off or be raked off, sir. Very slyly put. Nothing else to change you these three hours. Did you talk to any person in the wood? Speak up. Don't try to deceive me. Gordon's tongue was never made for cunning speeches. It was always yes or no with him. Tell a lie? Never. Tell the truth? Betray a priest? Not while the breath of life was in him. No words are needed. Your face speaks for you. You were talking to someone. Was it Stephen Douglas? Denied that if you dare. Godfrey cut in sharply. Gordon, you did not mean any harm, I know, but you went to confession to him in the old ruin, didn't you? The lad's face brightened. Guessing wrong this time. The flashing thought had scarcely crossed his mind. Not at the ruin, eh? Where, then? At the cave among the cliffs? The cavern by the frith side? The hollow back of Ben Ender? There was joy in the lad's heart. What he did not know could not be learned from him. Answer, will you? snarled Sir Roger, springing from the horse. The Gordon does not know, my lord. Can you not tell it from his face? cried Godfrey. Friar Douglas often binds the eyes of children whom he thinks too young to trust. You can answer like a gentleman whether you know or not. Answer, answer, will you? Sir Roger struck the boy with his whip. There were a few things that hurt like the sting of a fine supple lash. Gordon sprang back with a sharp cry. A narrow red line rose up across his face. Answer, will you? You dare to be stubborn with me. The whip rose again. Don't, my lord, don't, Godfrey cried. The child does not know, I tell you. Keep your place, Godfrey Bertrandson. You have done enough harm and to spare. Gordon would have had this lesson long ago but for you. Stand aside. You dare to step in my way. The boy shall learn with whom he is dealing. Open-faced rebellion, receiving treasonable sacraments, talking to outlawed priests, refusing even to answer when spoken to. Much good your religion does, you young gentleman. Did you ever hear of the fourth commandment? Fourth commandment says, Honor thy father and mother. Doesn't say one word about uncles. You can find your tongue soon enough when you wish to give impudence with it. You will know whether or not you must obey uncles when I finish with you. Stephen Douglas is not your uncle, I suppose, but you do his bidding, young upstart. Sir Roger struck quick, sharp blows while he spoke. The lash hissed through the air and writhed around the slim body again and again. The child staggered this way and that from the force of the blows. Once or twice, when the burning whip struck the rising welts, there came a sharp cry. That was all. He did not say one word. Sir Roger's arm was growing tired, but the square jaw was still set, and the blue eyes looked straight into his. He began to realize that the boy's will was stronger than his own. Weakling of the house of Gordon. That taunt had been thrown at him since childhood, and now here was a boy with a will stronger than his own. Pride stung him. The whip fell again and again. But Gordon saw that the coward was weakening. The light of victory shone in the blazing Douglas eyes. There was new courage in every line of that little body, still staggering under the weight of the blows. The look in Gordon's eyes stung Sir Roger's pride anew. Yield? Godfrey has seen everything. Yield? Even the groom would sneer. 
He tried to strike with the same force as before, but his arm was weary, aching. The whip dropped. He had not the power to give what the lad had the courage to take. You may be thankful that I am too merciful to give you more. Then a thought occurred to him. But you deserve no mercy. Go at once to the castle, and without pausing, go straight to your room. You will stay there without food or water till you tell me all that happened this morning. Yes, and until you promise to quit the Catholic Church once and for all. Sir Roger was in great glee. Here was the punishment that could be carried out to the bitter end. It would cost himself no pain. End. Secret of the Fireplace Betsy was wiping the last suds off the hearthstone when Gordon walked swiftly into his room. He stopped in amazement. The fireplace was before him, not the fireplace of the last few months, but the one beside which he had sat with his mother on that strange first night. Betsy, why, Betsy, what has happened? Land six, I do hope your lordship won't be put out about it. Sir Roger, he would have it changed back again like it used to be. Put out? No, indeed. But how did it happen? God bless you, my lord. You never fuss about things at all. But his lordship, Sir Roger, what a temper he flew in when he found it was changed. Master Godfrey gave us the orders, and we did it whilst you slept. Twas the first night. He bade me play off that I was Benson. Land sakes, says I to him. Benson and I don't look alike. She's old enough to be my granny but he would have it. Betsy twisted the rag with a snap. But, for mercy of our lady, lad, what's happened to your face? Sir Roger, no one else would dare. I'll run for some salve. It's nothing, Betsy, never mind. Don't you suppose I know how that stings? I'll go right now, my lord. No, Betsy, no. I'd rather ask you something. You know some, I mean... Do you know where my mother is? The girl dropped her rags and brushed to stare. My lord, she gasped. Then, after a pause, there is nothing I would not do. You, you, but the risk isn't just to me. My old mother, she's a widow, my lord. The few pence I make is all she has. I, I can't lose my place. You do know something. Tell me, Betsy, no one should ever find out from whom I learned. I want to find my mother, pleaded the boy. Well, tis little enough, my lord. Only none of us servants ever believed that Lady Margaret went gallivanting off to London. Not but what she would be an honor even to the king's court. But the tale did not fit. Some things do not fit with some people. The countess is gentle, my lord, kind, very kind, and cheery always but not gay. She was always planning things for the poor and sending little comforts to this old granny or that down in the village. The tale that she was running from one frolic to another did not fit, and not one of us believed it. We were ordered on our lives not to let the village folk know she was no longer at the castle, and from that time Godfrey began to get two extra portions from the cook. He always feeds the prisoners, and that made us think. Prisoners? Where are they kept? I never saw one. Oh, there are always prisoners in great castles like this. They are kept down in the dungeons under the North Tower. My lord, you had better mind your eye today. Don't cross Sir Roger when he's in a temper. He would as soon put you into one of those black holes as eat his supper. I am fearing you are in trouble with him now. No one else would dare to strike your lordship. I'll run and get something to take out the pain. But don't you know anything else? No, my lord, nothing more. And picking up her pail and brush and scrubbing rags, she hurried out. A heavy step came down the hall. The key turned sharply in the lock, and the steps went away again. A few moments later, Betsy tried the door, whispered her comfort through the keyhole, and went back to her work. The long hours began to drag. It was one thing to bear the blows as they fell, when his nature had risen for the battle, but quite another to endure the never-ending smart of the wounds which the lash had made. He walked up and down with quick, impatient steps, then flung himself on his bed, only to spring up again in restless misery. 
The old wag at the wall, steadily ticking all day long, told minutes that seemed to be hours. Still, no one opened the locked door. Thirst had come with the fever. There was a sudden clank of keys. Gordon whirled to face the door. In came Sir Roger. He smiled coolly. The new punishment worked well. Between pain of body and of mind, the boy was very near to madness. Have you had enough of disobeying uncles? He sneered. But the child turned in a frenzy. You take my mother out of that dungeon, he yelled. Under age or not, I'm Earl. You shall pay for this, and for your lies, and for— Sir Roger's grating laugh interrupted him. Hunger will tame you, my angelic nephew. With a sudden, high, piercing cry, the maddened boy sprang at him. Sir Roger jumped back, opened the door, and was out with more speed than grace. Shaken and weary, the lad stumbled to the armchair and flung himself into it. But the chair awakened memories of his mother. Sorrow welled up in him, and the pain of his wounds rose with a lull and excitement. A moan burst from his lips, but it was choked on the instant. No, he muttered, Uncle Roger shall never hear a whine from me. He shall never see the mark of a tear. He can do without that much fun. Then slowly the thought dawned on his mind. And, and, in a way, I did deserve what I got. No boy was ever so mean to his own mother. Gordon slid down on his knees and knelt a long time with his head bowed on the old chair. Minutes snailed on. The burning of thirst outdid the stinging of welts and causing sheer misery. Gordon could endure an action no longer. He sprang up and began pacing the room, jaw set, eyes blazing. There was no sound, save the growl of the old wag at the wall, dueling out the moments. Tick-tock, tick-tock. At long last it groaned, nong, 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 and a bugle blared in the courtyard below. Gordon sprang to the window, thinking with a swift surge of hope. That's change of guards. Old Edmund will be at the gate. Maybe he can help. Down on the walls and in the court below, soldiers snapped out of and into their positions. Edwin, stiff in the joints, was straight as a spear, clanked to his post by the gate. Gordon stood waiting. The wag at the wall whined on. Tick-tock, tick. Edwin, Edwin, he would, he would, if he could. The monotonous sound beat on the boy's eardrums until the irritation all but surpassed the pain. He beat his fist on the stone window ledge, but he did not stir from his place. The agony wore on. Again the old wag moaned, Nong, 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 nong. But Edwin had not yet as much as glanced up at the window where Gordon stood. Tick-tock, tick-tock, Edwin cannot, cannot, for he would, if he could, cannot, cannot. A light flashed into Gordon's eyes, blinding him. He sprang backward, returned, and was driven back again, rubbing his eyes. Cautiously he slipped to the side of the window and looked down. A disc of light began to play on the ceiling. It was coming from the hilt of old Edwin's claymore. His gnarled hand was just below the spot. The disc of light moved in a peculiar way, along the ceiling, as if drawing something, first in the horizontal, then in the vertical, horizontal, and vertical, horizontal, and vertical. Then the light died. Edwin's hand had slipped up and was shading the point on the hilt from which the flash had come. Gordon waited. Nothing more was done. He studied the ceiling, trying to find out the meaning of the signal. What did Edwin draw? Suddenly Gordon's face brightened. Deer horns! He drew deer horns, first lying straight across, then standing up and down. Deer horns? Fire the braze antlers! Did Edwin signal, turn the antlers around? Off went his shoes and socks, for a pioneer boy can climb better barefoot. Up he went from the yeoman on the hearth to the mantel shelf. Gripping the bronze shield of the house of Gordon with his left hand, he took a firm hold on the antlers with his right. But what then? The boar's heads on the old shield grinned at the boy. The antlers would not budge for him no matter how desperately he tugged. The deer's head had never known a deer's body. It was a finely done bit of wood carving. The antlers could not be turned sidewise, 
but maybe they could be pulled forward. Gordon tugged. The small portion of the head in which the horns were fastened squeaked a little, then moved slowly outward until it was an inch beyond the deer's muzzle. There, the hardwood peg on which it was sliding stopped short, and, a moment later, something metallic clicked. Gordon pulled the right antler in line with the deer's muzzle. Nothing happened. He swung the left one over. There was a sound as of a screw turning. He whirled the antlers twice. A crack began to open just behind the deer's ears. Swiftly, yet with anxious care, Gordon whirled the antlers. A moment more, and he could see that there was a small door in the back of the head. Hope leaped in his heart with a wild, glad throbbing. Perhaps Edwin had hidden a key behind that tiny door. As soon as dark closed dawn, he could escape. Edwin would help him find loyal clansmen. He whirled the antlers with shivering fingers. Now he could reach the knob of the door. Now he had it open. And when his hand... Something there, something wrapped in silk, but not a key. He drew it out. A book. Only a book. Nothing but a book. He flung it sailing through the air until it fell on the bed. Surely there must be something worth finding hidden in such a secret place. Walls, top, bottom, back, he felt carefully. There was nothing but polished wood. Bitter disappointment, dizziness, a heartbreaking nausea struck him. Slowly, wearily, Gordon shut the tiny door and screwed the antlers back into place. He worked his way down to the floor, stood trembling a moment, put on his shoes and socks, and dropped into the old armchair. The wag at the wall began to jeer at him again. Tick-tock, tick-tock, Edwin did not, did not, did not. He sprang up with a wild desire to tear down the clock and fling it at Edwin's helmet. Then his eyes rested on the silken bundle lying on the bed. Edwin must have thought that would help me in some way, he reasoned. Perhaps he has hidden something in the book. With dogged step, he went over to the bed picked up the bundle, and unwrapped it listlessly. Oh, beautiful, he whispered. The book lay there in his hand, soft brown buckskin with his own coat of arms told in gold. The three boar's heads of Gordon and the crowned heart of Douglas, they seemed to cry out to him as do the trumpets that blow for the battle. Son of a Gordon and a Douglas, can pain wear you down like this? Are you flinching in your first real grip with the foe? Are you faltering in the charge? You that pledged Stephen Douglas this morning to stand for God and Our Lady? You that, like Sir James, your own father, are sworn to follow, even to the death, a leader crucified? The Gordon's sagging shoulders straightened. A shiver ran through his sturdy frame. The book in his hand trembled, opened a little, and a bit of folded parchment fluttered to his feet. My son... In prayer the thought often comes to me that as you were sent out all alone to learn your faith, so you shall stand out all alone on the day when your faith is tried. What will that trial be? Pain of mind? Or body? Of both? I do not know, but always I fear I shall not be near to blunt the jagged edge of that pain. Yet I can tell you, my son, you are not the first Gordon who has suffered. These tales will show how knights of Christ do in their golden spurs. Courage, then, my son. Whether I am living or with the dead, my prayer shall plead for you in that hour, and accept this small gift. It is all I have to give, child, save the heart's deepest love of your mother. End of chapter Return of Langsword In the great room of the Seaworth Tower in Castle Ravenhurst, Lady Anne stood beside the window and gazed on the surging waters below. Her arm encircled a fair, strong-limbed boy, and now he spoke, pointing one wee finger through the bars. My father, the great Langsword, comes today. Welcome, most noble lord. Your heir salutes you. He spoke slowly, essaying each phrase with energy, lisping his way through with difficulty. She laughed and kissed his rosy lips and cuddled him. With waggish grace, he made his mighty speech again. They had stood in that place a thousand times, looking across the narrow, tossing bay to the bold headland of Ben Ender, around which the pathway ran that led to the war-racked world beyond the rampart of the mountain. 
All his little lifetime they had waited there, for Langsword had been in France on the king's business, and the child had never seen his father's face. So long had Lady Gordon hoped and watched and prayed, standing beside the window with Angus, her child. On the shoulder of Ben Ender, where the faint line of the path came into sight, rode horsemen, outlined sheer against the sky. A flash of light sprang toward the watchers, touching the window, dazzling their eyes. Lady Gordon drew her boy close. "'It is my lord!' she cried. "'He has caught the sunlight on his sword to signal us. Who else would know to touch this window with the light? Wave, darling, wave! Thy father comes!' and two white kerchiefs fluttered at the window. The heavy masonry around her trembled as the cannon on the seaward tower saluted the returning commander. Above the noisy joy of the garrison boomed the castle bell. The folk were hastening from the village, plows paused mid-furrow in the fields. Now Langsword and his retinue were returning through the town, knights in mail on armored horses, pennants of red and gold and azure, glint of sun on spears and helmets, all the gay riot of sound and color that marked the height of chivalry. To the right and left, the Earl von Largus. The cheers of the crowd echoed among the turrets, even to the seaward tower, where Lady Gordon waited with her child. Then a look came over the face of the woman, an expression of cold and stately grace, as if she had hidden her deep emotion under a courtly mask. For in the hall below she must be Anne, Countess of Ravenhurst, receiving with gracious welcome her lord, the Earl. An hour passed. The formal welcome was over, and the three sat alone in the great room in the seaward tower. Ever since the holy three made blessed the home in Nazareth, God's benediction has been upon the love of father, mother, and child. They sat on the couch by the window, Langsword and Anne and the child, the baby finding a thousand shining playthings upon his father's armor, and laughing in high glee at the strange distortions of his dimpled face, wrought by every polished curve. The mother spoke, telling the many nothings that the little son had said or done. The father feasted his eyes on the two that were his heaven on this earth. A question gleamed in the eyes of Anne. A hundred times it had almost crossed her lips, but she feared to ask it. And just as often he had seen the look and tried to turn her thoughts away, as if he feared to answer. Langsor was still in full armor. In the court below, the troops sat in their saddles. But surely he had come to stay at least a few short weeks? He had been gone so long. Trembling, she whispered, Were it not better that you lay your armor by? She paused, for he had suddenly raised the child before his face, tossing it till it screamed for the very pleasure of the thrills. Anne could not see her husband's eyes and his words gave no answer to her careful question. The friars will sing Te Deum for my safe return. We shall go there presently. Then came the ride under the ancient oaks. Crimson and brown of autumn arched the bridle path. The woodland's cloth of gold was spread beneath their feet. The lady rode on her lord's right hand. A groom at his left bore the child. They were alone, almost the troop keeping a respectful pace apart. Yet each knight was alert in his saddle, and the question bit at her heart. Like some saint's relic set in a jeweled shrine lay the great old friary, now but a pitiful ruin in the oak wood near Ben Ender. Lengthening years had watched its growth since the day when Fire the Braves made the beginning. Wild marauder though he was, lover of the moonlight uproar and the daring raid, after his conversion, he was prompt to deeds of good as he had been prompt to deeds of ill. Now a full two hundred years he had slept in the shadow of the sanctuary, clad as a humble tertiary of St. Francis, and at every daybreak a mass was said for the repose of the wild Gordon soul. Chief after chief had added to the foundation as his means or piety suggested. Langsor's eye rested on the quaint minster chapel. This was his gift, and he said to his lady, here God is praised, and the poor of Christ are fed. And ever shall be, she responded. The Langsor drew his keen claymore from its scabbard and scanned its blue-gray edge. And ever shall be, if highland steel ring true, he answered. He looked away from her as he spoke, and Anne drew a swift breath that held a hidden sob. 
Langsor had come into power in time to face the dangers which Fire the Braes had feared. The centuries of family feuds had left Scott so bitter against Scott that it was impossible to present a truly united front against any enemy. In past generations, at least in moments of national peril, family quarrels would be forgotten. In the bloody circle of Flodden Field, around the royal standard of James the Fourth, they stood. Border Spears and Perthshire men, Fife and Gordon, Merce and Argyle, feuds forgotten and hearts aflame for Scotland, while rank by rank they read English bills cut them down. Grim death clutched them man by man, but none faltered and none fled. Yeomen, spearmen, archer, knight, and earl twisted in one mass of dying men, till with a crash which shakes the soul of Scotland yet, the king charged, and charging fell, his lifeblood flowing on the silken banner of our land, downtrodden on Flodden Field. So were the Scots from before the days of Fire the Braves till James the Fourth, ruining Scotland by their endless petty feuds, yet loving Scotland to the death, while among them, stirring up strife at all times, went traitors paid with foreign gold. Besides this strong spirit of national loyalty, or rather causing it and continually reviving it as the feuds killed it, was the one great source of unity, the church in Scotland. All Scots were still of the one true faith. There are sincere men on all sides of all great controversies, but Henry the Eighth of England stands in history as an infamous, treacherous, and most cruel tyrant. Though victorious at Flodden, his taste of Scottish steel was so bitter that he preferred to conquer by fraud rather than by war. He saw a way to break the one great bond of national unity, the church in Scotland. Constant civil war had left many Scottish lairds poor. The lands of the church, left in comparative peace for centuries, were prosperous. Henry whispered in the ears of these impoverished nobles to enrich themselves by stealing from the house of God. Some took Henry's path to wealth. More would have done so, but they feared the anger of the young king of Scotland, James V. Though of that passionate nature, which has often many sins to answer for, James had that strong faith in God and in eternal truths which makes a man repent and try to atone. James loved his native land and bent every energy to heal the feuds which sapped her life. Justice was the only road to this. Many nobles were but titled and jeweled murderers who lived on spoils. James put these men in order, and they went hot-foot to Henry's side. James would hear no word of robbery, whether of the war impoverished common people or of the house of God. The royal expenses were covered by rearing sheep upon the crown lands. He bade the nobles follow his example, and Langsor was the first to obey. The gentle old friar warden stood by the gate of the friary to welcome Langsword, his lady Anne, and their son Angus Gordon. Behind him, row on row, reaching back to the door of the minster, were the souls beneath his care. Files of scholarly men with saintly faces, lay brothers, rude and simple toilers, but students of the lore St. Francis learned from Sister Earth and Brother Storm and Sunshine, the orphan boys and the sick from the lazaretto. All the eyes of his holy hive returned on Langsor with simple, gentle confidence. In the wild outer world, convents might be destroyed and the work of centuries obliterated, but here beneath the strong, kindly rule of their earl, all must continue to be well. Such was the thought behind the gaze. In the deep currents of his soul, Langsor felt the keen joy of their trust in him, and it was with reverence that he dismounted and came forward to receive the welcome of the fire warden. It is with great gladness that we hail your return, my lord, said the old friar. We have prayed long that God may make you wise in counsel. Only this very fortnight it has been brought home to us that we should give great thanks to God that we are living on Ravenhurst lands and under our good King James. For Friar William and eight of our brethren have fled to us from the ruling convent in Northumberland. A horrid tale, they tell, of theft and murder and sacrilege. They say, but may Christ prevent it that King Henry's men are marching toward our borders and intend war upon Scotland. And King James will meet them on the border. The Earl's voice had in it the clank of steel. It is for this reason that I come to ask your reverence to bless our banners this morning after Holy Mass. Also, I bring presents to you from our Lord, King James, a most beautiful window of fine Flanders glass, and bid you in his name to have the orphans say daily an ave for our success in battle, and for the birth of a royal prince. 
For myself, if I should fall, I ask some small remembrance in your prayers. So Anne learned the answer to her question. Her face expressed neither pain nor fear, but her lips grew deadly white. With reverent pomp, the ceremonial pageant passed. These were days when friars went barefooted and toiled long hours, were coarsely clad and slept on straw. But nothing was too rare, too costly, too magnificent, if it were meant to adorn the temple of Almighty God, or bring before men's minds the daily renewal of Christ's sacrifice on Calvary. To Lady Gordon, crushed in the wine-press of her pain, the music of chant and beauty of symbol spoke of Mary standing by the cross. Silence filled the minster, then sounded the clink of steel as armored knights bent low before the king of kings. Strength stole through the soul of Anne. She made her sacrifice, offered her husband for the cause of Scotland and of God. November's winds made desolation of October's beauty. The Lady Gordon took again her never-ending watch, standing beside the window with her child. Below them the frith tumbled along the gloomy shore, angry, menacing, a solemn white tip on every groveling breaker. The skies dripped with fog, through which the dim bulk of Ben Ender glowered. Many days they had been the centuries of endless waiting. Suddenly she clutched the child. On the shoulder of Ben Ender, where the path should be, a misty something moved through the fog, a long and winding something, faint, far-sounding on the wet air, came the notes of the pibrock wailing. The Gordon's a wa, the Gordon's no more, a lack and a woe for the highlands. The cannon above her boomed, the castle bell clanged with backward stroke, clanged and paused, and clanged again. Anne grasped her child with the fierceness of her agony. She watched. The winding, wailing something had reached the village. Through the mist she saw a broken rank of staggering men, with spears reversed and ensigns trailing, and in their mist a black-draped thing, and they that bore it stumbled as they came. The voice of the village rose to her, tumultuous agony, high-sounding, wild, Clan Gordon in despair. The countess turned from the window. There was a fearful quiet in her face, an awful silence surrounding her. An esquire advanced, bowed, and lifted the child. Softly he followed the lady out of the room and down the stairs, till she stood at the head of the great hall. Around the outer edge of the room the garrison and the inmates of the castle ranged themselves quietly, as if they dared not intrude themselves upon her grief. The harsh jangling of the drawbridge chains grated on her ears. Then the rattle of bolts on the outer doors, the heavy tramp of buckskin feet, and through the arch at the lower end of the hall came that woeful company. The pibrock was hushed. In silence the bearers marched up to the feet of the lady. There they laid down their burden and drew back the beer cloth. Langsword lay under the eyes of Anne, a bruised and sallow face beneath a broken visor. A groan passed over the assembled clan like a winter wind through the oaks of Ben Ender, but the lady made no sound. Then Tam, the armorer, addressed the countess. Flodden field was lost, and every orphan baron was proud to say, My father fell at Flodden. Solway moss is lost, and every Scot shall hang his head for evermore, for Scottish lairds were I traitors. May the word burn my lips that I say it. Scottish lairds, with honor bought and paid for with English shillings, chief of highlands and lowlands, south stepping at home at the first charge of the southerns. The yeomen, ah, weel for the yeomen that did not flee, but where were the leaders? Back stepped the lads to get fighting room, and bogged doon in the morass, helpless. The southerners butchered them like pork at a farin. East water was a choking with blood and with bodies. The English came swarming o'er the mill dam. Clan Gordon had not faltered yet, though all round us were the tumult o' yon traitor's flight. Then rose the cry, bang swords down. With a laird, I saw him my ain cell. He wrenches him free from his dying horse, plucketh out the arrow from his ain wound, catches the bridle o' a riderless beast, and drags himself to the saddle, yelling, Who said that Langsword is down? I'll split the cow with my claymore. Rowley, God for King James, forward! A Gordon, a Gordon! Then, lady, the laird went down, six English bills piercing his body. 
I leaned o'er him as he writhed on the blood-sodden clay, and heard the gasp of his death word. Tell her, the lad said, bid my son Angus be a man, God's mercy on my soul. And worse yet must I tell ye, lady, Scotland is down, the church of God is down, for James, bonny King James, laid him out and died after the battle. And worse and worse I must tell ye, the heir o' the throne is born, the curse o' God, it be upon us, the royal bairn is a maid child, named Mary. The armorer ceased, and a groan passed over the clansmen. Well did they know the woes of a civil war that would be during the long minority of a queen. Then Anne of Gordon spoke. Somewhere in her deep soul she had hidden her widowed heart. Her voice rang like a bugle call. No cause is lost while true hearts live. We have a queen. Long live Mary, queen of all true Scots. Ye have a chief. Step forward, Angus, Langsword's son. The child, dimly conscious that great things were being done, stood out before them. His grave, baby eyes traversed each rugged face, then fixed themselves upon his mother. Angus Gordon, lay your hand on the heart of your dead father. The child obeyed. Slowly, word by word, as they fell from his mother's lips, he repeated, I, Angus, Lord Gordon, Earl of Ravenhurst, do vow allegiance to Mary, Queen of Scotland. I swear to defend my lawful liege lady in God's holy church from all their enemies, even at the cost of my life. The lisping words died out over the silence of the hall. Then sounded the command of Anne of Gordon. Let each man do obeisance to the earl. One by one the war-scarred clansmen knelt before their chief, and his baby hand was wet with warrior's tears. Short rang the lady's order. Each man to his post. We have a queen, we have an earl. Castle Ravenhurst never shall surrender. End of chapter 11 Last Stand of the Old Earl Angus Gordon rode in the teeth of the March wind. Full seventy winters had whitened Langsword's son. Yet, like the oaks of Bent Ender, he stood snow-crowned and strong. Seventy years of storm, civil war and chaos, famine and plague. Scotland had scarcely known a shrove tide peace in all that time, and Clan Gordon had been in the thick of every fray. Sir Angus had kept the pledge his infant lips had made, there in the feudal hall among his warriors, with his hand on his dead father's heart. He had been true to Mary, Queen of Scots, through the wars that raged around her cradle, the tumult of her reign, the years of her captivity, true till she ended her peerless life on the scaffold, a martyr in fact, if not in name. Now it was her son that reigned, sixth James of the old Stuart line, a man like and yet unlike the kings that had gone before him. He had the same high and headstrong pride, the terrible and untamed passions of that race, but into his life the gentle influence of the faith had never come. He was greater and yet less great than they. His scepter swayed two kingdoms, but to gain the English crown he made allies of those who murdered his own mother. Between the two nations there was peace, after centuries of conflict, peace on the old border, in the debatable land, in the rebellious highlands, such peace as the conquered know under the tyrant's steel-shod foot. When James crushed the highlands, he thought it hardly worth his time to drive the old Earl of Ravenhurst into exile. He had one foot in the grave as matters stood. Why spend powder and ball taking that strong fortress, which in time must fall into the royal hands like a ripe apple? His majesty contented himself with confiscating land after land till the old earl had but the empty title of greatness left to him. Lord of massive buttresses and stately halls wherein dwelt poverty, almost starvation, chief of a clan but clanless. This was the plan of that most gracious sovereign, James the Sixth of Scotland, James the First of England, but leaders will be followed. As the lowlands have ever brought forth riches, so have the highlands given the world men. The clan had pledged itself to Angus Gordon. They who made that vow had long been the food of ravens. But the sons and grandsons of those men were clan Gordon, and they knew no thought but loyalty. In the wild fastness of Ben Ender's glens they lived, rugged as the thunder-splintered crags of that mountain, and as true. So the earl rode in the teeth of the march wind. He rode a-hunting. Not that the weary old man loved the sport, 
but the orphans wandering in the ancient halls were many, and, tired of salt fish, they were begging for meat. The men were at work in the barren fields, so Sir Angus saddled his own war-horse and went a-hunting on that bleak March day. The old earl was returning toward evening with a deer across his saddle when he thought he heard a moan. It was very low, but he was so sure that he had heard the cry of a being in distress that he searched the bushes for some time. Finding nothing, he was about to proceed upon his way, but he could not bring himself to do so and searched again. At last he saw a man lying in the shadow of a log and hurried to him. Mother of mercy, can this be you, Fire Walter of Onowick? he cried. Your ears are sharp, my lord, answered the friar with a faint smile, and it is a kind heart that makes him so. But go, most noble sir, you know that I am outlawed. The king's men have done worse than outlaw you. It is on the rack you have been. Go, my lord, you must not be seen speaking to me. Do you think I will leave you here? You are not the first outlaw that has found refuge at Ravenhurst. It is in my mind that you have been racked for not telling that holy mass is offered in my castle. It is for sparing me that you have suffered. Let it pass, Sir Angus. Leave me here. You are risking your life uselessly. All will be over by sunrise, and heaven is as near here as elsewhere. For yourself you never think, but remember that the clan and the orphans are depending upon you. Father, to Ravenhurst you go, whether you will or not. Had I the strength of other days, I would carry you. That I cannot do now, but there are those who can. He raised his battered bugle to those kind old lips, and the sweet notes rang out, A rescue, a rescue! Fitting notes, in truth, for the last call ever blown upon the war horn of that veteran in the cause of God. Some workmen in the fields came in answer to the bugle. They made a rough litter of boughs, and spreading their plaids upon it, carried the friar to the castle. For days the good priest lay between life and death. Sir Angus would not leave his side. At last he was better. He could walk about, but the racked arms were still so sore that it went to the heart to hear him moan when the bandages were changed. The old earl took a trusty lad, the grandson of Tam the armorer, called Muckljano the Cluth, and sent him to find a friendly sea captain who would take the friar to France. Not that the priest intended to give up the Scottish mission. He was to return when strong again. Before going, Friar Walter determined to stay mass so that the faithful might receive their Easter communion. He could not move his arms, but he asked Sir Angus to stand behind him and move them for him. Ah, oh, father, remonstrated the old earl, how can you bear the pain of that? Do you fear for the blessed sacrament, Sir Angus? The priest said quietly, I can control my fingers fairly well now, and I think I have strength enough not to faint. Remember, we can count upon the assistance of God, for this Mass is necessary to fulfill His law. It may be a year before I can return, perhaps longer. The faithful must receive Holy Communion at Easter time, and there is no other way. Mass was said in the great chamber of the Seaward Tower. The fireplace in this room served more purposes than one in those wild days. The man's could be drawn out twice its width, and lowered so as to form an altar. Within the carven figures were hidden the sacred vessels of the sacrifice. Behind the mantle was a hole large enough to conceal a man. In truth, a cunning piece of Flemish wood carving was the fireplace in the great room of the Seaward Tower. All could be hidden in the space of an eye's twinkling, sacred vessels, holy vestments, even the priest himself. But the best laid plans sometimes fail. Judas was one of the twelve, and Bertrand was the earl's most trusted servant. He owed his very life to Sir Angus, a starving, hound-tracked outlaw. He had fled to Ravenhurst, and, as with all in sorrow and need, the old earl had been a father to him. But the master washed the feet of Judas, and that same night was betrayed by him. Christ's nearest followers have ever found the same fate. Sir Angus sent Bertrand to tell the outlaw Catholics that Mass was to be said at Ravenhurst on Easter Sunday. Bertrand did that, in truth, and then ran post-haste to Russell to tell him the same. The clink of gold was more to him than gratitude or honor, friend or God. It was three o'clock on Easter Sunday morning, 
The great room was nearly filled with the folk kneeling about on the floor. In the corner knelt four children. They were dear to the old earl. James and Roger were his grandsons. The other two, Stephen and Margaret, were orphans of the Douglas line, and to them Sir Roger had been more than a father. It was to be the children's first communion day, and the old warrior had prepared them well for the coming of the King of Kings. But the little ones could not say their prayers. They were watching the face of the priest. It was so thin and white, yet wonderfully beautiful. The lines about the mouth drew in so sharply when Sir Angus moved his arms this way and that. They could see the drops of cold sweat shining in the candlelight. His voice, as he said the old, old prayers, had a strange sweetness in them that sank deep into their hearts. Then sounded the little bell that warns of the coming of the Lord. Again the silence, the silver bell's low music once more, the sacred host raised high in those thin, white hands, the sweet toned bell through the stillness, the golden chalice with the precious blood, the Lord blessing them as they adored. There was a clank of armor in the outer hall. The door swung open. Something flashed from the doorway through the candlelight and struck Fire Walter in the side. He lowered the chalice, set it gently upon the altar, and sagged against the old earl. Sir Angus clutched the stricken priest. Bertrand had warned the king's men. Bertrand had passed a rope to them over the wall. Bertrand, the trusted servant, the one left on guard. The soldiers were everywhere. Men and women fled helter-skelter through a side door, while the four frightened children crawled back under the old earl's great bed and lay still. By and by came a silence, and they ventured to peep from the hiding place. Some twenty troopers were standing at the end of the room with drawn swords. They stood as if waiting in order, and the captain was slow to give it. Twenty-three in number, but they were in downright terror of the lang sword in the earl's right hand. Friar Walter lay across the hearth. He was dead. On the altar the chalice gleamed in the candlelight. Beside it lay the sacred host. Just in front of his god stood the brave old earl. It was a strange sight, the white-haired warrior in the surplus of an alkalite, the light of battle in the old blue eyes, and clenched in his right hand the lang sword that had named his father, that had been the ancestral blade of the knights of Rock Raven since the days of Fire the Braes. By his side was the young lad who had served the priest at Mass, Muckle John, grandson of Tam the armorer. In his hand he held the dirk that had pierced the heart of the priest. Twenty-three against two, and it was the twenty-three that were afraid. The Earl's swordsmanship was a toast in two countries. The officer took a step forward. One could see he had little liking for his work. Captain John Brent, said Sir Angus slowly, I was your godfather in baptism. By the vows I took that day, I tell you that you have committed a grievous sin this day. The punishments of God Almighty are terrible. My order, sir, growled the officer. A soldier must obey orders. And since when do the orders of a king make it lawful to break the laws of the king of kings? There was a struggle in Brent's face. He was too good a man for such a trade. Come, he growled. Let's go. We have done enough of the devil's work for one day. The men seemed only too willing to obey. They had no wish to match swords with the great Sir Angus Gordon. But Bertrand sprang forward. You white-livered cowards, he roared. Twenty seasoned veterans against one old fool in a fisherman's gilly. A thousand pounds reward for the priest's body. The rubies on that chalice are worth rattling guineas. Here you stand like whip curs and fear of the lang sword. Don't you know the old cutthroat has reached his doddering days? If fight you will, fight I will, shouted Brent. But I draw for the other side. Perhaps God may forgive me the sins of this night. He will forgive you, said Sir Angus. The captain sprang forward, but paused and dropped on his knees as he passed the altar. He looked at the Blessed Sacrament, one sorrowful, pleading look. Then he took his place. Two troopers tried to follow him. "'Down with the turncoats!' cried Bertrand. Half a dozen swords pierced them before they could take another step. Something struck the altar. One candle went out. 
The blue light of the laying sword shot in quick flashes through the semi-darkness. There were curses and wild cries. Swords clanged as they struck each other. Brent's down, whispered Trent's voice. Finish him. That's a clean stroke. Now back and rest a bit. There's only the old fool left. The troopers drew off a few steps. Sir Angus stood in a pile of dead. Brent and young Muckle John were among them. The old earl was straight still, but there was a wound above his temple, and the blood trickled over his thin, white hair. The good right arm hung limp by his side. The langsler was clenched in his left. Age was beginning to tell, for his breath came in quick, short gasps. Then Stephen grasped his sister's hand. Hist, Margie, he sobbed. Look at the altar. Some sword had struck the chalice. It was lying on its side. The precious blood was dripping drop after drop from the cloth down to the hearth and mingling with the blood of the martyred priest. Bertrand's voice snarled again. Once more, and the job is done. Up, lads. The lang sword flashed. A trooper went staggering back toward the wall. Another fell with a wild curse across that dark pile at the earl's feet. Then Bertrand's sword caught the old man's wrist. The lang sword sprang high in the air. Sir Angus was down. They were dragging him along the floor. Others had the body of Friar Walter. Then the old earl saw the chalice, the overturned chalice, the precious blood, and Bertrand, reaching one greedy hand for the chalice with the gems that were worth rattling guineas. The chief's voice rang as in the battle days. Bertrand, have a care. You have spilt the blood of man this night, brave Johns and Brents, and the blood of a holy priest of God. But have a care, Bertrand. If you touch that chalice, the blood on your hands will be the blood of God. The traitor turned as if to answer, but a trooper broke in. Come on, let it alone. There'll be bad luck with the chalice along. There always is. We had plenty of it the day. Five are living out of twenty, and all of us wounded. It would be not a lady's job to get the dead one and the live one up to Castle Russell, and the old Earl jail before sun-up. Matt and Dave cannot help at all. Bertrand snarled, but he followed them, muttering under his breath. I can see to that later. They're worth guineas, rattling guineas. Guardians of the King The struggle was over. The children were alone. Trembling, they crept from their hiding place, sobbing, clinging to one another in their fear. The terror of the battle was still upon them, the horror of the sacrilege before their eyes. "'We must not leave the altar so,' whispered Stephen, stepping forward. "'No, Stephen, no,' James drew him back. "'We daren't. It is only for priests to touch holy things.' "'But there isn't any priest here now, for our Walter was the only one we ever saw.' "'There must be one somewhere. I'll go.' I'll never stop till I find a priest. The fear is taking your wits, Jamie. Can you go miles and minutes? We must do something now. Let me be. Stop holding me back. It's you that have lost your wits. We must not, Stephen. You know it is a sin to touch holy things. At times like this we can, when there isn't any priest. No, Stephen, not at any time. Don't pull away. It'll be a sin on you, Stephen. But, Jamie, Friar Walter said so. He said so? Yes, he said so. I heard him, I tell you, and Sir Angus said it, too. Well, if you have Father's word for it. The two boys took a step forward. Don't go, whined Roger. Aren't you afraid to pass those? He pointed to the dead. Stay where you are, blazed James. Stay where you are. Margaret will take care of you. Roger followed for a step or two. He was afraid to go and afraid to stay. The other two had picked their way over the dead and now knelt before the fireplace. Oh, Stephen, cried Jamie again. Do you know that you are sure that you heard him right? But I did hear him right. Well, what did he say for us to do? Oh, that's what I don't know. 
We must do whatever should be done, but I don't know what should be done. Stephen looked with trembling reverence on the sacred host lying there so white and still. Oh, Lord, he prayed, don't you see how it is? We don't know what we ought to do, and we must do something. We cannot leave you like this. Please forgive us if we make mistakes, and forgive us our sins, so that we shall not be too bad to touch your sacred body in most precious blood. From that moment both boys lost their fear, and knew that the good Lord would reward with his eternal gratitude whatever poor, little, clumsy service they might render him, now lying as if helpless, as if needing their care. Stephen took a clean finger towel and raised the chalice with it. Then he cut out from the altar cloth the linen stained by the precious blood, and laid it gently in the chalice. With a little linen, James absorbed the pulp upon the hearth. He passed the cloth to Stephen, who placed it in the chalice. Then he lifted the paten, slipped it under the sacred host, and placed it over the chalice, covering all with the corporal and a piece of linen cut from the altar cloth. James laid a piece of clean linen upon the hearthstone, and over it a shield. That was the only thing at hand. The lads turned from the altar. The dead lay all about them in the cold, gray light of the dawn. "'We must get these bodies out of here,' whispered Stephen. "'Things ought to be tidy. This room is the same as a church now.' The bodies lay as they had fallen about the old earl's feet a tumbled, ghastly pile, with a great trooper's face upward on top. The look on his brutal mouth made them shiver and turn their eyes away. There was another face just below. It was peaceful, almost beautiful. That is Captain Brent, whispered James. I wonder whether God forgave him. Oh, surely. He was sorry right away, and he died defending the Blessed Sacrament. Maybe he's looking at us from heaven this minute. But that other one, is he suffering for his sin right now? Didn't get much by sinning, did he? Thought he'd have a lot of money, and instead got a slash from the lang sword. Say, we shouldn't be talking. We're forgetting this is a church in here. What's that? Nothing but a board creaking. There it is again. On the stair. It's a step. Maybe it's Bertrand. He said he'd come back for the chalice. There it is again. Quick, how do you open that place back of the fireplace? That won't do. Bertrand knows the hiding place better than we do. Here, hand it to me. Wrap the linen tightly. The soot will get in. Stephen had stepped into the fireplace and was clambering at the chimney on the rough stones. James passed the chalice to him, then ran back to where Roger and Margaret were standing. They crawled into their old hiding place under the bed and huddled close their eyes fixed on the door. A board creaked in the hall. The children scarcely breathed. The door swung open silently. Bertrand crept in. Gone, he snarled. Gone, as I am a living man. No wonder they were for leaving it for luck. Came after it themselves. No, they couldn't have beaten me. They had to take the old fool down to the dungeon. There must have been someone left in the house. He slipped back into the hall. Under the bed, the tense little muscles relaxed a moment. But the next instant, Bertrand was gliding back through the door. He seemed intent on beginning his search with the secret places of the great fireplace. "'Oh, let me get behind you,' whimpered Roger. "'You are bigger.' He tried to call over Margaret, but his foot slipped. There was a scraping sound. "'What's that?' Bertrand was beside the bed in a moment. He caught James by the foot and drew him out. Where is that chalice? He snarled. Don't deny that you know. I'm not denying it. Where is it, then? Do you think I'm going to tell you? Bertrand gave him a cuff. Might as well argue with a mule. There's no time to lose. Who else is underneath? He stooped down to look. Margaret? Not much better. Stubborn piece of baggage. Roger, come out here, you. Bertrand reached in and caught the little coward by his long curls. Ouch! Oh! He squalled, but the man drew him along without mercy. Where did you put that chalice? I didn't touch it. I, I, I didn't do anything. Ouch! Oh, 
Don't! I say I didn't. I even told them not to. Who? Oh, Steve, began Roger. You dare say a word, you little coward. Is there no drop of Gordon blood in you? Were you changed in the cradle for a swine driver's child? A traitor's no brother of mine, blazed James. Let the baby alone, Bertrand. He had nothing to do with it. If you want to take spite out on anyone, take it out on me. I'll give you enough before I go, enough to spare, you mule head. Bertrand gave Roger's curls a savage twist. Answer me, booby. Who took the chalice? Oh, please let me go, wailed the child, looking from Bertrand to his brother and back again. The poor little weakling did not know whom he feared more. Oh, don't! You hurt so! Where is it? They'll tell mother on me if I do say who. Your mother is in prison. Small harm or help can she be to you. Oh, please stop, Bertrand. I'll give you fine things when I grow up if you do. The servant laughed derisively. Fine gifts of a young laird landless, he mocked, still twisting the child's hair with savage cruelty. It was too much. Pain had triumphed. Oh, don't. Stee, Stephen, he, he's up the chimney with it. Bertrand dropped the sobbing boy and ran over to the fireplace. He looked up into the black hole. A foot scraped, a cloud of soot fell. He sprang back in time to miss it. So that's your game, my lad. Suit works two ways, boy. Better come down before the fire is lit. No answer from Stephen save another gift of soot. There's kindling in the hall. Get it, Roger. The sobbing boy turned to obey. You just dare, yelled James, springing at him. But Bertrand caught the elder boy by the collar. Do as I bid you, Roger. I'll tend to this meddling brother of yours and settle him. Then he rained kicks and cuffs on James until Roger returned with the wood. Take that for the stubborn mule that you are and always will be. Bertrand snarled, striking a blow that sent the boy spinning across the room. James struck his head against the stone wall, but he was on his feet in a moment. Come on, Margaret, he called. We've got to keep him from starting that fire. It'll kill Stephen. He'll never give up. Blood was streaming from the boy's temple, but the pain only roused his spirit to madness. The two children sprang upon Bertrand. James caught him by one hand and Margaret by the other. The boy made a battering ram of his head while he kicked with all his might. It was little so small a girl could do. Her teeth were sharp, and she used them. Between the two, they held the servant for a time. If Roger had helped, they might have overcome him. But he was no help at all. Roger, cried Bertrand with a foul oath, light that fire. If you do, yelled Jamie. The poor weakling stood sobbing. The fighting midgets seemed to be holding the man. So Roger obeyed his brother, though he grew white at Bertrand's muttered threats. The strength of the children began to fail. Bertrand caught Margaret's hand. Then he caught Jamie's. He tied the wrists together with a cord, wrapped many times around, and swung them up over the high carven back of the bed. There they hung on agonizing muscles, for the little girl's feet could not touch the cushions, and the boy was dangling down the smooth back. James made matters worse for his small comrade without realizing the fact. Being much the heavier, he had dragged her wrist over to his side of the top, and the weight was on her tender flesh. Roger fared little better than they. Bertrand now beat him for failing to obey him. Then they lit the fire. Oh, pray, Margie, pray, sobbed Jamie. Stephen will die. He'll never give up. Oh, he'll die. There was a scraping in the chimney. Poor Stephen was trying to climb from the flames. Get a little water, Roger, sneered the brute. Smoke will reach him anywhere. The scraping within the chimney seemed still in the same place, and Bertrand laughed. Put the water down. We do not need it yet. He cannot climb. Let him stick there and roast a while. Again a frantic scratching in another place and higher up. Then silence in the chimney. He is out of reach of the fire, 
said Bertrand. Pass the water pail to me, Roger. That's a good boy. We'll give him a smoking. Bertrand dashed water on the fire. Smoke rose in a white cloud. No more sound came from the chimney. Suddenly Roger screamed. The trooper on top of the dark pile of slain was moving. There was no doubting it. Broad daylight had come now. He was slowly rising. He could not be living. No man alive ever has such a gash across the throat. But moving he was. His head rolled this way and that. His arms rose and fell again. Bertrand's face whitened with terror. The trooper raised his head till the staring eyes were full upon him. Then the head nodded and dropped back. Bertrand waited for no more. The children heard his swift steps echoing through the vacant halls below. Then silence. James was the first to come to his senses. It's not the trooper at all. It's Muckle John down underneath, moving him. Come out and cut us down. Aren't you hurt? I cannot get out, replied the young sailor. I cannot lift the body. Then with a bit of a chuckle, but I lifted him so as to give the laugh to yon Bertrand. Here, Roger, help us down, called James. You won't hurt me. Promise you won't. No, you booby. I wouldn't dirty my hands by touching you. Hurry, you poor little sneak. Stephen can't get out of the chimney, and you know it. Maybe the smoke has killed him. Roger freed his brother and Margaret as swiftly as possible, probably hoping to curry favor and save later trouble. James sprang toward the fireplace as soon as his feet touched the floor. Margaret, you roll the trooper off John, can you? I'll help Stephen. He called over his shoulder as he raked the smoking embers from the hearth out on the stone floor. Throw water on them, Roger. You can do that much, maybe. Hurry, the smoke is mean. Laying a shield upon the hot hearth, James stepped into the fireplace. Slip down, Stephen. I'll catch you, he called. There was no answer. James looked up into the black hole. Give me a stool, he called. Stephen must have fainted. Be careful. Don't set your dress afire. Thank you, Margaret. There, hold it steady. James had climbed on the stool and was standing with his head in the chimney, trying to loosen Stephen's body. Catch him, Margaret. He's slipping. Easy. The chalice. Be careful. I have it. Steady. Hold Stephen. There, you have him. Take him out on the floor, can you? That's it. Roger, help, will you? Lift him past the coals. Roger and Margaret managed to lift Stephen over the smoking embers while James was climbing from the stool, holding the chalice reverently. The cloth was still in place. Not a speck had touched the sacred trust. Stephen had guarded his lord at a bitter cost to himself. He lay where his sister had placed him, his eyes, nose, and mouth filled with soot. The young gentleman's done for, my lord, groaned Muckle John, dragging himself up on one elbow. He'd be choking or gasping if there was a breath o' life in him. No, no, cried James. Drown folk are limp like that when they're not dead yet. You fishermen work their shoulders some way. Tell me how. Turn and face doon. Na, na. Do not let his face bang the floor. If I could but help ye, we. John strove to drag himself up and fell back among the dead. I'm near done for my own cell. Hold him up a bit. Work his shoulders. Na, na. More roundabout like. They be no pump handles. Ah, if I could get the lead out of me and help ye a wee. You're doing better, but no right yet. James worked desperately. Still there was no sign of life. Margaret had her brother's burned feet in her lap, sobbing over them, trying to loosen the stockings without breaking the blisters. If he would only cough or something, wailed James, weary with his struggle, or if I had sense to do what you tell me, Muckle John. Suddenly, dropping his friend, the boy turned toward the altar. Oh, Lord, he cried. Stephen was hurt taking care of you. John can't do anything. We haven't mother or nurse or anybody. Won't you help us? The trustful prayer of a child is an arrow that pierces the heart of God. Stephen moaned faintly and twisted. 
Then came a sudden coughing, which seemed to tear his little lungs asunder, and he spat out quantities of soot. For an hour or more he lay in his friend's arms, racked by the maddening cough and faint from exhaustion. His eyes were dazed, but slowly they cleared, and he staggered up, saying, Who put that dirty rag over the blessed sacrament? He stumbled over to the altar. Oh, yes, the soot from the chimney. He lifted the cloth reverently, and taking the cleanest bit of linen left, laid it over the chalice. Excitement seemed to have made the child unconscious of his burns, but now that the sacred trust was safe, his face grew sick with pain, and he sat down on the floor, rocking himself back and forth in his misery. Suddenly, Muckle John raised his head and whispered, What be that? I heard it twice afore, a step in the lower hall. Stephen staggered up on his burned feet. Not even the fear of more pain could daunt his soul. He was on the point of climbing back to his post in the chimney, but Muckle John whispered, No, so quick, my lords, tis not Bertrand's step. "'Tis light, more like a lassie's. "'Sounds like nurse.' "'James dashed into the hall, and they heard his joyous shout. "'Oh, Benson!' "'The maid was in the room in a moment, "'a simple, homely country lass, "'but the angel Gabriel could scarcely have been more welcome than Benson. "'A babel of tongues greeted her. "'The tale was told in a child's jumble. "'But whatever of horror the sight of death and sacrilege "'might have made her suffer— she spoke cheerily, and her calmness quieted their fears. Poor John, I hope the cut is no so deep as you say. Never mind, we'll fix it. Bless us, what a wrist, my little lady. And such a brave woman she is. Hasn't cried at all. And Stephen, ah, oh, those burns, laddie. But it's the spirit of a Douglas your lordship is showing. Sir Angus will be that proud of his bairns. But you and your sister must suffer in patience. John has lost ever much blood. He is most in need. I must care for him first, dears. Benson's deaf fingers had kept pace with her words. She had found linen and torn it into bandages, and now she addressed James and Roger. Your young lordships are unhurt. Will you please bring me the salves from the buttery, a pan of water also, warm if there be any? Then these bodies must be removed. Such things can lie before the blessed sacrament. By the time you are back, I'll have poor John that I dare move him. Whilst well, I'm caring for the hurt, your lordships make this room fit for him that's abiding in it. But Roger drew himself up with much dignity for so small a person. Benson, he stormed, do you forget your place? To whom are you speaking? Those are servants' duties. The honor due to your noble blood did not trouble you over much whilst you were playing servant to yon Bertrand. My lord, your mother, Lady Isabel, bade me take charge of all things during this black time, while she lies in prison, and I am to be punishing of you, Master Roger, whenever you stand in need of the same. Well, she knew the other three would no be given trouble in such a day of sorrow. They knew what is become an O noble blood, and their honor has no the queer quirks in it that yours has, Lord Roger Gordon. Roger was white with anger. But one glance from his irate brother made him cringe, and peace reigned under the government of Nurse Benson. At noon, James leaned over the chair where Margaret was dozing. Come, my brave comrade at arms, he said, half tenderly, half in mischief remembrance of the minutes that they had hung upon the high carven top of the bed. Together they passed down the hall. The door of the Earl's room was ajar, and they tiptoed in. It was the most beautiful place the little girl had ever seen. Benson had not left a spot anywhere. Evergreens had been brought up from the castle yard. The chalice draped in white linen stood between rows of shining candles. And there at the good God's feet were many new-blown violets smiling up at him, simple, beautiful, like the faces of loving children. Stephen was in prayer. The lines of pain were still upon his face but over it there was the look unspeakably holy, the light of the joy that shines on those who have suffered for the Lord our God. Glory of the Bitter End Days dragged themselves into weeks and months. One by one the clansmen and the household came back from prison, or from their hiding places. 
Life went on almost as before, save for the constant worry over the old Earl and the Lady Isabel, the mother of James and Roger. At last, in May, a carriage swung round the shoulder of Ben Ender, on the old road from the outer world, to the little world sheltered behind the rampart of the mountain. A bit of white fluttered from the window. It is mother! Oh, I know it is! cried James. Then the castle bell pealed joyously. Down to the great gate ran the three children. The old keeper's hand trembled so for very gladness that he could scarcely let down the drawbridge. At last down it came with a jolt and a clang, and the carriage rolled in. James had the door open before the footman could reach it. Oh, mother, how well you look, he cried as he helped her down. I never saw your cheeks so red. God bless you, my son, she whispered as her hot lips touched his forehead. Where is Roger? Ah, oh, my dear little ones of Douglas. She stooped to kiss Margaret and Stephen, but turned away coughing, and they knew that she was in pain. Come inside, mother, said Jamie anxiously. The wind is blowing. You have a cold, haven't you? Yes, dear, she said with strange gentleness. Jamie kept close beside her all afternoon. He was troubled. He had a fire lighted in the grate, although it was a warm day, and brought a little shawl to put about her shoulders. At last Lady Isabel sent them all out while she spoke with the steward. Then James went straight to Benson. "'Mother is sick,' he said. "'I mean, she's very sick, isn't she?' The good nurse turned away. There were tears in her kind eyes. The damp of the dungeon. Oh, I knew it, my lambs, I knew it. Can she ever get well? I think she'd be nigh the gates that made o' pearl. But play the man, my little dear Jamie. The more cheery we keep her, the longer she'll bide with us. Before the last June roses were in bloom in the castle yard, James and Roger were motherless. News came now and then from Sir Angus. In one of Lord Russell's dungeon cells he was awaiting his trial. At last the House of Lords sat upon the case. They found him guilty. Of what? All his life the Earl of Ravenhurst had been a traitor. That was why his lands had been given to the loyal Henry of Russell. It was but owing to the extreme clemency of His Majesty, King James, that Sir Angus had not been beheaded long before. Now his most treasonable conduct had become more than the patience of so mild a monarch could endure. He had harbored, aye, harbored with direct will to displease the king, knowingly and with full consent within his own castle, had harbored an outlaw and a cursed Catholic friar. He had permitted, nay, ordered to be celebrated, the foul and abominable sacrifice of the mass. He had drawn the sword against the king's dragoons, and had slain twelve of them with his own hand. No one spoke of the honor due the twelve bold warriors, that let one old man lay them around his feet, like sproutings clipped from a hedgerow. In truth, the Earl of Ravenhurst was guilty of death. He deserved to be drawn and quartered like a common villain. But, in consideration of his great age, and the loyal deeds of his father, Thangsword, King James would be satisfied that he be merely beheaded the sentence to be executed upon the popish feast of Our Lady in Harvest. Sir Edward Gordon, an old knight, whom the Lady Isabel had appointed the guardian of the four noble orphans, said that they should go to see the execution. Others said no, such sights were not for children. They were too young, and would never be able to forget the awful spectacle. Forget it? No, cried Sir Edward. I want them never to forget it. They are the children of martyrs. They must stand for the faith, though it cost them their lives. Ay, sirs, let them see a martyr win the palm. Let them see and never forget it. The stern Scot had his way. The four children rode with him. On the way he spoke to them of the glory of dying for God and for native land. Roger listened eagerly. He seemed to think some great honor would be shown him as a martyr's kinsman. A base nature cannot understand the kind of glory of which Sir Edward spoke. 
As they drew near the throng that gathers at such a time, a man turned his head and nudged his companion. The other laughed. Yes, I see. Ravenhurst Crest. The traitor's family, no doubt. Not so much as one retainer with them. They are in beggarly poverty, you know. Aye, and so it should be. The speaker was the mighty, broad-shouldered Scot of the Covenant. Root and branch, out with all idolaters, he shouted. Now, my father, boasted the first speaker, he was always telling us about the doings of his grandfather that was at the burning o' the convent i the wood. Ay, that was the Luton worth going to. The Catholic had nothing now, but in those days they were grand and fine, silver and rubies, silks and cloth o' gold, a pile like a haycock. That was for the great folk, Laird Russell, the fine gentleman, and Queen Bess down in England, and all that. But the poor common soldier did not come off with nothing. My grandfather had the smashing o' the big windows with the virgin on it. Twas give to the lazy friars by King James that slang dead. A barrel full o' fine lead my grandfather got oot o' that same. But tis not good sighting the hounds on Catholics now. They all be as poor as field mice in famine year. Keep still, whispered Sir Edward, noting the flush of anger that rose on the faces of the children. We are the kinsmen of a martyr. We must share his glory with him. Poverty and shame the dear Christ bore. Keep that before your eyes and be brave. Make room, called a brutal voice. Here be the fine Catholic nobles. Give place. Let them see the old fool pass. The crowd opened, and Sir Edward's party pressed close to the roadway down which the Earl must pass. Roger let his horse slip behind his brothers as they moved forward. James saw him crawling from the saddle. "'Where are you going?' he asked. "'I will not be called a traitor's child,' Roger muttered. "'They are pointing at us.' "'You are not ashamed of Grandfather, are you?' whispered James. "'Don't be a coward this time. Words can't hurt when we know they are not true.' But Roger had slipped from his horse and mingled with the crowd. A coarse fellow jostled against James then bowed in mock apology. "'Be throwing your bonnets in the air, lads,' he shouted. "'Mates, this young gentleman will be Earl o' the Raven's Roost before he's now or older.' "'Hold your tongue, bully,' called the great Scot of the Covenant, shouldering his way toward the speaker. "'Leave the poor baron in peace. Sorrow enough he has afore him. But mind ye, lad, let the old Earl's death be a lesson to ye. When ye be top at Ravenhurst,' Give good riddance to Catholics. James flushed. Then suddenly he turned. His child's voice had in it the ring of a man's determination. When I am Earl, I shall take up the battle where my grandfather lays it down. A jeer rose from the crowd. But in the eyes of the Scot there was admiration. And Margaret leaned toward the lad and whispered, her eyes bright with pity and pride. No cause is dead while true hearts live. Quick gratitude shone in Jamie's glance. Ay, little comrade at arms, he said. But the words were not heard by the crowd. A sound floated toward them. Heads were craned and brutal jests broke forth. Then into sight came the prison cart, and standing in it, but of ridicule, sport of the mob, was Angus Gordon. The dungeon had shattered the lang sword son. He could scarcely hold himself erect in the jolting cart, but erect he was, and a soldier still. The old man seemed but the more beautiful for the marks of the dungeon upon him. He was looking straight at the crowd, a joyful smile was on his lips. The noise died. The mighty Scot of the Covenant turned menacingly toward the fellow who seemed to be the leader of the jurors. You can hold your jibing tongue he roared. Na doot, Russell pay ye will to stir up the mob, but chew your cut on this. I'll pay ye with my fists, if ye do. Then, turning to the crowd, he spoke his mind like an honest Scot. Ye all know me. I be no Roman Catholic body. I have fought the abomination to Rome afore, and will again. But, mates, I fight a man's battle. I would not be one o' a pack o' hounds besetting the lone sheep, or one o' a mob o' cowards jeering an old dungeon-broken man. 
there was a change on those wild faces for the will of a mob is the will of the wind sir edward's party moved forward and a whisper went through the throng give place let them pass they are the old earl's kinsmen there was pity in the tone and the crowd followed in silence perhaps thinking over their own wrongs many among them were covenanters they were men who had suffered from the cruelty of the king almost as greatly as had the catholics the cart rattled up to the scaffold as it stopped a dozen hands went out to help the old earl down lord russell who stood on the platform seemed a trifle uneasy he whispered a moment to a knight beside him then came a curt order the soldiers drove the crowd back from the foot of the scaffold a muttering rose from the mob they began to move as if to join a second throng that was coming up the road from the opposite direction another whispered consultation between russell and his aides the action of the covenanters seemed puzzling to them a troop of cavalry was swiftly placed between the two crowds well planned sir henry of russell muttered sir edward that second throng are from the ravenhurst lands they hate their new master as they love the old they had never had the courage to join the outlaws of benender but will they stand tamely and see angus gordon die the knight's eye flashed with quick fire ho oh, my bairns we may save him yet the covenanters are now more for the earl than against him sir edward's trained eye ran over the field then he shook his head six hundred men i take it weapons sticks stones a few swords the other side two hundred horse three hundred foot well armed no my children it would be folly a sheer waste of life we could never reach the scaffold angus gordon stepped out beside the block he raised his hand as if about to speak a hush fell on the mighty throng his voice was faint that voice which in years gone by had rung above the din of battle it was feeble now and low yet piercing sweet like the notes of some far-off bugle sir henry of russell asks what i wish to say in answer to the charge of treason which now stains my knightly honour there are stains that tell of shame and there are stains that speak of glory when they brought the standard back from flodden field there was a stain upon it ay a dark blot upon the fair silken banner from dunedin but that stain was the life-blood of a king that torn and blood-stained banner is a sacred thing ay a sacred thing now the faith of the king who fell on flodden field is called treason against scotland this faith is that stain which lies on my honour as a scottish knight this stain is my glory as it was the glory of those who are no more would i were worthy to fall under the banner of the king of kings worthy of my place in the red-robed army led by stephen thank god for the honour done me and stand for god and our lady till we meet again my lord of russell i thank you for your courtesy sir angus knelt by the block and laid his white head upon it sir henry turned to the headsman but the brawny fellow was sobbing like a child go find a knave that will do your foul work for you he said i'll no have innocent blood on these hands russell's face whitened with anger a sympathetic growl rose from the mob allen said the old earl gently the sin of this lies on the judge not upon the executioner you will be merely doing your duty according to law do not bring trouble on yourself through love of me it may be no sin in the eye of the law queer laws they do be having these days was it your duty according to law to send a cow to my brother's wife they were no your tenants more if the widow and her wee bit bairns were starving what was that to you in the eye of the law but you sent the cow it is little i gave them allen do your work lad i shall bear you no ill will nor will the good god lay this to your charge sir henry is angry he will make you suffer my poor fellow sir you gave the best you had and you gave it with kind words if there be men in yon crowd angus gordon does no die this day i set my foot on the scaffold for that 
I have given my word to all true clansmen that I am not to kill our chief, but to see to it that he is no killed. Ay, ay, hold to it, Alan. There speaks a Gordon. Came from strong, the scattered voices in the throng, for the handful of Ben Ender outlaws was sprinkled through the mob. Striker, rotten my dungeon, hissed Russell. I'll no have a good man's blood on these hands, retorted the headsman. A roaring applause from the Ravenhurst men. Stand your ground, Alan. You are no alone the day. It was the voice of the big covenanter. The Gordon. The first shot was faint and fearful, but it was caught up on the instant. Then the old war cry burst like thunder. The Gordon! Clan Gordon to the rescue! The mob surged madly forward, catching at anything that might serve as a weapon, sticks, stones, clubs, and here and there a sword. Sir Angus rose to his feet and raised his hand. There was silence. Sticks and stones against powder and shot. It is folly, pure folly. You cannot save me. Do you think I shall die easier for knowing that more Gordon wives are widows, more Gordon orphans wail for bread? He knelt again. Let the axe fall, Alan. Tis an easy way to heaven, lad. The clan will suffer for this attempt to save me. Let it fall, Alan, let it fall. Never, cried the headsman. Are you men that you dally so? A maddened roar came up from the people, and an echo, faint, solitary, yet distinct, from somewhere among the soldiers. Quick, or we are lost, whispered the knight at Russell's elbow. The troopers are siding with the mob. Run a sword through that mutineer, howled Russell. A dozen soldiers sprang upon Alan and dragged him from the scaffold. There was a sharp struggle. Alan wrenched himself free and joined the mob, yelling, The Gordon! The Gordon! Gordon forgotten our lady, thundered the mob, as the stones began to fly. Fire on them, rang Russell's command. Do you see that? roared the knight in Sir Henry's ear. Half of them are firing in the air. They let Alan go. Quick, a headsman, or we are lost. Russell's voice rang above the roaring of the mob. A headsman, fifty pounds for a headsman, one hundred, five hundred. A stone struck him. He dodged back under cover. Alan was almost at the scaffold again, his club crashing to right and left among the soldiery. Down with them. Why should we stand for King James? Russell's a lowlander. Scots are we all. It was the big covenanter at Alan's side. The two throngs were one at last. Someone was climbing the ladder. Russell passed him a purse. He clutched it with eager, trembling fingers and sprang to the axe. His face was turned and the sun shone full upon it. The man was Bertrand. A wild cry from the mob. A sudden hush. The steel flashed in the morning light, and the grand old man was with his God. Splinter of the Lang Sword A sound struck on Gordon's ear. His mind reeled between living thought and living fact. Before his mental eye, the mob still surged around the blood-soaked scaffold with the sacred dead. Still Russell snarled, defiant, guarded by his lords. The traitor Bertrand, cringing in his shadow. Still over all hovered the martyr's soul, just catching the breath of heaven's welcoming. Salvos of angel hosts, trumpets of seraphim, hosannas of the mirrored ranks that bear the victor palm. And echoing through the courts of bliss, the voice from the white throne of God. Ave, Martyr Christi. But jarring up from the world of fact came a key that grated in the lock, the dull pain of the chair in which he sat, the familiar things crowding on his sight, and the stunning sense that enemies were near. His own battle horn was blowing. The door creaked as it opened. Sir Roger was there, with Godfrey at his elbow. The tutor drew in his breath with a hiss. Disappointment darkened Sir Roger's face. He had thought to find a lad worn weary with pain, petulantly defiant, but breaking. Gordon's hot words of a few hours ago had shown his self-control to be weakening. Here, strengthened from some unknown source, the boy stood before them. His face was swollen and twisted with pain. 
Yet in his eyes there is no fear, no yielding, no weariness, but a look of joy deeper than the wrongs of earth, sweeter and stronger than human. Godfrey would have slipped out again. Though his soul was too grossly formed to comprehend the boy's exaltation, yet his mind was too cunning to start a battle lost from the beginning. Sir Roger sprang forward. There was that in the boy's look which made his soul writhe along the burning ways of memory. His clenched fist drew back menacingly. The Gordon looked calmly, almost pityingly, on the man's fury. It was as if the boy had suddenly become the elder. He spoke with a half-stern, yet sorrowful kindliness. Roger, Uncle Roger, why are you the only traitor, the only weakling in the house of Gordon? Has Bertrand's son led you to this shame? But you can throw it off even yet, Uncle Roger. Even yet you can be a man and not a traitor. Blows like an avalanche were the weakling's answer. Roger's lean hands were gripped about the boy's throat, throttling him, pounding his head against the sharp moldings of the chair. One more fearful blow, and Gordon plunged forward. The heavy oaken chair had come upon them both. A maddening crash upon his temple, something warm and wet between his cheek and the stone flagging, a creeping dullness. Was this death? Death for God and Our Lady? A scuffling sound came faintly. Godfrey pulled Sir Roger off. He was forcing the frenzied man from the room. The lock grated. Gordon lay still and waited. In a moment he would hear the songs of the angels. His heart went out in a great swell of joy. That soon died away into a terrible dread, and then to a bitter disappointment. The dullness was passing. Death, with its freedom from pain, with its joy beyond all earthly compare, was not there, but pain was. Hours before, Gordon had thought that he had suffered all a boy could bear. Now bruise had been added to bruise. In his head a hundred hammers seemed pounding. Hunger was gnawing, and thirst like a fire burned high over other woes. He was alone in his pain, as his mother had said, pitifully alone. The great exaltation of some minutes before had died, and even God with his beautiful heaven seemed far, very far away. Gordon drew himself up slowly, painfully, on his elbow, and wiped the blood from his temple. Then he crawled to his feet, and stood a bit unsteadily, holding to the overturned chair. Once again he read his mother's note. Whether I am living or dead, my prayer shall plead for you in that hour. At this moment my mother is praying for me, and she herself is suffering below in one of those terrible dungeons. The thought gave him new strength. Slowly straightening himself, as if by so doing, he could the better shoulder his cross. Gordon walked over to the fireplace and looked long and searchingly at the picture above the mantel. Was the martyr Gordon smiling at the lad? It seemed so as he stood there beneath the cross swords, and that square-jawed boy by the earl's knee was looking straight into Gordon's eyes. You held out to the end, and it was the rack, the dungeon, the scaffold. I'm a coward if I give up, and I won't. But you had better pray for me, so I won't ask for water. I'll stand as you stood, for God and Our Lady. The words were brave, but the noble head was bowed on the mantel, the square jaw set, and the brown fist clenched by his side. Then the shining silver spot on the hearthstone caught his eye, and he knelt down beside it. The precious blood fell here long, long ago, the lad whispered. Father Cornwall said it fell on the stones all round where they scourged you. Oh, how it must have hurt. Uncle Roger brought the blood only a few times on me, and you were covered with blood all over. Gordon stooped down and kissed the spot on the hearthstone. A strange, deep joy came trembling through his soul. Escape Evening had come. The wag of the wall agreed with Gordon at last, and chimed its slow-toned Angelus. The shadow of old Ben Ender lengthened across the meadows. From lane and field, the tinkle-clinkle of returning herds floated up to the weary boy. It was evening, but never had so long a twilight followed so long a day, never since the world was made. 
The boy stood by an open casement. The wind blew about him, cool and damp, bearing the mist from the sea on its wings. He opened his lips and drank in deep draughts, vainly hoping the cooling air might do what cooling water could. But the raw wind only made the bruises ache with a more sickening throb. The fiery thirst burned on. Gordon turned and walked back to the fireplace with a restless yet lagging step. Then he stood as he had done a hundred times, fists clenched, head bowed upon the mantel, staring at the silver spot on the hearthstone. Strength came with that appealing look, strength, not joy. Joy had been given once that he might have stout courage to fight this battle. This was a day on earth to win heaven, not heaven come down to earth. Jesus! Faith had grown in the land of pain. The boy seemed looking into those eyes beneath the crown of thorns, filled with blood and dust and tears. Jesus, I am tired. Uncle Roger means what he said. I must stay till I give up, till I die. If it was only die and be done with it, but I shall live for days. I am wearing out, Jesus, and if I slip, oh, I don't want to go back on you, but if I slip, if the thirst gets more than I can stand, you won't let me say those words, Jesus. You won't let me fall. A drop of blood splashed on the silver spot. Gordon started, opened his hand, and looked wonderingly at a nail cut in his palm. Then he stooped to wipe away the blood. As he did so, a thought stirred in his mind, dim, uncertain, an echo from that strange first night. Hadn't his mother said something about flying from the castle? Hadn't she told him to go to someone? Whom? Oh, Muggle John, he remembered it now. She said to go from this room, but how? A secret passage, that was it, and Uncle Roger didn't know about it. It started at this fireplace and ended near the fishing village. Why hadn't he thought of it before? But his going would leave his mother alone. Yet, what good could he do her by staying? Muggle John would help him to save her. Certainly it would be better to go. Gordon drew a chair toward the mantel and climbed on it. The soldier on the right hand and twist the handle of the sword twice. But it won't move. Perhaps it was broken during that changing. The blade went farther down into the handle before. There is the mark. Why won't it slip down? The lad twisted the handle sharply, then pushed the blade downward. It slipped into place with a metallic click. That's it. Now round it goes. One, two... Springing from the chair, he ran to the left side of the fireplace. The panel moved under his fingers, sliding silently into the wall and disclosing a black, cobwebbed hole. Running back again, Gordon pushed the chair into his place, wiped the dusty footprint from the seat, straightened the rug, and looked about him. There is nothing to show them what I have done, so far as I can see. Uncle Roger will spend some time tomorrow guessing how I got away. If I can find this brave John, he will help me get Mother from the dungeon. The lad hurried to the passage and climbed through the opening. His fingers sank in powdery dust. A thousand cobwebs clung to him. Beyond, the hole seemed full, and the must in the air choked him. Gasping, he thrust his head into the room again to draw one more deep breath. Well, it's go. Find John, get Mother, and... Oh, surely... There will be some little stream near the outlet in the forest. That means a drink. I would go through anything for one drop of cold water. Drawing back his head, Gordon slipped the panel over the opening. The last ray of light died. His groping hand touched a bar. As it slid into the socket, he heard the lock click far up in the soldier's extended hand. Gordon felt about in the darkness. The passage was small, scarcely large enough to crawl through, and seemed to run along in the wall. His groping hands found the floor level for some twenty feet, then came a rough stone stairway. Turning around, he crept down backward for a dozen steps, and again the way was level. A sharp turn to the left, and a radiant, fan-shaped light shone far ahead in the darkness. Why, there is the end! It is not so long after all! Gordon hurried forward, but the bright spot was not the end. It was only a small hole in the side wall. There was a faint hum of voices. 
Scarcely daring to breathe, he crawled on till he was within the dancing, moat-filled light. Oh, how small the hole was, not half so large as his own eye. He looked through, then drew back in terror. Not a dozen steps from the wall sat Sir Roger. Surely his uncle must have seen him. No, the hole was too small and too far away for anyone in the room to look through. Gordon laughed softly. It was funny to be able to see so well, and yet to remain unseen. There sat Godfrey by the table, shaking his finger at Sir Roger, as if laying the law down about something. Gordon could not catch the words, but he distinctly heard his uncle's snarling answer. The foolish child will yield in the morning. You are always finding fault. My lord, Gordon has a brain. He will not be twice fooled by any man. Yet there is one way. And that? Tomorrow we shall go to him, you and I. Tell him his courage has won our hearts. We must respect a faith that can make so young a lad so great a hero. Give him full liberty to practice his religion. Privately. Of all the follies, are you mad? Mend the folly, my good Sir Roger. Mend the folly with this. The tutor held up a vial which gleamed red in the candlelight. You mean... Oh, its action is very gentle, my lord, as the warm days come, a paleness, a weakness, just a slight malaria. Yet, in the autumn, all the gentlefolk of the countryside will come to the funeral of this promising boy, and the morning, uncle, well, it will all be very sad. But, of course, the morning, uncle, will be Earl of Ravenhurst. Secret Passages For an hour or more Gordon crawled on. The passage was straight for a time, then it dropped to a lower level and ran on again. Each room had its little spy hole hidden in some carving. As he crept along, the levels became shorter and the stairs longer. He had not found a spying place for a long time. The darkness grew even blacker. He could not see his hand before his face. The stones were cold, so cold and wet. Then came more stairs, and down, down into the blackness he went. It has to sink so low to get under the moat. That must be it. And as he spoke, he splashed into a puddle at the foot of the stairs. Oh, how sweet that water tasted, muddy though it was. He crawled over the mossy stones of the level. Now he must be going under the moat. That was why it was so wet and slimy. The end of the passage could not be far away. At least, not much farther, for he had been crawling such a long time. When once he got outside, what if Uncle Roger did take the castle? They could have a little farm of their own, or a fine fishing boat, like... Gordon's right hand shot into space. He tried to grasp the stones, lost his balance, and fell. Down, 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 into never-ending blackness. Something cold. Water. And down, down, down again. He was rising. One hand shot out, then his head. Gordon drew a quick, deep breath and floated as he had done many a time when some chance slip had plunged him into the old fishing pole beneath the alders while he and Joel were playing in the Maryland woods. Thank God, it is water. I should have broken my neck if it had been stone. Well, the joke is on me. All day long I have been praying for a drop of water. Now the good Lord has given me a drop into it, instead of a drop of it. Then Gordon's right arm glided out in a cautious overhand stroke. But the water was cold, very cold, and his left leg felt queer. It would not follow suit. The lad struck out with all his might, and the struggle sent him under again, down, far down, till the roaring in his ears deafened him. He had fasted in bitter pain since early morning, and a boy's strength cannot last for ever. As the body rose for the second time, one hand touched something floating and clutched it as only the drowning can. A plank, short, water-soaked and slimy, it could bear but little weight. Yet that little was much to him. He drew it under his armpit, and his lips were above water. Ah, oh, how sweet is God's own air! Gordon never knew before how much one breath is worth. Then the lad tried to paddle with his free hand, but the weight of his cramped legs was too great for so feeble a stroke. Still he kept on paddling. 
He must have been making headway without knowing it, for at last his hand touched the mossy stones. He pulled the plank nearer. They seemed to form the wall of the passage. He drew himself along beside it for a dozen strokes. The plank stopped abruptly. I have struck the other wall, I guess. This must be a corner. Gordon felt about in the blackness. Floating along beside the plank, half resting on it, half drawing himself onward by the stones, Gordon tried to loosen the plank from the unseen snag which held it. A sharp push. Too sharp. The slimy wood slid into the water again, but out of the boy's hand. He groped in the black air and blacker water. It was gone. Search was useless. Clinging to the stones, he dragged himself onward once more. This cannot be a corner, he muttered a moment later. There is another side to it, just over there, but it doesn't come over to make the point. Oh, I wish I could see for a minute, only once. Suddenly his cramped, dragging feet struck something hard. Crying out with pain, he sank, but not far. The rough stone floor was just beneath him. Crawling, dragging himself, feeling in the blackness ahead before each onward movement, slowly, slowly he struggled on. The water is more shallow, he muttered. I am going uphill just a little bit now. This must be some other passage. I wonder where it ends. Oh, well, when I am outside, I can see Ben Ender and tell by it which way to go. Hard work was warming his weary, cold body, and the cramp came out of his legs by and by. At last he could crawl, and the water was soon behind him. This passage was crooked and narrow. After crossing that first rise which had shut out the water, it went winding, winding, with a constant downward slant. Gordon could touch the roof with ease. The air, long imprisoned, had in it something which sucked his breath. He was sure he had crawled onward for an hour or more, but it is hard to tell how quickly time passes when a boy is weary yet dares not rest. Then he cheered himself by planning. It could not be much farther now. I wonder what that John is like. He must be a big man, or folks would not call him Muckle John. When we get mother, we shall have to go down into the dungeons. How shall we manage that? One hand dropped into space again, but this time he did not fall. He was a wiser lad now. Gordon groped about in the hole below him. His fingers touched something a couple of feet lower. It felt like a step. Were these more stairs? Dared he drop so far without knowing what came next? He sat on the edge and explored the thing with his toe. It was a step, but one end was broken off, and the stone wiggled. How he hated to climb down upon such a wobbling thing in that blackness! What if he should fall again? Still, he must go on, for he had no choice. Could he pull back if he must? The rocks about him were slippery with slime. How could a boy cling to them? At last he found one that had something like an edge. Slowly, cautiously, Gordon lowered his weight to the dangerous step below, rested a moment, steadied himself, dropped on his knees, then sat down, clinging all the while to the mossy stones of the wall. A breath of less foul air was coming from somewhere, and the lad drew a deep draught. With one weary toe he explored the lower blackness. There was another step, wide and solid near the wall, but broken off halfway across. The boy slid down on it. He was gaining courage now. One more step was tried. It was better, and the dozen forming the rest of the stairs were broad and firm. Gordon stood at the foot of the stairs and felt about. The arch of the passage was just in front of him. It was low, perhaps even lower than the one from which he had come, and the stone floor was more deeply bedded in moss and slime. The air was somewhat better, and this encouraged him. Surely God's good out of doors must be drawing near. He crawled on eagerly, and had gone a dozen yards or more, when one groping hand came upon a little pile of small, rough stones, scarcely larger than pebbles. He held one in his hand, wondering. These have no moss on them at all, and this one is dry he said aloud. As he spoke, something caught his foot. Pull as he would, he could not loosen it. The thing had clenched around his ankle and was holding him fast. 
Snakes! he gasped, struggling wildly. Weak and weary, the lad could make but a small effort at best. The thing only tightened more and more. Catching up a stone, he reached back cautiously and struck a sharp blow. It yielded a moment, but tightened again. A second blow. The slimy rock slipped, and he touched. Not a snake, but fingers. A man's fingers, rough-skinned, long, and thin. A muffled voice whispered, Who are you? End of chapter 17 Sir James of Gordon Gordon did not answer. He was searching for the stone lost a moment before. His left hand, groping along the floor, found nothing loose but the pile of dry pebbles. His right hand, outstretched and trembling, waited to guard against the next attack of this unseen foe. The man made no further movement, yet he kept whispering, Who are you? Now Gordon's left hand began to creep up the wall, vainly hoping to loosen some small rock. But the stones on this side of the passage were uncommonly large, square-cut, and well-set in mortar. A moment later, the boy's fingers touched the man's arm. Gordon shivered, drew back, waited an instant, and felt again. The arm came through a small, rough hole in the wall. The muffled voice repeated, Who are you? But the lad still kept silence. It was only a hand, not a man, with which he must deal. So he tugged at those clenched fingers with all his feeble might. Speak out. You may as well obey now as later, for you cannot go until you do, the muffled voice insisted. Gordon had no breath to waste on words. He must unclasp those fingers. Thin fingers. So thin the lad was almost sorry he had struck them. Something dampened the boy's hands as he struggled. The man's fingers were bleeding. Such fingers must be weak. Why couldn't he loosen them? His own strength was almost gone. The fingers held him prisoner. Are you of the old faith or the new? I am a Catholic, sir. No brass in the ring of that coin, boy. Well spoken. Who are you? Speak out, child. It is a friend that you have met in the darkness. If you were a friend, you would let me go. Let you go on following, blind Duncan. Aye, that would be kindness. Duncan, sir, you are mistaken. I have not seen him. Nor will you. When boys follow blind Duncan, they go down a passage that winds, winds, winds. For a long, long way it has come downward. For a long, long way it will go upward, though never to the light of God's day. By and by the little boy will find again that the air sucks his breath. By and by he will lay his head down on the moss, and... You mean there is no way out of this passage? No way that you would find without. But there is a way. Yes, yet one so dangerous that it would be tempting God to send a child through it, were you not in need. In need? Would you be here if you were not in need? Aye, in sore need. But answer my questions now, lad. Afterwards, I shall give you what help I can. First, the old question. Who are you? I do not like to talk to strangers, sir. What is your own name, please? I told you, a friend. But come, child, you waste time. Friend? A mean sort of friend you are. Gordon never ceased tugging at those clenched fingers. Now disappointment and weariness made him wink back the tears. A friend would not torment me. Why should I think that you are one? I do not know you. It would indeed be a very wicked man that would not befriend a little boy lost in the wicked blind Duncan passage. Let it pass at that. Now tell me, who are you? Well, I guess I have to. In truth, you must. I am the Gordon. That you are not. Sir, it is the chieftain alone who is called the Gordon. You are not yet Earl of Ravenhurst, my lad, but you are a Gordon, a small splinter of the Lang Sword. The deep voice grew strangely tender. You are he that was born ten years ago on the feast of Our Lady in Harvest. 
Sir, but how in the world did you learn that? The muffled tones sank lower. Gordon could scarcely hear the words. He put his ear near the hole, almost touching the man's forearm, and listened closely. All day long there has been the old foreboding thought. The boy is in danger. All day long down here in my dungeon I have prayed. Now, sweet mother, you bring him to me. Then the voice broke sharply. And, and Margaret, your mother, lad, did she live or die? Why, sir, she is alive. I mean, I hope. Hope? You hope? Why don't you know? The man's hand gripped Gordon's ankle till the pain shot through him, keen and sickening. Answer me. Agony, not anger, was in the muffled voice. Sir, I can't talk of these things to a stranger. Who are you? Why do you want to know so much about me and my mother? You are hurting my ankle. It's sore. Poor little one. There, it does not pain now, does it? No, surely you could not speak of these things to a stranger. But you need fear no longer. I have the best reason in this wide world for asking about you and your mother, my son. I am your father, James of Gordon. My father! Gordon caught that thin hand and kissed the damp spots. My own father! Oh, why do I always get things wrong? I hit you and made you bleed, and— You struck only to defend yourself. There is no pain, laddie, none whatever. But if there were, the joy in my heart would drown so small a thing. I know now this son of mine will never make my heart bleed. That is the pain a father dreads, my boy. If you knew the joy it gives me to learn it is my own son's voice that rang out so true and clear, as you told me your faith, here in the face of darkness and danger, such joy is worth these long years of suffering. The Blessed Mother of God has watched over you. But your mother, son, where is she? Tell me what you know or fear about her. What new harm has Bertrand Spahn done? Your own heart seems full to bursting. Come, pour out all this trouble, son. The fingers trembled as if caressing the boy, though still holding him a prisoner. I don't know. Betsy thinks she is down in the dungeon. And Uncle Stephen... Uncle Stephen, you have spoken with him? What did he say? He thought Mother must be in some part of the castle, perhaps in the North Tower. Probably. That is the prison tower. But what reason did he give? Uncle said Mother broke some law or other when she told me about you and spoke of the faith. And Roger took full advantage of his legal right as guardian, no doubt. God help me if evil has come to Margaret. But speak on. Tell me all you know. Then the whole tale was told for the second time that day. There is a blessing in confession. Telling the story to Stephen had brought the boy near to his God. And now, when it had been all poured out again, peace filled his soul, though he still sobbed in the darkness, clinging to his father's hand. Well, son, if mother is in heaven, she knows all this. Or if, God willing, she is still alive and we find her once more, you shall tell her the story just as you have told it to me and to that saint of God, Stephen. Then do as she will. Forget it. Could we begin to hunt for her right now, father? That is impossible. This hole still is too small for me to crawl through. Maybe the passage you are in meets this one farther on. I am not in a passage. I am lying on my face in the tunnel that I am making. My feet are a yard or two from my home. Cell 8, third level of fire the braised dungeon beneath the north tower. Even now my legs are cramping. You are in a cell of this castle. That I am. Mother told me the king's dragoons took you years and years ago. They did. But they let me go after six months of rack and dungeon. I staggered home to old Ravenhurst one rain-swept night. Godfrey found me, too weakened to offer resistance. He was for giving me a merciful sword thrust, but my gentle brother could not quite bring himself to risk murder. Instead, Roger gave me this pleasant chamber for the rest of my days. He told me about you. He said you were a fine, healthy babe, and that he would teach you to curse the very name of Catholic. 
He swore that Ravenhurst should rise at the cost of the old cause. Gold was far better than martyr's blood. And fools were all those that put trust in God's grace above the favor of kings. Of your mother, Roger would tell me nothing. I had left her at the point of death, and the longing to know which way the tide of life had turned came near to, ah, well, God's hand has been over us. But you, you have been alone here in a dungeon cell ever since I was a baby. How did you... When a man faces life imprisonment in a doorless pit, thirty feet below the land where God's sun is shining, he has the choice of thirty things which he may do. Despair, and become a sullen madman, brood over his wrongs, and become a fiend, or find some work, some business, which will save both soul and reason. But what work, what business? Oh, I know, you made this tunnel to get out, but that wouldn't take ten years. Would it not? Grinding out a hole through blocks of granite with one small diamond taken from a ring and fastened to a rusted spur, such work is swiftly done. But you have been here in this dark night, you, my own father, here alone through all the jolly days when I used to play with Joel. With one finger the lad explored the smooth yet uneven edges of the hole through which his father's arm was thrust. Joel, ah, oh, that Maryland farmer, Abel's son. Sir James paused, thinking, perhaps, my son, this sorrow may have taught you some things. Jolly days you called your old life. Perhaps you have learned that there are worse fates than the hard work of a farmer's home. Worse fates? I wouldn't give one log of Daddy Abel's cabin for all of Castle Ravenhurst. Oh, Father, I didn't mean that to hurt. Of course, if you and Mother had been here all winter. But folk like Uncle Roger don't make home. It's the old log house that's in my mind whenever I say home. And you would be willing to go back to that simple life again? Willing to go back to Abel's? Do you mean that there is any possible way? Yes, there is, but one great sacrifice will be necessary if ever we go to Maryland. What, father? The coronet of Ravenhurst must be given up forever. Long titles and log cabins do not go together. Oh, is that all? I thought you meant I must go without you or mother. So, who taught you that lesson? Lesson? What lesson? Godfrey has been teaching me Latin and things, but... No, this is not one of Birchinson's task. Sir Angus strove to write it in my mind, or rather in my heart. But I learned it, my son, on the day when my treason was proved, or declared to be, before the peers of Scotland. I knew the forfeiture had passed. I saw the execution of Gordon Riven. Then I learned it. And here in this dungeon, when through the black hours I knelt alone with God, who had decreed this sorrow for me. Here, imprisoned by my own brother, under my own strong battle tower, a branded outlaw whom it were a favor to Scotland to kill, spurned from the presence of Scotland's king. Here I found the presence chamber of the King of Kings. Don't worry about the execution any more, father. Uncle Roger told me a lot about it. But he used such big words, I understood only that he had straightened everything between the Gordons and the King. The lands, most of them, are ours again, but Uncle Roger paid for them with his soul. So, my good brother has been letting it appear that I am dead. He could not have succeeded with that plan otherwise. Very well, when we go to Maryland, it will be to his interest to let us remain there in peace, provided he finds no means to kill us before we set sail. Such a curse would let him slip into the earldom with small trouble. Poor weakling, God pity him. Now we must face the present. Roger is hunting for you, or soon will be. It would take a month to grind this hole large enough to be crawled through. But a strong man with a pick or a crowbar could take out this block of stone in less than an hour. You were seeking John of the Cleuth when I caught you, and he is the man we need. But father, how shall I ever find Uncle John of the Cleuth? I have been seeking him so long, it seems like always. A feeling of hopeless weariness surged over him, born of hunger, thirst, exhaustion, and the endless aching of his wounds. In the excitement of the last hour, these had seemed to dwindle, but now a wave of sickening misery swept over him. Small wonder you think so, son. 
You have traveled on your poor knees around Castle Ravenhurst just six times, and were on the point of beginning your seventh trip. Margaret has sent you by the fireplace passage, safe and direct, without cross tunnels or danger, but it cannot have been repaired these ten years since the floor above the cistern rotted through. God's angels must have guarded you, a full twenty feet you fell. If the best passage is in such condition, what of the worst? Yet through the worst I must send you, the wicked death trap of the blind Duncan. It was pitted to catch men. God pity the child that should fall into one of those holes. There ten feet deep with mossy sides and paved with pointed spikes. And you are already worn weary till your brain must be dizzy. How long have you been without food? I do not know. But never mind, father. The hunger did hurt all day, but I have not half so much pain now. No, you are living on the excitement and the good red blood in your veins. That sort of strength does well while it lasts, but it comes to a short end sometimes, my child. There is a small crust in my cell. I had thought of giving it to you before, yet did not, for it is badly molded. Still, there is some strength in the bread. Gordon heard the stealthy movement of the earl crawling backward through the narrow tunnel. In a moment, Sir James returned and the boy reached eagerly for the pitiful fare. Then the earl spoke again, his voice low and clear. Begin at the stairs you descended a while ago. Count along the floor thirty blocks of stone. At this point, stand. Scrape off the moss where the roof joins the wall, and pull down the iron ring you will find there. Twist it sharply three times and pull down. A door will open into that upper passage. Go forward past the staircase. Two tunnels open there in a Y. Take the right-hand one. Would to God I did not have to say that to you. You will be in the death trap of the blind Duncan. Now feel along the floor with care. Count ten stones. Change sides in the tunnel. Count ten stones and change sides in the tunnel. Count ten stones and change sides again. Do this ten times. You will come to short stairs. Go up. You will be in a large tunnel and safely out of Blind Duncan. There will be more light and better air if the ventilators are not clogged with old leaves. Five hundred feet from the stairs, you will come into the main passage, which you would have found hours ago, but for that hole in the floor above the cistern. Follow the large passage to its end in the woods near Ben Ender. Go north to the Frith. Follow the shore to the fishing village in the Cluth and ask for Muckle John. Tell him to come with what men and weapons he can muster. Tell him to bring a pick shovel and crowbar. Now repeat the instructions. The boy did so once, and then again. Another thing, resumed the father, leave small strips of your plaid along the tunnel to mark the returning way. Now go, and may God our father keep his hand above my boy. The lad's back ached from stooping, his head from hunger and weariness. Often, one trembling hand slid into some black abyss, and you would cling to the mossy stones, quivering. Little by little, the slime on the floor gave place to moss and damp stone. He climbed the last stairs. Air, God's sweet air, was drifting from somewhere, and with it came a dim gray in the blackness. He could see the floor and the walls at last, and before him, only a few yards away, an arch outlined against a stronger light. This was the main passage. Oh, such a long main passage. Did it run beneath all the fields and meadows from Rock Raven to Ben Ender? On and on the lad crawled, for even here there was not space to stand. The dull ache of weariness drove all reckoning of time from his thoughts. One thing only he knew clearly. Mother and father were there in the dungeon. He must seek John o the Cluth. Something was shining near him. Gordon leaned against the wall and looked. Light, an arch of real light from God's own out of doors, and across that light a branch was swaying in the breeze, a branch full of buds just bursting into leaf. He staggered out into the moonlight. Gordon stretched every muscle in his tired body, then shivered. The north wind pierced his damp clothing that stiffened as he hurried on. Last year's leaves about his feet were white and glistening, the poles frozen. The lad tried to run, beating his arms wildly but the coal could not be thrown off so easily. Suddenly he stopped. There came a long-drawn, 
Woo hoo ah hoo Wolves. Gordon dashed up the bank toward the big oak tree at the top of the hill. The lad ran as if he were not weary, ran as he had never run before, but down in the glen three lean gray bodies leaped. They had seen him. He reached the tree, the wolves still a few leaps behind. Gordon caught a branch. It slipped from his numb fingers and he fell. They were almost upon him. He caught the branch again, climbed it, from that to another. They were springing at him wildly. He could not reach the swaying branch above. Higher, still higher leaped the crouching forms, their white teeth gleaming in the moonlight. Then a gust of wind swayed the branch above down toward him. He clutched it, drew himself upon it, crawled back to the trunk and clung to the oak. Safe. No wolf could jump so high. They would go away in the morning, and it must be almost dawn, thought the lad. But hours seemed to pass, and still no hint of coming day. The wind blew fiercely through the wood, the oak wood on the slope of Ben Ender. Those small, numb hands found it hard to hold the lad in the tree crotch. The frozen clothing rattled when he moved, and a quick, sharp pain shot through him with every breath. Down below, the wolves waited, snapping at him now and then with long, white teeth, their red eyes glowing in the darkness. Would there be a dawn for him? At last it came, a faint flush far off on the waters of the frith. But the boy did not see it. He was wondering why the blackness about him whirled round and round, why the three pairs of red eyes were dancing, dancing, and whirling round and round. Two arrows hissed from the bushes. Two gray watchers leaped high in the air and fell with guttural howls. Another shaft flashed the dawning light, and the third fell across his mates, kicking wildly. "'Well-sped bolts,' muckled John. Someone shouted, springing from the bracken. Three good wolf pelts, a four sun-up.' "'What's treed? A bairn. Quick, lend a hand. He be a-fallen. There, steady, easy, lay him doon.' The wee laird o' Gordon. Na doot o' that. Hold him easy while I wrap him up in my plaid. Would ye see the welts on his face? God's mercy on the laddie. Clad in rags, muddy, stiff with cold, beaten, bloody. What make ye o' that? It be the work o' yon devil in the castle, and the Gordon up and fled to us. God's blessing on our wee chief. End of chapter 18 Muckle John. Dawn had come at last. A red light was dancing far out on the water. The clouds were all afire. Gordon lay in a bed, looking out through a doorway, puzzled. Where was he? He tried to raise his head. It was oddly heavy. Something seemed to be weighing it down. He lifted his hand to remove the thing and stared. Long fingers, thin and white, Blue veins winding in and out among bones. This hand was not his. It must belong to a sick girl. Someone was speaking in a low tone. Turning his head was too wearisome, but his eyes followed the sound. A man standing near a fireplace, a rough giant of a seaman with a scarred face. The woman beside him came swiftly forward as she heard the lad stir. Ha a wee drop o' soup, my lamb, would ye? No, madam, he answered, but why did his voice sound so faint and queer? No, madam, I cannot stay to eat, if you will unfasten that thing which is holding my head down. Bless the soul, O oh my bairnie, nothing be there save a damp cloth, yet if the weight troubles thee, I'll... It does not trouble me, madam, it holds me down, and I must go to find Muckle John o the cluth. And what would my chief have me to do? The burly fisherman bent close to hear, but Gordon's eyes grew suddenly wild. Weakness seemed to vanish. He sprang forward, staring at an old collie that had slipped in, snatched the bowl from the woman's hand, and flung it at the dog, crying, I hit him! That's one wolf done for! But there are so many eyes, red eyes, going round and round. And the dawn, will it never come? I can't. Hold on, any... His voice trailed off into silence as he sank back on the pillow. Ay, there he goes off again, 
moaned the woman. If we do not get yon fever doon, there'll be no wee chief o' raven come sunset. Na, na, Jeanie, the wee Gordon can no die. All the hope of the clan be in him. Muckle John sat by the lad all day. Now and then he sponged the hot body gently, so gently that the boy did not stir or he roused the lad to give him a drink of soup. Hour after hour he watched for a glimmer of returning consciousness, and all the while the beads slipped through his iron-muscled fingers as he pleaded with God's mother for his chieftain and for Clan Gordon. The sun was setting. Long shafts of light glinted along the heather, under the oak branches, and through the cottage window, until they danced over Gordon's face. Then the deep blue eyes opened, clear and quiet. The moment had come. Muckle John leaned forward. His rugged face was gentle, his voice low as a mother's crooning a lullaby. Yet in his eyes was the coming fury, still controlled, like the sea along the highland coast, rolling its oily billows before the storm. I be your Muckle John. Who beat ye? Uncle Roger, but it is not for that I came, my big John. Mother, she's gone. I don't know where. Father, he's living. Dungeon, North Tower. And he said... The voice was dying low, yet the words fell one by one before the eyelids drooped again. Muggle John took down his old claymore and tiptoed out into the sunset. Men sprang up from doors half hidden in the heather and sped toward him. I, he growled, I ha news for ye. Roger beat the wee chief and would have murdered him. God give me strength, O oh arm, till I deal the weakling his portion. With a galley whip, blow for blow, I will pay him before I fling him for the seaward tower's tip. Oot, far oot, till he falls on the wave beat rocks below. More, hear ye, Sir Jamie be alive and call in the clan. Speed ye all to Rock Raven. The rat had not left the waters of the frith when all that were loyal still of Clan Gordon were flying hot-foot to the rescue. Muckle John, grandson of Tam the Armorer, his six bold sons, his crew of fishermen, rude fellows with gnarled hands and shaggy beards, old Donald, last of those trained to war by Angus Gordon, Davy, trailing the scabbard of his father's sword and panting to keep pace with the men. They had been crawling a long while in the tunnel when a whisper floated back, no signs of the plaid yet, and here be the three arched openings. Donald slipped forward. He felt along the arches and reported, Thraw crosses. Na, na, that be the blind Duncan. Keep oot. Twa crosses. I had no mind o' that. And cross. Na, it be the way what ends up on the south front, o seaward tower nigh the fireplace, too far fra the north tower. By the twa crossway we'll ha to go, decree Muckle John, and the clan crept on. To the crawling men it seemed hours later that Muckle John's voice drifted slowly back. Light ahead, never a sound that a rat could hear. Dirk suit. The light drew near, a bar of yellow darting out from the side wall. A voice ripped up the silence. Tell that lie again, Betsy, and I'll... But it's the truth, Master Godfrey. Truth? Don't think to fool me. That boy did not fly out the window or crawl through the keyhole. You opened the door or you know who did. Mind, I saw you whispering at the crack. Sir, I did but say. Lie again and I'll bash your head in. Muckle John hurled his bulk against the wall. The panel crashed. Struggling through, he caught a beam by one hand and dropped. Godfrey whirled to face the giant fisherman's dirk gleaming in the candlelight. Give a sound, and I'll drive my dirk through the black heart, O ye devil's bloodhound that ye be. Then glancing at Betsy, he said gently, Ha no fear, child. We be more rough in look than in deed. Lang Andrew, care for the lass. Let no ill befall her. Now, as for ye, Godfrey, son o' Bertrand, if ye love your foul life a wee, you answer me true. Where be the keys of the dungeons? On a peg in Sir Roger's room. He's lying, whispered Betsy. Godfrey snarled, 
looked at Muckle John's knife, drew the keys from his doublet, and handed them to John. Where be the cells of Sir James and Lady Margaret? An ugly smile crossed Godfrey's face. I'll tell that gladly. The Earl's, third level, second quarter, cell eight, fire the brace dungeon. The Lady, second level, fourth quarter, cell three. I'll even say what you can find there. And my lord, the Earl's apartment is a hole, a sort of tunnel, leading into the blind Duncan. And the boudoir of my lady the countess is a hole similar to the one through which you have just come. As to the Earl and his lady, we had thought they were with you. Now we know exactly where they are. You have the boy. Keep him. Can you prove before the courts of Scotland that he is the heir? His parents will not aid you, because dead men tell no tales. Tomorrow we shall drag the cistern for their bodies. Their residence in the pool does not make the water too wholesome. Stay for the funeral, and bid the brat come from the glen to be chief mourner. You are quite welcome. He ended with a curse and a laugh. Keep the name o' God off that foul tongue o' yours. If ye be tellin' a lie, I think I'll dirk ye. If ye be tellin' the truth, I know I will. Ye be so are wise and all knowin'. It be a bitter pity old Satan Hanna give ye a seat on his council bench afore now. Watch and will. Keep this devil's darlin' under your wings. Dirk him if he makes a sound. From the lower end of the hall came a sentinel's tread. Muckle John crept out of the room and crouched in the shadow. No, no night, and all is weal, the deep voice echoed through the empty corridors. Do not be so sure of that, Muckle John whispered, as he sprang on the sentry's back and clasped one mighty hand over his mouth. A short struggle, a fall, their faces met. Edwin, gasped Muckle John. At your service, what brings thee here? Be they all safe with ye in the cluth? The boy is, but... Then where be the laird and his lady? Whiles we were searching the secret ways, I found Sir Jamie. I helped him oot, and we got the lady and Benson oot. Then I went for food, came back, and could no find them at all. Halt, or I fire! Old Donald's voice rang out. Muckle John whirled. Godfrey was halfway up the corridor, running for his life. Halt! The time-worn hackbutt blazed, but Donald's aim was not what it had been in bygone days. The bullet flattened against the wall. Godfrey dodged behind a pillar, around a corner, and was lost. His voice echoed back, sounding the alarm. Edwin whispered, Quick, this way, the kitchen stairs, they'll be afore us. The outlaws dashed for the stairs, plunged up, and stopped short. Arms were clanking in the upper hall. Sir Roger's voice spat an order. Shoot the first head that comes above the step. Bottled in the stairway, came Godfrey's yell. With it was the sound of hurried marching in the lower corridor. There was a faint scratching sound near Muckle John's head. He glanced up. A crack was slowly widening as four slender fingers strove to slit a panel back. They heard Lady Margaret's low, Quick, John, open it for me. The fisherman's mighty shove sent the panel back. Swiftly, silently, the men of Clan Gordon crowded into the dark passage. Muckle John saw the secret door shut, and they lay still. Fire! Godfrey's voice snarled from below. A volley of shots spat up the stairs. Fire! Roger echoed from above. A volley spat down. Charge! Footsteps thundered above and below. They stopped uncertainly. No one here, sir. I, sir, nobody here. Gordon Forgot in Our Lady The clanking tramp echoed in corridors above and below, then died away. Muckle John, came Lady Margaret's agonized whisper. My boy, did he reach you? Aye, my lady. The fisherman paused. How could he tell her of that wasted, wounded bairn, gasping on the cot at home? Aye, my lady, he did. Speak out, Muckle John. True kindness will make you tell me the worst. It is much, so much, to be sure he reached you and Jeanie. 
Aye, my lady, he ha been with us from the first. Do not fear o'er much. We still ha hopes. He was all wounded, wetted, and weak and weary. Then the bitter north wind struck him. I did not find him till morning, and he was oot o his head by then. Lung fever do get a barren flighty so fast. He did no get his wits till this eve at sundoon, so we did no hear Sir Jamie's orders till then. Ten days on the way, he must think us grand and fine laggers. No, no, the Earl knows you too well to doubt your loyalty. He feared that Gordon had never reached you, and he has been searching the death pits of the blind Duncan ever since. Be the laird there? No, Muckle John. He and Stephen went to. Hark! I hear them coming. James? Who is with you, Margaret? Muckle John, Donald, Edwin, and the rest of the brave lads from the Cluth. Gordon is safe in Jeanie's care, ill with lung fever. Thank God they have my boy. Muckle John? Aye, sir. Stephen has the sacred vessels. But it cut to the heart to leave the sacred stone. We could not lift so great a weight. Take your sons and get it. Aye, sir. Donald? Aye, sir. If I put you into the fireplace passage, do you know how to lead out without crossing the cistern? Aye, sir. Do you remember where we hid the chest of gold? Aye, sir. Guide Muckle John and then get the chest. Aye, sir. Edwin? Aye, sir. Could you get the dungeon keys? Aye, sir. Muckle John has them. Are any of the clan in the dungeon cells? Aye, sir. No, a few. There be Peter, Skipper o' the St. Andrew. Roger ha' a guess that Peter helped to hide the bairn, and... I trust you, Edwin. Release all innocent men of Clan Gordon. But how will you manage it? Godfrey's men be chasing o'er the North Tower, the kitchens, wine cellar, and such for us. I can lead the lads oot by the death trap o' the blind Duncan, for I know the tricks, and he's as leaf search in the pit o' the old black horny as there. Good, we shall all meet where the three arches open into the main tunnel. Aye, sir. Don's arrows began nipping the wave crests of the frith, but down where the three arches opened from deeper to lesser darkness, the clan was still waiting latecomers. If we bide longer in the silence, we shall hear the spiders of spinning, growled young Davy. Na, na, laughed Peter. Ye never do hear their shuttles clack. But, my lad, you'll soon feel how weel the old granny o' the weavers do bite. See yon muckle lassie crawling nigh your hand. See, be ye stark mad. Who can see here? Shut your eyes, Peter, came Edwin's swift command. Sir Jamie as wheel, and all the lads for the third level dungeon. Ye have lived o'er long in the black night. Can ye ladies give me kerchiefs? I must bind their eyes now. Full sunlight that will go into as we pass with the tunnel would turn them stone blind. God bless you, whispered the earl, as Edwin made the bandages secure. God bless you, for tis little else but wishes your poor chief has to give. Let Donald lead. He knows the way. As the last comers arrived, Clan Gordon crawled forward. Slowly the light grew until at long last the arching end of the tunnel was near, and across it a nodding spray. Oh, James, I wish you could see this. Only one tossing branch of heather with dewdrops glistening on half-open buds, and God's own glad sunshine over all. And so I shall, comrade at arms, so I shall one day when we three... You and our boy and I wander through the wild green forests of Our Lady's land beyond the sea. But hark, not so fast, Donald. Something is clanking among the oaks. Move that heather with your claymore, but keep under cover. Donald touched the root sharply. Crack! A bullet flattened against the arch. Then a laugh floated in from that outer world, and on it Roger's snarl. Come on, and a warm welcome to you. Godfrey is waiting where the passage opens near the old ruin. The seaward opening is well guarded. Come out, and a dose of lead to each. Crawl back, and pass the other two if you dare. Stay where you are, and die. Those old pitted rat-holes make fine graves. We shall have to tunnel out. The earl's very voice had still in it the ring of steel. Hark! What be that? Stephen Douglas! 
Na, na, that can no be. But it be. See the all grey cloak o' him? Oh, he must know. There be a thousand pounds on him, dead or livin'. It'll be his death, for Roger sees. Hark, he be speakin'. Lads, the voice of Stephen Douglas rang clear and steady. Lads, your guns are leveled at Sir James and Lady Margaret. What harm have they done you? It can't be the Earl. He's dead. But it is the Earl. See? The heather branches were parting, and the prisoner clutching the stone with one hand was drawing himself erect before them. The Earl! This the Earl! jeered Sir Roger. Stephen Douglas never lies. It was the captain of the guards speaking. The Gordon! That old cheer was scarcely more than a murmur somewhere in the ranks. Then it came in a long peal of thunder. The Gordon! The Gordon! Welcome home, kind Laird! Thrice welcome! Fools! gasped Sir Roger, dismayed because he had no Godfrey to prompt him in this extremity. Fools! Can that wandering beggar make you believe a lie? That madman of the grey cloak! That hounded outlaw! Do you believe him? Would you call this old wretch by the rocks the Earl of Ravenhurst? Were my brother James of Gordon living, he would be a nobleman in his prime. Fools! Can you call that vile, old, dungeon-rotted criminal an Earl and my brother? Sir, the captain spoke curtly, Sir, the valets of your dungeons are not over-careful of the personal appearance of prisoners. This is the Earl. Stephen Douglas has said it. See, Lady Margaret is stepping out beside him to lay her hand on his arm. Sir, you can command us no longer. Our allegiance is to the Earl. Aye, lads, the cheer! Then the roar broke from a hundred throats, until Ben Ender re-echoed the old war cry. The Gordon! The Gordon! For God and Our Lady! Sir Roger turned swiftly and strode up the path. Not even the stiffness of wounded vanity could hide the writhing of his sallow face. He knew. When had he ever forgotten it? The very scullions of Ravenhurst had nothing but contempt for the weakling of the House of Gordon. The Earl drew his hand across his eyes. The bandage was wet with tears. God bless you. You are Gordon's, and Clan Gordon was ever true. Do not judge poor Roger over hard. He has not the strength of will that goes with the Gordon blood. Poor fellow, he has gone down with the evil tide. More than he have done that, admitted the captain. Not all of us, though. Edwin never failed to make his Easter. Others risked it. When most of us up at the castle, sir, myself among them, most of us have gone down with the evil tide. Still, now that you are again with us, my lord, we will, God helping us, we will stand with you again for God and Our Lady. Aye, my laird, cried Edwin, give us the word, only give us the word. We'll help Rock Raven for ye afore the sons of the noon o' the dial. No, Roger may have Castle Ravenhurst and whatever of this world's goods goes with it. Sir, broke in Muckle John fiercely, ye will no give your rights to yon traitor. Let it pass, you brave-hearted clansmen. Is it so much that is given to him? Even here in this world, is there nothing better than piles of ivy-mantled stone and heaps of golden treasure? Weal, Sir Jamie, Edwin raised his hand in the old salute, if ye do not care to take Rock Raven for your brother, blood be thicker nor water, and ye have a forgiven heart. We could make ye a snug hold on a high crag and the heart open ender. I have a better plan to offer. Erecting a fortress means the beginning of a feud, and the end of that we all know. More Gordons would die in battle, more orphans wail for bread. The cause for which our father stood is dead in Scotland, though not for ever. It is to the new world we should turn our eyes. There the old cause lives anew. Aye, shouted the captain of the guard. Aye, my lord, would ye lead us there? That is a plan worth hearing, if sailors' tales be true. Red men roaming the wild wood and trading you fur fit for a king's robe, to the tune of a few glass beads. Aye, lads, and Spanish gold. No, no, I am not promising fortune in the new world. It is not a land where gold is picked up by the handful, and jewels shine like drops of dew on a May morning. 
These are but sailors' tales. Those who follow me to Maryland must go for one reason, to find a spot where we can be free to worship the Lord our God. There are few priests now in Scotland. Soon even these will be gone. Without priests and sacraments, the faith must die among our children. Years ago, Baltimore told me about his colony. Do not hope for gold, for you will find hardships instead. On the way we shall suffer. We may face starvation. In Maryland we shall suffer much, at least during the months before the first harvest. Even after the worst is over, there will be hard work in grinding poverty all our lives. But we shall be free men in a free land. We shall adore God as our souls cry out to do. We shall rear our children in the faith. How many are willing to follow me? Sir, all Donald's trembling hand rose in salute. Clan Gordon, however, followed the chief. I be at your service. Muckle John, do not be all day with your eyes, sir. The fisherman drew a bit of heather through his fingers and looked off across the sea. Never to know Scotland more, never to smell the wind o' morning blowing fresh fall o'er the heath, never to watch the sun arise and oot o' the waters o' the frith, glinting along the white caps, reddening in the snow on the head o' Beninder, calling and calling the fishers home. Muckle John Tamson o' the cluth, cried Donald, ye be the last man I'd take for a lagger. Lagger? Who be laggin? All the clan be goin' save Edwin. His old mother be past ninety and bedridden. He can no come till he lays her in the kirkyard. All the clan be goin'. But it cuts, man, it cuts. And I have a greater burden to lay on your shoulders, my brave Muckle John. You are the best seaman among us. It falls to your lot to be skipper of the ship that bears Clan Gordon overseas. Sir, I be no fit for that. I'd land ye all in Davy's locker. You need a deep seas man. By the time we found such a captain, what would Sir Roger have done? Got to rob Briggs or more to guard the mouth of the frith. If go it be, go we must with the morning tide afore sun up. Peter could take the St. Andrew with the seasoned crew. The women and bands and goods are most value. I could take the Nancy Kits with the landlubber crew. Then we'd run it for the Irish coast, where we might pick up a deep seas captain, food and such. Well planned, Muckle John. There we could get your altar wine, Father Stephen. But the priest was shaking his head. No, my duty is here. The few Gordons who cannot go with you must not be left without the sacraments. You, oh, do not stay. Lady Margaret paused. It would be useless to plead with her brother. She knew his noble heart too well. Muckle John, called the Earl sharply, what are you doing beyond that heather bush? The dungeon hog gave ye eyes in the back of your head, growled the fisherman under his breath. My laird, I ha a wee bit o' business to be done. And that business is? I'd as lief not tell ye, my laird. Out with that business, John. Your blood is up. Weel, then, Sir Jamie, ye may ha settle score with yon traitor, but I ha sworn afore the clan, too. Put the sin of vengeance on your soul the day before you faith death on the high seas. Sin, it be no sin, but... He stirred the Stephen Douglas, and like a giant boy knelt at his feet. I have sworn to give the traitor what he gave the wee chief, blow for blow with a knotted lash, oh, a galley whip, and then I have sworn to fling him fra the tip of the seaward tower. Weak Leno, the house of Gordon, coward, traitor to the faith, he will have traded kith and kin for gold, put his own blood brother to dungeon rot for ten long years, broke the heart of Lady Margaret with waitin, he what would have murdered the wee chief. But ye did no see the bruised and bleeding gasp in laddie. It be I what took him in my arms to Jeanie. Send to kill yon Roger. It be no more sin nor to crush a venom spitten asp under my heel. Vengeance is a sin, Muckle John, said Stephen Douglas gently. Because Roger has wounded the heart of Christ by sin, need you sin also? He laid his consecrated hand on the shaggy black head. The rough hair parted. He ran his finger along the white line from crown to forehead to cheek. Where got you that scar, my son? Ye no weal. 
I be prouder o' yon scar than o' all the marks o' a laird's shield. Proud because you once fell guarding the body of Christ our Lord, and now you wound his sacred heart by sin. Naw, naw. The giant's shoulders quivered. A tear splashed on the sod. Naw, if you say it be truly sin, naw, I would no wound the heart o' him what bled for me. I'll forgive the poor weakling. I'll forgive. Rock Raven No More Jean stood in her doorway, now watching the group speeding down the Rock Raven path, now running back to the couch where Gordon lay. Was there a sound, or the lessening of a sound? Jean sprang to the lad. There was no light in the half-closed eyes. His head rolled limply, and he sighed. But it be a sigh. He had no gone yet. Mother of mercy, let him hold out till she comes. If I could get the wine on the mantle. A hand slipped under the boy's head. A mug was pressed to his half-open lips. Jeanie knew those firm, slender fingers. Thank God, my lady, ye be come. I'll run for Father Stephen. He may yet be in time. Jean sped up the path. Ay, that be Lady Margaret for ye, she murmured, quiet and steady always, even when her heart be a breakin. Quiet and steady. Jean did not see her now, the white head bowed on the rushes of the couch, the thin, bent shoulders quivering under the silken plaid, the hot words springing from her heart swifter than her tears. Oh, God! Oh, my God! I cannot! Only in baby days was he mine. Oh, God, remember the years of fear and waiting. Then you gave him back. He was mine, mine for a few hours. How the memory of his brave young face has sweetened the long months of darkness. Now, are you taking him from me? Now, when we three might be together? I cannot. Oh, God, forgive me. I cannot, my God, I cannot. The voice of Muckle John came from the doorway. Lift your foot, the breath o' a hand, my laird. Now ain step or twa to the right, and you're by his side. Then the fisherman slipped away again. Sir James pressed his fingers on the lad's wrist. The little bark is far out toward the eternal sea, he whispered. No, no, we can hope, we must hope still. But I am glad your eyes are bandaged, James. You cannot see where the lash cuts so many times. Wounds that do not heal, fretted with fever. If we could let him rest only a few days before going on shipboard. He will be at rest in a little while, where no man shall trouble him more. No, James, no. If we could wait only one day. But that cannot be. We must face the truth together, comrade at arms. Slowly he pushed his rosary beads, crossed foremost over the quilt, blindly groping for her hand. But she did not see them. Her eyes were on her boy's face, the dark bruises, the pinched, half-open lips. And he was alone when he suffered, so I knew it would be. Then her eyes went upward to Calvary on the cottage wall, where stood that other mother beside that other dying son. The cross in her husband's groping hand touched her fingers. She started and saw the mute struggle in his lips, the will of the house of Gordon forcing out the words. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died. She shivered, picked up the cross, and finished the words of the creed. Prayer and response ebbed and flowed, growing ever more and more pleading. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Over and over the brown beads slipped by. A change came. Gordon had not stirred, but there was a light in the half-open eyes. Slowly, very slowly, the waxen lids drew back. The right hand fluttered, a weary load to lift, but it rose one, two, three inches until it touched her hair. White, he breathed. This is my own mother, for her hair is white. A shadow darkened the doorway. Jean tiptoed in, lit the candles, and knelt. Father Stephen entered and laid his sacred burden on the linen cloth. Gordon, 
he said in his clear, low voice. I am going to give you extreme unction. The eyes brightened, then grew puzzled. Confession first? If there is anything to confess, you have nothing to tell, have you? Can't remember. Maybe I haven't had time to be bad. Blessed are the days when we have no time to be bad. So do not worry. Say in your heart, My Jesus, I love thee. Forgive me. Then Stephen anointed the boy. Not much of evil had he ever known. Not far had his feet gone astray. And then Gordon's eyes rested on the sacred host. Nothing else he seemed to see. I, murmured Muckle John, and tell him your father and mother and all the clan, how needo our lad. Mayhap he'll leave ye bide with us, for sure the good Lord be kind. The eyes closed. Margaret's head sank on the couch, her hand clenched on the cross. But Stephen whispered softly, Sleeping, only sleeping with the good Lord in his breast. The day fled swiftly. Inside the cottage, the ebb and flow of the rosary still beat on the eternal shore. But the song in those waves was of hope. Outside, the silent folks sped on errands to and from the boats, or went on noiseless feet through old Donald's door to pour into Stephen's patient ear their sorrows and their sins, and to come out again with hopeless eyes and firm-set lips. A little after midnight, the altar was prepared. The holy sacrifice was offered, solemnly, silently, lest some sacrilegious band steal upon them through the darkness, and to each was given the bread of the strong. The sentinel on the seaward tower of Castle Ravenhurst watched the fishers putting out to sea in the dawn. Fair day coming, was all he thought. He did not see the tall, gaunt figure in a long, grey cloak, standing on a cliff, and holding out his crucifix and blessing, until the ships rounded a headland, and could see Rock Raven no more. Then Stephen Douglas turned, and strode back into the forest to wander, hound-tracked, starving, and alone, happy if he found a soul who even in the last dread hour would make its peace with God. No man knew when the good Lord called him home. But one year, when the snows of Ben Ender were slipping away in merry, tinkling rills over the stones and under the mosses, Edwin found him. His face was strangely beautiful, lying there host white on a corporal of virgin snow. End of chapter 20 In the Hollow of God's Hand Out into the west sailed the St. Andrew and the Nancy Kids. For three months waves raced with a singing wind. Watchers hoped hour after hour for a glimpse of unknown shores. Folk chatted gaily of St. Mary's land beyond the sea. Then, with a snarling roar, the storm swooped down, snapped the mast of the kits short off, leaving her a helpless log tossed hither and yon by the waves, and wrenched the old timbers of the St. Andrew till she sprang a leak. Yet when the storm drew back, grumbling, both hulks were afloat. The kits had held her caulking. She was of Muckle John's making from the toughest oaks of Ben Ender, but the doomed St. Andrew floated only until her living freight was shifted to the lugger. As she lurched under, Sir James said, Let us thank our Father, who rolleth the waves and holdeth the sea in the hollow of his hand. No lives are lost, only our treasured goods and our chest of gold are gone. God's mother will provide. Then followed weeks that were a stern test of that faith. The derelict of the kits floated on some bright waves. Water was doled out in spoonfuls. Then the bloodhounds of the air were unleashed again. Muckle John had stood at the wheel through all the raging darkness of the night and the wilder tempest of the day. Now, once again, in the howling night, the winds fought with the Nancy kits, driving the sleet over her in hissing sheets. All about her, long, writhing lines of foam moaned as they rose and fell. Peter, clinging, sliding, stumbling, forced his way to the skipper's side. "'Give me the wheel!' he panted. "'No!' Give it to me, or I'll take it from ye. His hand gripped the spokes. Take your hands off, or you'll know who be skipper o' the Nancy Kits. Peter stepped back. 
Ye be Muckle John, but there be an end of what ye can do, Muckle or no Muckle, yet I may as weel go argue with the mast. Ye will not give in, fit to fall for sheer weariness. Ha, pint o' common sense, John, give me the wheel for ye faint. The grim lips were motionless, the giant frame tense. Only the eyes moved, following the seething lines ahead. John, lad, give me the wheel and go rest. Six months and more since ye had a night's sleep. Be at rest and to fling your cell doon on the deck, only to spring to your feet every time a spar creaks. Will ye never trust me more since I lost to St. Andrew? Give me the wheel, man, give me the wheel. No. Ye be killing your cell, John. Give me the wheel. Pray more and prat less. God be looking doon on us, be that true? Wheel, then. He knows what we ha to face. The ship a leak, the sick dying in the hold, the water spent, the last chest of moldy bread all but gone. God knows I must have strength to steer the Nancy Kits, and he will give it. Steer where? God may well for Clan Gordon to go to Davy instead of America. If that be so, so be it. God have mercy. What now? A writhing, screaming whiteness rose out of the sea before them. The mighty frame of the skipper bent, bent, clenched upon the wheel. The Nancy Kit sprang like a living thing, slipped into the trow of the wave, righted herself, mounted the next, bowed to crest. The booming, seething whiteness swirled by on the starboard bow, sending a wilderness of foaming waters tumbling across the deck. The thunder of a hundred cannons bellowed to larboard. Not a cable's length from the bow, a wild thing groveled, fierce as the spirit of the tempest, soft, fleecy, shimmering as a froth of moonlight. Reef to larboard! shrieked Peter. The grim skipper clenched the wheel and reversed. The kit swung to starboard again, and, groaning in every wrenched timber, plunged madly onward. Oh, God, the rocks owe an unknown coast on such a night as this, but the wind hath fallen. No, we are turned to headland. Hark, do ye no hear yon ugly slushin sound? A growler to larboard. The Nancy Kit struck. Peter lurched forward. The roaring swirl carried him out. He clutched the rail. Waters above, below, around, booming in his ears, yet he clung. The fury grew less. He struggled to his feet on the trembling deck. Muckle John still clenched the wheel. Speed ye wheel to Davy. No, we be anchored in America, bow wedged twixt the reef and one horn o a jetty. The tother be rammed into the stern. Get word to Sir James. We be on a reef in the Leo rocks with the tide nigh to the turn. If we can float half an hour, we be safe. Peter began to crawl toward the hatches. The waves broke in sheets over the larboard rail, seething across the deck. The eddy caught him and whirled him like a bit of driftwood over the starboard rail. There he clung till the waters passed, crept back to the slippery deck, caught a rope, began dragging himself hand over hand. He had won ten feet or more when the hatches opened. A man stumbled up, grasped the rigging line, staggered, fell, gained his knees, but the billows whirred over the rail again. Peter, clinging to his rope, spun like a trout hooked in the rapids. Someone was coming toward him through the surging waters. Peter stretched out his hand, the other clutched it. Together they swung in the blinding swirl for a moment. The wave was passing. Peter could see dimly the straight-shouldered frame and the white hair of Sir James. The Earl gained his feet. Boats, Peter, he shouted, water pouring into the hold. She can't float an hour. She can float a half hour, then. That puts us all safe, for the waves will no beat the kits to bit afore her job be done. Muckle John made her, and she will haul to her wheel till the end. Hour by hour, the fury of the waves grew less and less, for the storm had spent itself, and the tide left the Nancy Kits high and dry. In the gray dawn, far out beyond the headland, the cannons of the surf were still booming, but within the cove, the war of wind and wave had ceased. The morning sun burst through the banks of cloud, flushed the foam, and set a thousand rubies gleaming along the reef, where the Nancy Kits was perched, with Clan Gordon crowding out on deck to see the brave new world. The wet rocks of the headland behind them had each a golden crest. 
swift rays of trembling light danced across the mile of shallow, tossing sea, lying between them and the shore. But what shore? New England? Virginia? The Spanish Isles? The forest crowned steep beyond the sand was silent, solitary. Ay, Muckle John, laughed Peter, when be the dories going? The waves are scarce even choppy now. I be fit to go wild with longin' to set foot on yon invitin' sand. The dories be gone when Sir James gives the word. Can ye no see he be taken in the lay o' the land afore he makes a start? Father! A thin yellow hand touched the arm of Sir James. Joyous eyes looked up at him, joyous though the black circles beneath them were deep. The old merry laugh rang out from lips pale and cracked, rang and then stopped, for the pain almost choked it. The earl smiled at the eager boy. Well, son? Oh, father, if you will let Davy and me have a dory, we'll get some oysters. I know how to rake for them, and there must be plenty in a cove like this, if you will let us. By and by, my son, the exploring party must go first. Then, seeing the disappointment in the lad's eyes, both of us cannot go in the first dory. That will leave mother alone. She must feel cold down in the damp cabin. But the sun has already begun to warm the deck. Suppose you ask Jean and Davy to help you make a couch for her up here. Gordon ran gaily toward the hatches. That is, he ran a dozen steps. Then, with a hand upon his side, he leaned against the stump of the broken mast for a moment, straightened himself with a shiver, and went slowly, very slowly, down the ladder. God's blessing be on him, murmured old Donald. There he be at the pumps last night, begging to help, and that pain is stabbing his side with every breath. He had more grit than their twenty men. Sir James turned from his study of the shore. Muckle John? Aye, sir. Are you sure the large dory is still seaworthy? It be, sir. Lower it, and put in five muskets with powder and shot, a spyglass, and a compass. You will go with me in search of a suitable place for camp. Aye, sir. What and will? Aye, sir. You will climb that point, the highest on the bluff yonder, to scout. Silence and caution before all things. We cannot fight Indians or any other enemy now. If any sign of human beings be seen, give warning at once. If not, stay as sentries. Aye, sir. Peter? Aye, sir. You will guard the dory. Be ready to push off at a moment's notice. Aye, sir. Silence as soon as the dory leaves the ship. No unnecessary noise on land, such as shooting game. We must know first whether or not this country is inhabited. Aye, sir. A few moments later the dory slid into the choppy waters. Sir James was standing amidships, scanning the beach, the clay bluffs that walled in the cove, and the forest edge above them. Peter was at the helm, Muggle John's brawny sons at the oars, and the skipper on guard. Gordon, perched on a coil of rope near his mother's couch, reported events. They will be on land in a little while now. All the birds up there in the trees will be singing like a bagpiper's band, because the rain's over, the sun has dried their feathers, and they can see the makings of fine breakfasts everywhere. Oh, mother, don't you wish you were? But you're asleep. Lady Margaret opened her eyes and smiled. No, son. How warm the air is. You love America, laddie, and so shall we. Clasping the boy's yellow hand in hers, she closed her eyes again. An hour later, Peter and the skipper came back. The place for a camp had been chosen. No Indian or other human being had been seen. In fact, no living thing save the birds. Then came the hurried unloading. Time must not be lost. The next tide was strew the shore with the broken timbers of the Nancy kits. The sick were brought from the ship and placed on rough couches made by piling branches on empty casks and covering them with mats and coarse bedding. A shelter from the wind and sun was rigged up from canvas fastened to poles. This would seem scarcely a fitting couch for Lady Margaret of Douglas, Countess of Ravenhurst, daughter of Sir Wilfrid Douglas of the line of old Sir Archibald, Bell the Cat. And yet, perhaps it was most fitting, for the ballads of ancient days call the women of that famous name the Ladies of the Bleeding Heart. More noble by nature than by blood, 
Lady Margaret whispered, smiling faintly, though the deep blue Douglas eyes were dark with pain. You have been so gentle in carrying me, Muggle John. May God bless you. But see, John, the soft quilt. Benson needs it far more than I. Lay it on her couch. No, but you must, John. See, they are bringing her now. And the giant skipper, wiping his eyes with his great hairy hand, did as she bade him. Down by the water's edge there was bustle and haste. Pale women and meager children were searching among the rocks for clams and crawfish. Dories were plying to and from the wreck. Gaunt men were carrying the sick or dragging bundles above the reach of the tide. Weary, miserable, starving, yet a smile lit every face. A smile of thanksgiving for solid earth beneath their feet. A smile of gratitude for freedom to worship the crucified. Gordon came hurrying from the tent toward his father. "'Well, son, how is she?' Sir James asked. I just gave her a drink of cold water, but what she needs is something she can eat. The Earl's face flushed painfully. It was hard to bear such poverty as this. Son, we must not complain. The best has already been given to us. We must remember, son, that we are really beggars depending on the charity of the clan. They are too loyal to speak of it, even to think of it, but it is true. I am a worn-out man, and penniless, since the bit of gold I had saved went down with the St. Andrew. We must face the truth, son. I did not mean that, father. Anyway, what if the gold did go to Davy's locker? There is nobody here from whom to buy. But if mother had a little soup, a bit of venison, even a rabbit stew. Son, the men have been watching for game all day. Sure, there's none down here on the sand. The storm has sent the game into the thickets. The men must unload the kits before the tide comes in. None can be spared for hours. They won't let me help, so let me hunt. I could get a few rabbits with a sling, even if you do not want a gun fired. No, son, no. You must not go into these strange woods alone, if you were lost. But I won't get lost. I was bred in the woods. Near Abel's farm in Maryland, perhaps you could find your way but we do not know where we are in America. From the trees I judge we are not far to the north, nor in tropical land. But this forest may stretch to the vast South Sea, for all any of us knows. But, Father, Daddy Abel taught us how to find our way in unknown woods. Every boy had to know things like that. I know how to blaze a trail, but on short trips he said to find a good landmark and not get out of sight of it. Oh, Father, I do know how to take care of myself. Mother needs the soup. Oh, please, Father, don't say no. Sir James looked at the pleading boy, then at the canvas stretched above the sick. You give me your word not to get out of sight of your landmark, even once, even for a moment? Yes, Father. You will come back in an hour whether you find any game or not? Yes, Father. It is a great risk, but the sick need food. Well, you may go, and God bless you, son. Gordon walked over the sand and made his way steadily up the steep clay banks which bounded the beach. A year ago he would have climbed for the very joy of the struggle. Now it was slow and painful work. A half dozen times he sat down to rest, head against the hard clay of the slope, hand upon his throbbing side. But the memory of that gentle mother under the old sail brought him wearily to his feet again. At last the climb was over. He stood under the first of the forest trees. Before him they stretched in endless leafy arches. He turned and looked back. A dwarf in a toy dory coming from the kits with a load. That was Muckle John. Someone struggling with a heavy burden. That was Sir James. A lump burned in Gordon's throat. Now for a landmark. Not a good one in sight. He might get one from a treetop. Climbing a tree was fun a year ago, but not now. His head throbbed with dizzy pain as he struggled from branch to branch, not daring to look down, resting only when the pain shot through him with sickening misery. I must be almost at the top now, he panted. Gordon raised his head, leaned forward, gasped, and stared again at a little bluff outlined against the blue October sky. Sutter's knob! It's Sutter's knob! We're not five miles from Abel's. 
End of chapter 22 Our Lady's Home How he reached the ground, Gordon never knew. His next memory was of trees flying madly, and that stabbing pain telling him he could run no more. The lad was walking steadily, in spite of the pain, looking straight ahead, thrusting aside the long sprays of blackberry vine, fruitless in the bright October sun, crashing on through burrs and goldenrod, sending the milkweed fairies fluttering before him as he passed. The way had been uphill, endlessly uphill, but for how many hours had he been struggling? Had he failed to sight trees and so let his treacherous left foot lead him in a circle? What were those whirling black things dancing in the air before him? Were they crickets that chirped so loudly through the silence? Or frogs? Or was it only the blood throbbing in his temples? His foot caught in a tangled vine, and the dull pain of the fall relieved the stabbing in his side at last. The sun climbed the blue October sky, slipped behind a white mare's tail of cloud, and stole slowly down again, before Gordon's pain called him back to aching reality. Grasping a twisted grapevine, he rose wearily. Where was he going? His head felt like a windmill. Abel's, he was going to Abel's, wasn't he? Which way was it? He'd been climbing uphill? No, that could not be right. The morning sun would be in the east, but this sun seemed to be in the west. But if that was east, then going uphill would be going south, when he should be going north, if he were going from the cove to Abel's. Maybe I was going up the hill to get a better view of Sutter's Knob. Gordon stepped forward with dizzy uncertainty. This climbing was weary business, but at last he gained the spot, and his glad shout sent all the squirrels on the hill slope scampering. The pole! That's our fishing hole under the alders! There's the tree we climbed when the bear was after us, and, whether I'm going north, south, east, or west, there's the path to Abel's! The lad sprang forward, only to sink with the pain. Struggling up again, he staggered onward. The old path followed the endless winding of the creek. Was ever way so long? Were ever feet so slow? Is it dark under those trees, or am I going blind? Gordon muttered as he stumbled on. There never was a bat more stupid. The trees are thinning out ahead. It must be where the valley widens into the slash, and the clearing's just beyond. Surely. Yes, between the oaks. That's the new field. Daddy has stumped it already. That cloud? Fire? No, but the sky's all red. The sun? Oh, it couldn't be going down now. It's not noon yet. The lad broke into a staggering run. Hardly a dozen more steps, and the old scene burst upon him. The long, low cabin nested among trees, the orchard in the wide stretch of stubbled field, the shocks of corn in the fodder stacks, the pasture land and fallow. Over all, red clouds afloat in the glowing sky. Sunset, he gasped, leaning against the great oak. Sunset, I must have lain in the grass all day, and Mother has had no food. On again, down the slope from the woodland, over the bridge in the hollow, the path seemed weedy. Was it that Scottish lanes were more often trodden and better kept? No sound came from the farmyard. The wide barn doors were closed, the yard empty, the bucket overturned near the edge of the well. A stifling horror gripped him. Had things gone wrong at Abel's also? It had never been still before. A dog sprang from the bushes with joyously wagging tail. Oh, Shep! Old Shep! Gordon slid through the bars, and the dog was upon him. Don't, old Shep, don't. I can't roll around like I used to. It hurts me in my side. The friendly brown eyes were full of pity. Dogs understand so much. What's the matter, Sheppy? Why is everything so still? But the dog only smiled dog smiles, casting uneasy glances toward the house. Along the side of the cabin and around toward the kitchen door, the two friends passed together. A sound floated to them, low, murmuring. The door was open. Gordon stepped noiselessly on the worn stone sill. Then a smile sweetened his troubled face as he knelt on the step, whispering softly, Bead time, only bead time. 
and even you, old doggie, know we must be still at prayers. Daddy knelt by the fireplace with the rosary in his blunt, scarred hand. Joel was just behind him, close to Witch and Tother, and all the rest of the red-headed dozen knelt, each in the same old place. One change there was. Mommy no longer rocked the cradle with her foot, keeping time to the murmur of the prayers. He that used to crow within it knelt beside her, wobbling from side to side on his little knees, chewing her homespun apron string, his shrill voice sounding above the able chorus, Mother of Dodd, they are at inners. The last glory be to the Father came from Daddy's fervent lips. Rosary was over. No, he drew the cross back again beneath his broken thumbnail, and his voice was deep and low. Second Rosary, in honor of Our Lady, Star of the Sea, for the eternal well-being and safe return of our George. A choking sob clutched Gordon's throat. They never forgot. Oh, I knew they wouldn't. Then the shore rose up before him, the weary, starving folk, the sick and dying sheltered by that ragged sail, and all the pain and sorrow welled up in the old, old cry, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Joel twisted on his knees, and Daddy, hearing the sound, turned with one hand upraised to punish the offender. But the hand dropped. The rosary fell clinking on the hearth. John Abel sprang to his feet. Mother of mercy, would ye look at the doorstep? But come in, boy, come in. Lizzie, get a stole, girl. Don't stand staring. Can't you see he's fit to faint? Never mind, Daddy. I'm all right. But if you can help... Who? The folk at the cove. What folk? Oh, they're all on the sand. The clan and my father and mother. The ship ran on a reef last. Hold on a bit. How many be there, and where? About fifty, not counting the ten that are sick. You mean fifty dragging yet and a dozen dying. Now where? The cove where Alder Creek comes in but not far up there. It's about four miles south from Sutter's Knob, I think. Get the bays, Joel. You ought to have had them out already. Haven't you any sense at all? The light wagon, the heavied one stick in the sand. Do you hear? He shouted after the flying boy. Tom, that haunch of innocence in the smokehouse. Three or four hams and a bacon or so. That'll help you. Ed, run up to the windmill and sack some of that fresh cornmeal. I'll help you carry it down. But, Daddy, how did you know? I hadn't told you yet. Lord bless you. Starvation written on your face. Lizzie, is that you staring there? Get the boy some supper. Haven't you any wits? But Mommy's bony hand was on the boy's forehead. No, Lizzie, heavy food won't do. There's fever. Wait a minute, broke in Daddy. Are they on the shore or up the bluff? down on the sand, but out of reach of the tide. Might have a hard pull through the sand. You, witch and tother, get out the mules. You can ride them till they're needed. Don't leave no straps flapping, and watch out the gray don't kick you. He's been skittish all day. Concern him. You, Sam, come to the root house with me. Get a couple of potato sacks. Mommy's voice could be heard at last, calling through the trap door for someone in the cellar. No, the last pan's a jersey. Them's the fresh eggs in the basket. Got the blackberry brandy yet? Annie, yes, bring it here. Molly, run up in the loft and get my herbs and my sunbonnet. That's a good girl, Lizzie. Now hand me the cup. Fine eggnog. Couldn't have made it better myself. Oh, Mommy, don't worry about me, cried the boy as her homely face turned toward him. I'm all right, but if you could fix something good like that for Mother... For land's sakes, don't you think there's more than one cup of milk and one egg on the Abel farm? You drink this, and don't fear Mommy won't take care of any folks of yours, least of all your real mother. But Mommy! A spasm of terror crossed his face. I forgot. I promised Father to be back in an hour. That was early this morning. But I saw Sutter's knob and... You clean forgot everything, but to run like a deer for your Mommy... Never mind, I'll stand twixt you and a switchin' for once in your life. 
Oh, it's not that, but they're worry. We'll be over mighty soon, laddie. See the wagons at the gate. Lizzie, you'll have to stay at home and see to things while I'm gone. You're turned fourteen and should have some sense. If the little twins goes to pesterin' and playin' off on you, well, Daddy will be round to settle them. Molly better come along with me. It's time she learned to nurse, anyhow. We'll be gone a good spell, likely. Ship fever ain't no fun to cure. The rest of you hear me now. You're to mind Lizzie and help her, and not to be pesterin' the calves nor climbing the windmill. She'll have work enough and bother to spare without you little ones laying yourself out to be mean. Mary, came Daddy's voice from the gate, we're ready if you are. The sleek bay swung into a bouncing trot down the lane and out into the high road, but the talk rattled even faster than the spinning wheels or the clicking hoofs. All had to be told and retold. Many times Mommy cried, For the land's sakes, and who ever would have thought it? Many times Daddy said, Thanks be to God and to his holy mother. By the time they reached the shore, food and rest and joy had given the lad his old spirit. He would have walked with the others, while the double team strained through the heavy sand. But Daddy carried him as if he were a babe. At last a shout came from the cliff above them. A mighty figure stood out against the stars, and the voice of Muckle John came ringing down. Seen a boy? A boy! Lost boy! Abel lifted the lad in the air and bellowed joyously, Safe and sound! All is well! A light came and went among the rocks. There's the tent, shouted Gordon. A moment later he was lifting the tent flap to bring the glad news to his mother. From outside, Mary Abel's voice came in that strong, quiet, cheery tone, which makes the sick better by its very sound. And John Abel's welcome rang over the camp. Sure, you're safe. Our blessed lady is not going to turn stepmother to you in her own land. Epilogue when at long last old Edwin was free to join Clan Gordon overseas, he gave them these jottings of God's finger on the shifting dunes of time. Sir Roger tied his fortunes to an earthly king, but that monarch's head rolled from the block while Puritan soldiers glared. He might have escaped had not that staunch Puritan, Godfrey, betrayed him. Guilt-stained, cringing, a coward to the end, Sir Roger went to the block, but he may have been a repentant coward, for Edwin heard him mutter as he climbed to the scaffold, Fool, fool, fool. Then Godfrey had his little day of crush-all, grab-all success, until Cromwell caught him playing one last game of double-dealing and set his iron heel down on him as if he had been a viper in the path. End of chapter 23 End of Outlaws of Ravenhurst